Bon, ça va y aller, mais après quoi C'est la journée à l'UNESCO.
everyone. I would like to invite you to all take your seats. We shall start very shortly, please. Mesdames et messieurs, je vous invite à retrouver vos places, s'il vous plaît. Le programme va commencer d'ici quelques instants. We're going to start in a few minutes. Please sit down. Your seats, we shall start now. Bonjour à tous. Good morning, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining us today here at UNESCO headquarters or online from uh, all over the world, which is rather impressive. We're going to spend the day together uh, in what promises to be a fascinating discussion as part of this roundtable organized by UNESCO on new forms of agreement and cooperation in the return and restitution of cultural property. I'm Anne-Marie Diaz-Borges, I'm a journalist with the BBC, and I'll be your moderator this morning. I'm delighted to be moderating this part of the day on such an important matter. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that simultaneous interpretation in English and French is available. So please ask our colleagues uh, from the UNESCO Secretariat if you encounter any technical difficulties or to post a comment uh, in the chat room. Over the course of the day, we'll be tackling important urgent and often sensitive issues that concern us all. So, and you will hear about a variety of resolved cases from countries in different uh, UNESCO regions uh, concerning the return and restitution of cultural property within the framework of the 1970 Convention, having to do with the illicit import, export and transfer of ownership of cultural property and as a result of bilateral discussions. The day, of course, will not be exhaustive, but it will give us an opportunity to share testimonies of recently resolved cases, which we hope will be inspiring and which have made it possible, sometimes through innovative means to find solutions for the return and restitutions of cultural property. Uh, there will be two panels. With, before those panels, there will be two dialogue sessions. The morning dialogue will focus on the role of museums, uh, and the afternoon dialogue will focus on cooperation with police, customs, and judicial authorities. At the end of each dialogue, four or five cases resolved by both parties will be presented in panels. Each case will be presented by experts for about 15 minutes. After the panels, there will be a discussion time for about one hour that will allow the audience to share similar examples and ask questions from the experts. Interventions uh, in, in the room from the floor will be limited to three minutes to allow as many people as possible to express their views. We thank you for your understanding and cooperation in this regard, because we would like to listen to as many people as possible. Concerning our online participants, please write your questions or comments in the chat so that we can select a few, as time will permit. Now, some practical information. If you wish to watch the program, please scan the QR code at the entrance of the room. I hope you uh, saw it. And you will find all the information on the page. Feel also free to comment on social networks uh, with the uh, hashtag UNESCO. To open this day, I have the honor of announcing the ADG Culture, Mr. Ottone, who's in the room, and he will deliver 
welcoming remarks on behalf of UNESCO. Mr. Ottoni, you have the floor. First of all, good morning, everybody. Madam Chair of the 23rd session of the Intergovernmental Committee for the Return and Restitution of Cultural Property, Madam Ambassador of Gabon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, ambassadors, permanent delegates, distinguished experts, <clears throat> whom we thank for being here with us or online, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, on behalf of the Director General, I have the honor of welcoming you today to UNESCO for this one-day roundtable on new forms of agreements and partnerships for the return and restitution of cultural property. As you know, many advances and initiatives have raised public and international awareness on this issue. Nine months after the adoption of the Mondia Cult 2022 declaration in Mexico by 150 states, we're opening this morning a new phase which aims at uh, responding to the call for an open and inclusive dialogue on the issue of the return and restitution of cultural property within the framework of the 1970 Convention or beyond. This dialogue <clears throat> is based on essential tools with clear principles, a common language, and a framework for working together. First, we have a strong normative foundation made up of all the UNESCO cultural conventions, including the 1970 UNESCO Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export and Transfer of, and transfer of Ownership of Cultural Property. Now, this foundation includes also the 1995 Unidroit Convention on stolen or illegally exported cultural objects, as well as a number of international or regional instru instruments, such as the European Union directives. Secondly, the role of the Intergovernmental Committee for the Return uh, of uh, Cultural Property in case of illicit appropriation, which facilitates negotiations between countries concerned by the restitution or return of cultural property and encourages them to conclude agreements. Incidentally, I would like to welcome and thank once again the chairman of the 23rd session of the committee, dear Rachel, you know, it's always a pleasure to work with you. There's another important principle, which is the fight against the illicit trafficking of cultural goods, which has given rise to a new heritage ethic whose results we can see every day covering not only the issues of heritage protection and transmission, but also the protection of cultural rights and the right of peoples and communities to enjoy their own cultural heritage. Allow me to share with you two thoughts which I find essential. First of all, uh, the dialogue and international cooperation are essential. Our success will depend on our collective ability to strengthen existing partnerships and devise new, even more innovative ones. We call on all stakeholders to join these associations, local communities, museums, art markets, online sales platforms and others. It may seem obvious, but this reflection on international cooperation is crucial. Today, you will hear about initiatives that not only have a great potential, such as the initiative launched last month by some 60 European and African museum directors, as Professor Hamadi Bokoum from Senegal will tell us in a few minutes. 
This, <clears throat> these initiatives herald a new dynamic in relations between museum institutions, and we hope they will inspire others in other regions. You can count on UNESCO to support these projects with you, with the full force of our mandate. There much remains to be done, but The energy we can deploy when we work together is very powerful. My second thought has to do with the fact that the theme of the return and restitution of cultural property is more than ever related to the main debates in the cultural sector, such as collective cultural rights, access to culture and its own definition as a global public good. With the return of objects, we are um, contributing to uh, something very important. The question of return and restitution should therefore enable us to support ambitious cultural and scientification cooperation projects in the field of museology, seeking a dialogue between communities of origin and the diaspora, building bridges with contemporary art, or promoting a debate around the protection and promotion of cultural heritage. Today's discussions will enable us to open up the full range of possibilities in terms of return and restitution by highlighting a number of successful cases, I'm stressing successful, which lead practically always to a strengthening of cultural and scientific cooperation between states, institutions and professionals concerned. It is the kind of practices that UNESCO wishes to promote in the future. The case presented today are far from exhaustive. In view of the very large number of recent and innovative cases, we've made a selection based on the variety of situations while taking care to respect the broadest possible regional representation. This is why we strongly invite member states wishing to present a case they consider relevant to share it with us as part of this roundtable discussions. To take advantage of the discussion sequence following each panel. Finally, I would like to thank uh, those member states present today for their support of UNESCO's work in the field of return and restitution. We know how it is difficult sometimes to reach agreements, but the, exper the experts who will present these concrete and successful cases will be very important. And I would like to thank the permanent delegation of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland for their support in the organization of this roundtable. Thank you for your attention. And I hope that uh, UNESCO will be, well, the mandate of UNESCO will be at the heart of our discussion. Once again, thank you. And I hope we shall hear many new innovative ideas to build our common future. Well, thank you, Mr. Ottone. It is true that innovation is very important. Now I have the honor of giving the floor to Rachel Akiko, chair of the 23rd session, Ambassador permanent delegate of Gabon to UNESCO. You have the floor. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Mr. ADG, my dear friend Ernesto Ottoni, excellencies, ambassadors, delegates, experts, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to take the floor uh, on the opening of this uh, roundtable on the new uh, forms of uh, agreements and cooperation on, in the return and restitution of cultural property. 
I'm very pleased to see so many participants in the room and online. On behalf of the Intergovernmental Committee, which I have the honor to chair, I would like to thank you. Nevertheless, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we must continue this important work. As emphasized by Mr. Ottoni, this is why I will not uh, tell you about the work of our organizations in terms of return and restitution of cultural property. And uh, I will not mention the highlights, uh, the past highlights. Nevertheless, I was saying that we have to continue this important work, which, which uh, must be carried out in common in a spirit of international cooperation to achieve mutually acceptable solutions for states' parties in case of a request for return or restitution of cultural property. A, it seems to be uh, it's the beginning of a momentum, and UNESCO is the right place to think about it. Today we shall uh, hear about a number of examples that will show that, apart from sensitivities, some procedures led to a strengthening of cooperation, either cultural or scientific, between states, which was very important. The round table, this round table today, is part of this work and uh, it is also a result of the Mondia Cult Conference adopted in Mexico City by 150 member states who were promoting an inclusive and open dialogue. It, also, it is also related uh, with the efforts made by UNESCO for many years to inscribe this issue at the heart of its cultural work. This also echoes a major initiative which has to do with uh, building capacities of museum and heritage professionals. I'm thinking, uh, for example, of uh, the flagship program Priority Africa, uh, which intends to support member states that would made uh, such a request in the field of return and restitution of cultural property. To conclude, Mr. ADG, I would like to reassure you, the Intergovernmental Committee for the Return and Restitution of Cultural Property to the Country of Origin is prepared to follow up on this work, on those discussions, at its next session in May 24. There's discussions, follow up, the uh, discussions on good practice organized uh, since uh, the 28th session that will contribute to our work. I hope and I wish to everybody a very successful day of exchanges and dialogue that will enable us to uh, promote even better the return and restitution of cultural property. Merci à vous. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Excellency, for these introductory uh, words. And again, uh, Mr. Assistant Director General, I'd like to thank both of you, and I would like to ask you to uh, take your seats in the room.
et sous vos applaudissements. Et so maybe we can give them a round of applaud, applause. Without further ado, we will move on to the first uh, session, an international trialogue, which basically echoes what Mr. Otono has said, in, namely that it is an open and inclusive international dialogue, as mentioned in the Mondia Cult uh, Declaration made in September 2022, and to recall, if need be, the role and the importance of museums when it comes to the return and restitution of cultural property. Before entering into the core of the topic with our panels on the case of resolved cases of return and restitution, we would like to widen our vision and to offer you an opportunity to hear from three professionals who are going to share their uh, experience with us. The purpose of this trilogue is to recall the major and central role of museums when it comes to the return and restitutions of cultural property and to hear about the needs and the various initiatives that have been adopted to respond to these needs. This is why we have um, invited experts from three different parts of the world who are going to share with us their experiences and their expertise and to look at the major challenges, such as the research as to provenance, uh, scientific and cultural cooperation, and the question of strengthening or capacity building. All of these topics are, of course, central to UNESCO's work, and it goes without saying that the importance of museums in return restitutions is uh, highlighted both in the text of the Convention of 1970 and also in the 2015 recommendation on museums and collections. Now, I would like to call to, up to the podium Mrs. Evelyn Centurion Cancino, who is a director of restitutions at the Ministry of Culture of Peru. If you would please come up to the podium. Thank you. I'd like to call on Mr. Hamadi Bokum, director general of the Museum of uh, Black Civilization from Dakar, Senegal. Please uh, uh, come up to the podium. And. Then online, we'll have Mr. Yui Gong Wang, who's the deputy director of the Palace Museum in China. Let's give them a round of applaud. And Mrs. Um, Centurion Consino, you have the floor. Okay. Good morning, distinguished the audience. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor for Peru to be part in this roundtable of experts and share experience about the new forms of agreement and cooperation in the field of return and restitution of cultural property. I would like to. I would like to begin by commenting that joint work that Peru has been carrying on with the countries to make up the Andean community of the nation. Since the signing of the decision 861 promoted by Peru, this decision marks and the millstone reversal of the burden of proof. For example, when the missing of cultural property is circulated illicit trafficking in a in any countries which belong to the Andean community, its restitution and comparison is more expeditious. We don't need to show uh, some documents and evidence about the property. This, uh, this important decision promoted by Peru, 161, is very important in the cooperation and institution. And other most important aspect that the Andean community has been developing in this uh, field is, uh, for example, Bolivia has been promoting the participation of the native communities in the requesting of restitution emblematic cases. Colombia is giving strength the national program to combat the illicit trafficking of the cultural property with the cooperation of more national authorities. And finally, Ecuador also involved the native community in this process. For example, the case of uh, 
had reduced uh, after uh, some exams and examination. The conclusion was that the hands, uh, the reduced hands, belong to shawar. Shawar is a quarantine culture. In addition, in the year 2021, Colombia prepared the gate for the protection and recovery of cultural property, contain the legislation, uh, legislation and document about the circulation addressed to the control authorities, such as the police and customs. In this year, Peru has the temporary president and, uh, and the, in the moment, we are uh, preparing the Andean Bulletin, which contains the restitution, the restitution emblematic cage each member. Besides, in two occasions, Peru organized the Foro Cusco for the celebration in 50 years and UNESCO's uh, 1970 convention. This online meeting gathered uh, 140 experts and specialists from the member states. Finally, it's the most important talk about the Mercosur Committee. At the moment, the member and associate countries we are reviewing a specific and propose, proposal agreement, such as 861 decision pro promoted by Peru, in close coordination with Argentina and Brazil. We, we work together is in these important topics. Um, I, I, I want to talk about, about the document by Simon Bolivar, but later my colleagues uh, will talk about the more details. But, but what is particular about the restitution that document signed by Simon Bolivar? It's that this document, it has a seal that did uh, try to be erased when, when this document was the options. Um, the other case that I want to talk about, the paintings confiscated by FBI in USA. This report was sent to Peru by the Italian police. Afterward, the Ministry of Culture looked at the information for this paint, found some documents about the thief from the monastery in Santa Catalina in Cusco, in Siena. This paint was exhibited at the Peyton Wright Gallery in 2020 in USA, and another paint was optioned by William Smith Gallery in 2017. Some years, both paints were confiscated by the FBI in USA. But it's important in both cases that the cooperation with USA an agreement also. In conclusion, this document were very important for the restitution. For example, the bill to alert that sent the Ministry of Culture uh, in two languages, in Spanish and English, and other documents about the inventory and report of the thief. But I think that another important tool is uh, this, this bilateral agreement that we had with USAID Sunday 1996. Dissemination is also important tool for the prevention of the illicit trafficking. Wasiman Kutispa, which means but home, is in Quechua language, is an exhibition for the most important recovery of cultural property from Peru, which technological elements such as virtual glazes, addresses to general population. The Ministry of Culture, with the Ministry for Against Affairs and Interpol and another institution, we have to be promoting but the intersectorial work through the National Commission for the Protection and Recovery of Cultural Property. In addition, since the 2017, we repatriated around the 10,000 goods, including archaeological, artistic, historical, documentary, and ethnographic goods. In, conclu in conclusion, the best tool that Peru has adopted in the last five years 
for the recovery more cultural property is an international cooperation through the subscription bilateral and specific agreement on the restitution, which include the straining of the control authorities. Also, fast communication and informal communication also, and, co and close coordination with other authorities, national and international. Finally, in the medium term, it's necessary to reinforce the dissemination and include the native communities in this process of the restitution. The native community is, belong to, is important to include in all processes of the repatriation. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Coucou, euh, chers collègues. Euh. Dear colleagues, before we hear from our friends, I'm going to say a few words on the question put before us today. We are invited to, to a dialogue on the role of museums in the return and restitutions of cultural property. Of course, I will uh, approach the question from an African perspective. So when we speak of an African perspective, we have to recall what uh, President Konari had said about museums when he was uh, Director General of ICROM. Mr. Konari had uh, said or made this very impactful statement we have to kill the European museum model in Africa. And he was absolutely right, because the museums built in Africa were, in point of fact, ethnographic models. And ethnography, we must not forget, is a way of viewing the other. And the ethnological school is And, uh, and uh, the author of the Dakar Djibouti mission, which was basically a mission of uh, looting, was one of the authors of ethnography. So when ethnographic museums uh, were created in Africa, they were not for Africans. They didn't go there. It was the tourists who went there. People like myself who went to the museum on the weekend. That, that is a model that must be simply <clears throat> thrown out. In this perspective, the question of the return or restitution of objects must, of course, be given <clears throat> deeper thought. This means that we have to look at the format or the way in which these objects arrived, in generally speaking, here in Europe. These objects were not uh, contained in uh, cases and museums. They were objects of daily life. These were objects that were used for worship. These were objects that were involved in uh, uh, local religion or the expression of power in our own societies. And when they were brought here, that a decision was made that these were actually um, works of art, and they were placed behind glass cases in museums. And of course, then an attempt was done to do the same thing in Africa, and it simply doesn't work. The question of restitution, therefore, uh, arises in two uh, different perspectives, and there might be even a third uh, dimension. And of course, we have to give uh, these objects back to their legitimate owners. So. Originally, there is some kind of a misdemeanor or a violation or a breach, and a breach has to be punished. So the act of return or the request for a return is not just begging for something. It is a necessity, and Africans must not be asked, what are you going to do with them? We can take them back to the museum or to sacred forests. Or we can uh, burn human uh, vestiges, or we can burn them by 
claim that they're polluted. So don't ask us the question, where will they go? Some of these objects, of course, will go back to museums or other forms of reappropriation. Other objects, undeniably, will be uh, depolluted or desacralized. So I think many things can happen. One thing is obvious, that what has become an object in a museum cannot play the same function or have the same role once it returns to Africa. I don't want to go on for too long, but let me give you an example. Senegal retrieved a saber. Benin has uh, retrieved a 26 objects, objects, I believe. This saber will belong to somebody who was a warrior. And, but he was then uh, captured in Mali. Does it belong to Senegal or Mali? Right now it's in the Senegal and the uh, Black Civilization Museum. But we believe that this is African heritage or belongs to African per heritage. And there's no problem to have this object to basically circulated the Omalian, that is uh, Senegal, uh, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Mauritania, and, Gambia, and the Gambia. So it belongs to all of these communities. So even a West African perspective with ECOWAS, what was decided is that we would probably organize uh, a, a traveling exhibition to try to defragment the political culture that was imposed upon us. So the return has to be viewed with a great deal of caution. That's the first thing to be said. Now, secondly, and this is something that is true for all uh, African countries, when you say that 80 or 90 percent of the uh, cultural uh, heritage of Africa is in Europe, that's not true. No, it's 6.5 million years from Tumai all the way into today in contemporary production. So what we have to avoid is any centralizing uh, the colonial period, to put it at the center of the narrative, we have to stop talking about pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial uh, period, because it's as if uh, Africa were programmed to be colonized. Africa has to be treated just, or the colonial period has to be treated as any other period of African history, but not making it the centerpiece. Because if we do that, we basically devalue all of our history and the depth of our historical roots. So we have to be very cautious. Restitution, yes, undeniably, it is necessary. It's indispensable. What has been taken us has to be returned to us, and we'll do what we want with us. But if the African Museum wants to get out of the rut where it has been put uh, with this famous statement, uh, we have to do away with this model of museum. That means that Africa has to also be interested in contemporary production. If we're saying that this is the century of Africa, then contemporary production, um, uh, figurative arts, everything that's been done, urban art, everything that's done in Africa today has to have its place in our, its rightful place in our museums. Museums cannot be a place for nostalgia. They have to be a place for life, for hope. This means that African museums uh, that we can dream of will not be just a place for contemplation, will not be a place for nostalgia. It must be, of course, uh, a device uh, to help us to understand that we have a history. And of course, young people need to know this. But they must also be a place for life and projection to future, including in the language uh, that will be used in uh, museums. It's quite obvious today that the language of, of our children is digital. We cannot do a museum without uh, the digital uh, forms, all of them. But this can't be just uh, consumerism. In other words, digital is something that we can use and all the unesco conventions help us to do so today language is digital and it, it's also an, a way to get rid of gaps if we want to take any cultural expression in africa well before you had to go in the field 
you had to transcribe, you had to translate before you could then uh, uh, disseminate. Today, with what I'm holding in my hand, all over Africa, you can share our uh, cultural expression in vivo. So we can't simply uh, afford to be only nostalgic or in recrimination or accusations. We have to be forward-looking so all together we can really build the um, humankind for tomorrow. Thank you. Now we're going to listen to Mr. Yue Gong Wang from China. Assistant Director General Alors pour tous ceux qui nous écoutent, hein, sachez que Monsieur Wang est accompagné de son interprète. I'm Wang Yuegong, Deputy Director from the Palace Museum of China. I would like to thank UNESCO for the kind invitation, as well as Ms. Um, uh, Centurion and Mr. Bukum for their enlightening introductions. It is my pleasure to represent the Paris Museum at this roundtable dialogue. China is the China is one of the major origin countries of lost cultural property in the world. The foreigner of the Palace Museum, the Forbidden City, as the imperial palace for the Ming and Qing dynasties from the early 15th century to the early 20th century, also became hotspot for cultural heritage displacement. The looting by invaders, liquidation by the Qing court, the shifting of political regimes, among other reasons, has repeatedly led to heavy losses of treasures at home and abroad. Today, the Huang Gong is Kukumbo Today, the Imperial Palace has turned into a prominent national comprehensive museum of, <coughs> of traditional Chinese art with over 1.8 million pieces, sets of collection divided into 25 major categories, such as painting, calligraphy, steel, rubbing, bronzeware, gold and silverware, and so on. The mainstay of the collection includes Ming and Qing Imperial Courts collections, heritage art architecture and related artifacts, as well as historical books and archives. 90% of the total collection is categorized as precious items. Based on its resource and strength in historical archives collection, cultural heritage research and analytical and preservation technology, the Palace Museum is well equipped in research and, pro and protection of traditional Chinese cultural heritage, especially in the imperial collection, thus laying solid foundation for the research on the provenance and return and restitution of these artworks. Now I would like to share three important cases of return and restitution work by our museum in recent years. The first case is the 
，收集了英、法、德、意、美、日等国七十余座博物馆公开著录的清宫文物收藏信息，以及大型国际文物拍卖机构<咳>公开拍卖的清宫文物的记录，历时数年。编制完成了清宫散佚文物调查报告，作为一部系统研究清宫散佚文物的学术性著作，该书对清宫散佚文物的经过以及在国内外的分布、研究与征集、法律地位和追索路径等一系列问题进行了深入的剖析，具有较高的学术价值。The first case is the research on lost cultural heritage from the Qing Palace project, starting from 2008 through field research. Referencing literature and publications, and interviewing experts and insiders, we collected information on cultural artifacts of the Qing court publicly disclosed by more than 17 museums in Britain, France, Germany, Italy, and the United States and Japan, as well as records of public auctions of cultural artifacts of the Qing court by major international auction houses. As a systemic academic work on lost cultural property of the Qing Dynasty, it conducted in-depth analysis on the circulation history, domestic and international distribution, research collection, legal status, and repatriation paths of lost cultural property of the Qing Dynasty, with remarkable value for academic research. The second case is from 2016, the first of the Western Chinese Museum of Chinese Culture and Culture Project. The team members 赴日本、美国、印度、尼泊尔、西欧各国，实地考察了数十家博物馆收藏的藏传佛教文物及该主题相关的展览，并查阅了相关的著录，对海外所收藏的中国藏传佛教文物进行了全面的调查。重点是那些具有较高学术研究价值和艺术欣赏价值的藏传佛教文物收藏、变更情况，撰写了海外藏中国藏传佛教文物调查报告，建立了较齐备的海外藏传佛。海外藏中国藏传佛教文物的检索数据库，呃，数据库收录了海外藏的中国藏传佛教文物不少于两万件。The second case is the research on Chinese Tibetan Buddhism cultural heritage collected overseas project, starting from 2016. We visited dozens of museums and exhibitions related to Tibetan Buddhism in Japan, the U.S., India, Nepal, and Western Europe countries. While also consulting literature and publications, we conducted a comprehensive survey of Chinese Tibetan Buddhist cultural artifacts collected overseas, focusing on the collection and circulation of artworks with special academic and artistic significance. As part of the results of the project, we compiled an investigation report on the topic and established a fairly comprehensive retrieval database for these artifacts. Which includes information for over two or twenty thousand artworks. 最近的一个案例是二零二二年九月开始的，故宫博物院与德国七家博物馆合作开展的德藏义和团运动时期中国流失文物溯源研究的项目。通过院内外各领域的专家对德国博物馆收藏的八国联军侵华时期流失的中国文物进行了系统性的研究，梳理文物的流转信息。从而进一步明确了文物流失的历史背景及其影响及意义。项目于二零二一年十一月在德国流失艺术基金会立项，并获得了资金支持。研究期限预计将持续至二零二四年的三月。现阶段，双方专家主要针对德国七家博物馆选出的约七十件馆藏中国文物做重点研究，并已通过线上工作会议交流了进展。除文物本身的研究外，本项目还计划通过举办国际的研讨会，制定义和团文物研究指南，进一步扩大项目成果的影响力。The third and most recent case is the traces of the Boxer War loot in German museum collections, a joint project with seven German museums starting from September 2022. It brings together experts in various fields from different institutions of both countries in order to conduct a systemic research. On the cult Chinese cultural artifacts lost during the Boxer War in China, and collected by the German museums, and sort out the information and on their circulation so as to further clarify the historical background, impact, and significance of the lost artifacts. The project was initiated by the German Lost Art Foundation in November 2021. 
and will last <coughs> until March 2024. At this stage, experts from both sides are focusing on about 70 projects, uh, 70 objects selected by seven German museums and have exchanged progress through online workshops. In addition to research itself, the project also plans to further expand influence by holding international seminars and formulating guidelines for the study of boxer war loops. 博物馆是保护和传承人类文明的重要场所。故宫博物院非常愿意在流失文物的基础研究和保护方面做出努力和贡献。同时，如果其他国家有相关的需要，我们也愿意共同探索流失文物保护和研究的可能性，愿意与更
from uh, the Netherlands, and they will also tell us about uh, the uh, creation of a local museum in Indonesia, a local museum in the West Kalimantan region of Indonesia. Mr. Vintantorino, ADG ambassadors, dear colleagues, it's an honor for me to be here today on the occasion of this round table. I shall try to deal with the uh, return of uh, the Fagan fragment, and I shall also refer to six uh, archaeological pieces uh, belonging to China. There are different elements, obviously, but they have points in common. When two museums uh, support the principles of the convention, of the 1970 convention, any difficulty and a historical difficulty can be overcome through dialogue. Agreements are signed through the efforts of both parties who find uh, the proper legal arguments. And uh, both countries are satisfied, the receiving country and the giving country. About the uh, Fagan fragment in Greece, well, we think it is something particularly important in terms of international cooperation. The official restitution took place on the 4th of June 2022, last year. But contacts between Italy and Greece about the freeze date back to many years. I think they started in 1983 when the Greek minister, Melina Mercouri, culture ministry, raised this issue of the return of parts of the Parthenon to Greece. Over time, uh, the relationship strengthened when the idea of restituting cultural property to bring together the artistic and historical heritage became something important at the international level. Recently, the issue was resolved thanks to the activity of the Sicily region, where we have testimonies of uh, Greek culture, spectacular testimonies of Greek culture, uh, so many temples, for example, that show there's a deep and ancient link with Greece. As any other process to arrive at a result, you have to work stage by stage. And the first stage was the temporary loan of the frieze uh, by the Salinas Museum from Palermo, where uh, the frieze was exhibited based uh, on a special article of the Code of Heritage, Italian Code of Heritage, which enabled uh, temporary loans based on cultural agreements with uh, foreign museum institutions on a reciprocal basis. And uh, for a period of time that cannot exceed four years, which can be renewed once. So we had started. We immediately realized that a temporary loan was not the actual solution and that we had to go beyond the article I referred to. There was no legal obligation to return the freeze, which is part, which has been part of the Italian cultural heritage since the 19th century. We had to make it possible to return the freeze where it was designed and produced. It was a political decision, basically, a cultural and political decision. So uh, we had uh, exchanges, many exchanges between Sicily and the culture ministry to identify uh, what would be the modalities of the final return. The body, the Italian body in charge of uh, legal proceedings was uh, very helpful in that case. 
Service. Si en quelques semaines, la région sicilienne a publié une disposition de démanialisation, c'est-à-dire un acte administratif par lequel un bien est transféré du domaine public au patrimoine de l'État, créant ainsi les conditions de sa vente ou de sa donation. Et sur la base de cet acte, le ministre de la Culture a fourni le nil obstat définitif. La frise du Parthénon pourrait enfin retrouver sa place d'origine. Cette restitution qui place l'Italie et la Grèce. Uh, be returned. And so Greece and Italy were placed on the same level, and this was a demonstration of the common uh, commitment for the protection and uh, uh, of. Uh, cultural heritage, uh, uh, recognize the importance of recognizing a country's cultural contribution through its heritage. So cooperation in Syria not only strengthens the ties between our countries, but also contributes to the reconstruction of the cultural heritage, and therefore to the reconstitution or the rebuilding of the national identity. The restitution of this very valuable uh, property is an act of justice that makes it possible to the community to rediscover and to preserve their history, their roots, and the feeling of belonging. I would now like to give the floor to my colleague. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me first, on behalf of Greece, to thank uh, both the UNESCO Secretariat, through the Assistant Director General, Mr. Otone, and the Chair of the ICPRCP, Ambassador Akiko, for the organization of such an inspirational event. Before continuing from uh, uh, where Mr. Bruno left off, I would like to make some remarks uh, strongly connected with the case under consideration, but from uh, rather a legal perspective. As was indicated by the UNESCO Secretariat in their concept note, while the question of restitution has long been confined to diplomatic relations, it is only in the last few years that a debate has begun to occur among some states and in civil society, resulting in evolving positions. Ladies and gentlemen, over the last few years, we are witnessing a radical change in the international community's attitude towards return and restitution of cultural property to the countries of origin, which is reflected on the institutional mindset of state authorities, museum professionals, artists, civil society, as well as influential international press. In addition, international organizations such as the United Nations and UNESCO are point pointing in this direction through their respective resolutions and decisions. More importantly, the, this noticeable change in attitudes is linked to the return of properties connected to the cultural identity of peoples and communities and strongly inspired by an ethical imperative to foster their inherent cultural right to enjoy their cultural heritage. It is important to underline that the ICPRCP, which co-organizes the present event, constitutes a unique UNESCO body which acts as a facilitator of international cultural disputes emerged in principle before 1970. And in accordance with its statutes, a case may be submitted to it only in case of failure or interruption of bilateral negotiations. From a legal viewpoint, a positive outcome of the negotiations for the return or restitution of a specific cultural property to its country of origin usually leads to the conclusion of an agreement on its return. This agreement may be concluded between two states, in such case we have an origin. But I will not get into further details. Uh, instead, uh, I will pass the floor uh, with the permission of uh, Mr. Bruno, uh, to the main players of this return and restitution, uh, the respective directors of the two museums, in order to present in detail the substantial parameters of this successful case of return. I suppose that uh, Mrs. Yes, uh, Greco. Katerina Greco has the floor. Yes. And then Professor Stampolidis from the Acropolis Museum. Voilà, donc nous avons quelques petits soucis techniques. Je... We're, voilà, donc nous avons quelques petits soucis techniques. Je... We're having a few technical problems. Let me check with my colleagues. Do we have our speakers? They're uh, joining us online. Oh, I think it'll be just a few more minutes before they are online with us. So if you would be patient, these are, of course, uh, the contingencies of uh, these remote meetings or hybrid meetings. But we're, if we're fortunate, we'll be able to hear from all of our speakers this morning.
Ah, très bien. Madame Greco. Uh, Mrs. Greco, can you hear us? Hello. Hello, Mrs. Greco. Very pleased uh, to see you, hear you. You have the floor. Thank you. And your uh, interpreter apologizes, but uh, the sound quality does not make it possible to interpret. In spite the great artistic quality, and your interpreter apologizes, but the sound quality does not allow for interpretation. Again, interpreter's apologies, but this sound... The sound quality does not allow for interpretation. Interpreter's apology. Sound quality, we repeat, sound quality does not allow for interpretation. Your interpreters will attempt interpretation, but it's very difficult because the sound quality is very poor. This is a direct relationship with Lord Elgin, who in 1803, when he came back from uh, Athens, went through Italy. And your interpreter apologizes, but the president's microphone is open, and we simply cannot interpret her under such conditions. Les demandes de la ministre grecque de la Culture, Lina Mendoni, de restituer définitivement la sculpture à Athènes, a suscité l'intérêt immédiat et favorable du gouvernement régional et du musée Salinas de Palerme. La Sicile, région dotée d'un statut particulier qui dispose d'une pleine autonomie dans la gestion de son patrimoine culturel, a donc entamé les procédures pour parvenir à ces résultats et a impliqué dès le début les ministères de la Culture qui, euh, par ses organes institutionnels, a partagé les objectifs de l'opération. Par, partie intégrante de ces longs parcours, les musées Salinas et les musées de l'Acropole d'Athènes ont signé en décembre 2021 un accord de valorisation pluriannuel dans lequel un, un programme d'initiative scientifique a été convenu visant à garantir la réciprocité des relations culturelles entre la Grèce et la Sicile, y compris les preuves au musée Salinas d'une statue d'Athènes, de l'acropole d'Athènes, euh, pour quatre ans et dans les quatre années suivantes d'une base de l'époque géométrique moyenne. Suite à cet accord, Le froment de Fagan est arrivé à Athènes et a été exposé au Musée de l'Acropole au début du mois de janvier 2022. Enfin, en mai 2022, le gouvernement régional s'est prononcé à l'unanimité en faveur de la donation, qui a été sanctionnée par un décret administratif officialisant le transfert de biens culturels en Grèce, la sortie définitive du pays étant autorisée par le ministère de la Culture. Le 4 juin 2022, à Athènes, une cérémonie a été organisée pour placer les fragments, les fragments à sa place originale dans la frise du Parthénon, où il sera admiré pour toujours. La restitution du fragment de Fagan a une profonde valeur symbolique pour deux raisons. Tout d'abord, parce que la Sicile, terre d'ancienne colonie gre grecque, se sent encore profondément liée à la Grèce par des liens enracinés dans la matrice culturelle. Alors, Madame Gréco, Madame Gréco, je suis désolée, je vais vous demander d'interrompre brièvement. Malheureusement, nous avons des problèmes techniques de notre côté. Je suppose que vous aurez également. Unfortunately, you will have noticed that we're having some technical issues. I would like to suggest that we just uh, have a short break so that our teams try to solve the problem. And we'll resume in five minutes. And thank you for your understanding. Apologies. <laughs> Ma perché 
che si sono inseriti tutti gli altri anche tutti aperti Donc, merci, mesdames et messieurs, de votre compréhension. Voilà, nous vous demandons un maximum de cinq minutes. So, please, uh, five minutes tops, so that we can resolve the technical problems, so that it is uh, uh, easier for all of us to follow and also for the panelists to share their experience and expertise. Thank you very much. Five minutes break. Alors, comme cette pause est relativement courte, je vous demande de ne pas aller trop loin. Ce serait dommage de vous perdre. <rire> Revenez surtout. Please do come back in five minutes.
Voilà. Mesdames et messieurs. Ladies and gentlemen. Please get back to your seats. Once again, thank you very much for um, taking a seat. Voilà, nous allons juste accorder quelques instants. Je pense que d'autres personnes. We are just going to wait for a few more seconds until everyone joins us back in the room. Voilà, je pense qu'on va pouvoir reprendre d'ici quelques instants. We will be able to resume our meeting in just a few seconds. Madame Greco, est-ce que vous nous entendez bien? Miss, Miss Greco, can you hear us? So I will ask you and all people online to please uh, wear a headset so that we have uh, the best sound possible. Thank you. Très bien. Donc, Madame Greco, c'est à vous, s'il vous plaît. Merci. Alors, la restitution de Fernand des. The fragment, restitu the restitution of the fragment was symbolic for several reasons. First, because Sicily, a land of ancient Greek colonies, still feels deeply linked to Greece by bonds rooted in the common Mediterranean cultural matrix. And secondly, the Sicilian region itself, which in the recent past has had to fight to obtain the return of important archaeological artifacts illegally stolen from its heritage through clandestine excavation in the second half of the 20th century, could not remain deaf to the Hellenic request to finally reunite the Parthenonian fragments looted in the 19th century. In this case, no law dictated this, except that of the morality of culture, according to which the Phaedonian sculptures acquire meaning only in the place where they were conceived and made to be a prayer addressed by citizens to Athena, in the temple that is the symbol of Greece and the Western civilization from which Europe was born. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your understanding this morning. Now we are going to Greece to meet Mr. Stampolidis. I will ask you to be as fast as possible because we're already quite behind. And I um, thank you for your understanding as well. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello, sir. Okay. Hi. Are you able to wear a headset by any chance, just to make sure that we hear you better? Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, the government, through the Ministry of Culture, in its attempt to light all the belonging pieces of the Parthenon, symbol of the UNESCO, symbol of architectural perfection and beauty, and symbol of the democracy, he had already started official talks with the Antolino Salinas Museum for the permanent return and reunification of so-called fake and fragments in autumn 2020, but the UNESCO's unanimous decision in September 2021 declaring that the matter was not only legal, right, and ethical, but also intergovernmental, was the game changer for the return and the reunification of the Parthenon marbles to the monument where it, they belong, now housed in the Acropolis Museum, right across the Parthenon itself. You can see the museum behind me. The official negotiations of both the Salinas Museum in Palermo and the Acropolis Museum, as well 
as the Ministry of Culture of Greece and the Assessorato General Government of Sicily were intensified after the UNESCO's decision during the 18th of October and 26th of November 2021. An agreement between the two museums was signed in December 30th, 2021, ensuring the reciprocity of cultural relations and exchanges. The Fagan fragment would act as a deposit to the Acropolis Museum and the Salinas Museum would host two pieces of antiquity from the Acropolis Museum, a torso of Athena dated in the fifth century BC for four years, and following that, a geometric vase uh, for, for another four years. Within this time frame, the Assessorato of Sicily would promote and initiate the procedure with the Ministry of Culture of Italy allow to uh, the definite return to the of the Fagan fragment. The administratives of both countries and the two museums, instead of waiting four and four years uh, for the return and the, the, the statement of the Fagan fragment, started immediately the work in the case. Thus, January 10th, 2022, the ceremony of the part of the Fagan fragment took place in the Acropolis Museum, as you can see, in the presence of the Prime Minister of Greece, the Minister of Culture, Assessor Alberto Samona, and the directors, uh, Katerina Greco and myself. The fragment remained in a showcase in front of the side of the Parthenon frieze, among other sculptures, putting its final reunification on slab number six of the frieze where it belongs. On February 9th and 10th, 2022, the chosen torso of Athena was embarked and transported to the Antonino Salinas Museum and was unveiled in front of the authorities of Greece, the Assessorato of Sicily, and the Antonino Salinas Museum. During the same and between March and May 2022, the Antonino Salinas Museum the Assessorato and the Regional Government of Sicily were working fast and efficiently for the definite return of the fragment and its final uh, relocation on the Parthenon freeze. On June 4th, 2020, the ceremony of the uh, permanent reunification of the fragment, as you can see, took place in the Parthenon Gallery of the Acropolis Museum in front of uh, the uh, Greek and Italian authorities, and of course, the international audience, a gesture that sanctions at the highest symbolic level, the relationship of cultural brotherhood that bonds Greece and Italy. The reunification of the Fagan fragment to the Parthenon monument to which it belongs, it is, is the first between two states to show the way for others to follow. And as you could see, it took only four and a half months that means when there is a will, there is the way. The fragment that may date back to the direct dealings between Fagan and Elgin in Rome, as we have heard uh, by Dr. Uh, Katerina Greco earlier, at the beginning of the 19th century, century is actually, uh, or would actually be 
the first Elgin marble to be returned permanently to the Acropolis Museum. It is the example of noble intention, goodwill and trust, which was transformed in an act of reunification of our common global cultural moments, the Parthenon, that means between countries who share the same values and virtues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stampolidis. Uh, when there is a will, there is a way. That's very cleverly said. Merci à vous quatre pour la présentation. Thank you to the four of you for the presenting this first situation, this first case. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to tell you that nothing is lost this morning. All presentations will be uh, sent to you later on. So now, without further ado, we'll move on to the second case. And I give the floor to Ms. Bustra, who is with us online and unfortunately because we're already quite late i will ask you to be as brief as possible miss bustra you have the floor for the kind introduction i'm very honored to be here and i also prepared a, a short slideshow uh, that will be shared as well Um, I don't see it myself. Yeah, okay, there it's going. Yes, great, thank you. So I'm, I'm very honored to be here and join today's discussion. So as we are discussing new forms of agreements and partnerships regarding requests for return, I, as a historian, also deem it necessary to look at the continuities and change in discourses of return in the context of Indonesia and the Netherlands. So my contribution provides historical context for current mechanisms and points to the fact that discourses of return in Indonesia have not necessarily changed that much, but the relationship with institutions in the Netherlands has. Next, please. Discourses of return can actually be traced back to the colonial period itself, but really kicked off during the Roundtable Conference in 1949 which is the moment of decolonization when the terms of the independence agreement were negotiated. Next. During the Roundtable Conference, Indonesia and the Netherlands reached a draft cultural agreement in which one article was specifically dedicated to the return of cultural objects. Unfortunately, the draft culture agreement, including Article 19 that you see here, never made it to the final round of negotiations. During the early 1950s, Indonesia kept the call for return alive, including the request for the return of Pithecanthropus erectus, or better known as Java Man. Next. Only when the two countries reached a joint culture agreement in 1975, objects, manuscripts, and archives were returned, such as the palm leaf manuscript Nagara Kratagama in 1970, objects related to the resistance hero Prince Dipanogoro in 1977, as well as the Buddhist statue Prashnaparamita in 1978. In this period, the so-called Jogya documentum of the Nafis archive also returned. Next. The return of Prashnaparamita is often presented as a successful case, but that really depends on how one looks at it. There was much that was actually not returned. For instance, half of the Lombok collection remained in the Netherlands, as did the remaining five Singosari statues, as well as Java Man. Next. But after the return of the icons in the late 1970s, it was silent again for a few decades. Until in the early 2000s, research and initiatives for return started to take off. The case of Sintang, which we are discussing today, is one of such early cases of return prior to the existence of any mechanism between the two countries. Next. The newly set up G2G mechanism between Indonesia and the Netherlands results from these historical discourses that have gained unprecedented momentum today. The 2020 Dutch report, Guidance on the Way Forward for Colonial Collections, was implemented last year. An Indonesian Committee for the Repatriation of Objects in the Netherlands, 
was set up to advise the Indonesian government on object repatriation in 2021. Last year, the newly formed Dutch Repatriation Committee became its counterpart. The Indonesian request submitted to the Dutch government two years ago can be perceived as an attempt to settle outstanding historical requests for return, such as the remaining half of the Lombok collection, the remaining Singosari statues, the reins of Dipanogoro's horse that weren't returned when his saddle was, as well as the so-called Java man. Next. The G2G mechanisms indeed provide unprecedented opportunities and also pushes the discourse of return and decolonization into the public realm, especially in the Netherlands. But it also, of course, has its limitations. For instance, there is no mechanism in place for the return of objects to subnational source communities, such as families, private owners, or cultural and indigenous communities. However, Return does not necessarily or exclusively entail physical return of objects, but it can also mean gaining access and the possibility of creating new meanings for objects that were taken away. In the end, or fundamentally, it is about the agency of the source communities in creating and recreating relations and meanings for their lost heritage and for future generations. One way to achieve this is often mentioned by Director General of Culture Hilma Farid as well as others in public forums, they point to the importance of research, knowledge building and exchange with regards to cultural objects collected in colonial context. While on the one hand, the absence of subnational mechanism is indeed a limitation, it simultaneously, it simultaneously is also an opportunity to circumvent bureaucratic national mechanisms. The case of Sintang is one such case from which we can learn how that could work in practice, as we will hear from Miriam and Ibu Siti. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mrs. Boustra. And I believe that now it's uh, the turn of you. Uh, the turn of uh, Mrs. Siti Musrika, who is also online. Mrs. Musrika, okay. can you hear us? Yeah. Vous avez la parole, merci. Yeah. You have the floor, thank you. Mrs. Good morning. Musri Good morning. Can you hear us, Mrs. Musrika? Can you hear me? Yes, we can, and we can see you as well. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. I will explain about the restitution of textile, clothing, and object, and the establishment of the local museum in West Kalimantan, Indonesia. That's perfect. You can go ahead. Thank you very much. The restitution of textile, clothing, and object, the establishment of the local museum in West Kalimantan, Indonesia, start from here. On September 29, 2004, and memorandum of understanding between the Sintang Regency and Koninklijk Institute de Troven, Troven Museum, and Koninklijk Institute de Troven Information and Library Service was signed by the two representatives. This uh, MOU covers the technical support in regard to the establishment of the cultural center, which includes the archives, a museum, the documentary center of the Sintang history, a library, a training and education, as well as internship center for civil servants. Mm -hmm. The collaboration, the initiative by the 
Bapak Bintang, Bapak El Yakim Simon Jalil, the Director of Cobus Foundation, Father Jack Mason, and Itifan Hort, as the contact person from the museum, who was known as the senior textile curator of Tropen Museum and come to Sintang to do research in the in Tanun Ikat Sintang. This collaboration has given birth to establishment of Museum Kapuas Raya, which has three exhibition rooms dedicated to history of Sintang, the culture center room, and the textile room, as well as the education room. In the exhibition room, things like textile, clothing, and various artifacts repatriated by Tropen Museum, as well as from the Perkumpulan Kapusin Museum, a social organization founded by the father of Catholic missionaries who introduced the region to West Kalimantan or the island of Borneo. Of the Capuchins themselves, added with few artifacts and much of textile knowledge from the Tropa Museum, came with Dutch funding for the establishment of a new museum, building, cultural center in Sintang, in close consultation and collaboration with the West Kalimantan community. The restitution was agreed with um, gratefulness and seems for all parties successful, but it met critique in the Netherlands as well. One of the main public newspapers wondered if the colonial inequality would be maintained if, I quote, we keep on building museums in formerly colonized territories, end quote. Looking back, this case dates from 50 years ago. Much has changed in the awareness of Dutch responsibility for excesses of violence and systematic organization of colonial governance in the national and in the European context. This change is due to new historiography, activism, public debate and multiple exhibitions on colonialism and slavery and a new policy on restitution built upon cultural transparency, the recognition of injustice and the intention to find ways for reconciliation which comes with a great willingness to share knowledge, to return looted artifacts and to offer facilities for source countries for museum visits, research in order to create a maximum of accessibility. After all, in the Netherlands, the reorganization of ethnographic museums from 2012 on ran parallel with societal awareness and public and academic debate about the colonialism, diaspora, formerly colonized communities, and acknowledgement of violence and inequality of power relations. The Tropa Museum now became part of the National Museum of World Cultures that also includes the Ethnographical Museum of Leiden, Volkkunde, the Africa Museum in Bergendal, and exhibition making, conservation and research of the World Museum Rotterdam is also included. The National Museum of World Cultures is financed by the Ministry of Education, Cultural and Science. So there's a change eh, for the Tropa Museum since then. The 2017 initiative of the Museum of World Cultures, together with National Institute of Documentation of War, the NIOT, and the Rijksmuseum, to start a collaboration on provenance research on colonial oh, collections, yeah. received great stimulus yeah. with the visit of the Director General of the Ministry of Education in Indonesia, Laumar oh, Farid. Maybe generation. something goes we wrong here. The next generation will learn and draw their interest in caring and I interrupt my speech for a minute. Uh, uh, Mrs. Sorry, Mrs. Musica, can you hear us? Yeah. Hi, it's really yeah. lovely to have you back online. Uh, but just bear with us a little while, just a few minutes, uh, whilst uh, Mrs. Otink uh, finishes her presentation. So we'll be with you very, very shortly. It's great yeah. to have you back. Thank you. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. No, thank you, Siti. Just a couple of minutes. 
Um, so we started this collaboration um, on provenance research of colonial collections, and it received great stimulus with the visit of Director General of the Ministry of Education in Indonesia, Helma Farid, and became subsequently embraced by the Ministry of Culture, Education and Science. The publication of the pilot project on provenance research on objects of the colonial era includes reflections on restitution cases in the last decades. We're very grateful to Hilmar Fari to express the great willingness to collaborate in mutual research projects. Meanwhile, the National Museum of World Cultures already had set up its own publication called Provenance to publish research by conservators and provenance researchers. A great deal of the research is being realized by the National Science Agenda project, Pressing Matter, and many of the researchers working on our collections. The Research Center of Material Cultures, which functions at the heart of our museums and fuels the debate with the great knowledge production on post-colonial and artistic theory, is much included in our discussions. The establishment of the Commission for Restitution of Colonial Collections came with the creation of the so-called consortium, in which the initial collaboration of World Cultures, Rex Museum, and NIAID is extended with military collections sorting under the Ministry of Defense. Yeah, the Ministry of Defense. In May, the consortium May... organized a visitors program with representatives from archives and museums of all source countries. Next to restitution, a major issue to be addressed in the forthcoming months and decades is the exchange and restitution of knowledge. To end with a reflection to the West Kalimantan Sintang case, although this found place in another institutional and governmental context, the participatory element in it has been very helpful in acknowledging the equality of partners in today's and future restitution. Our museum underscores this and explicitly states that we welcome requests for restitution and facilitate accessibility to countries and communities all over the world. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your flexibility as well. So, Mrs. Musrika, I hope that we have you this time. That would be lovely. I'm just checking with my technical friends. Yes? So we are going back to Indonesia and hopefully we'll finally hear the last part of your presentation. I will continue, I'm sorry. Yes, please, and thank you very much for your, comp for your uh, understanding. Okay, I think until the repatriation of this artifact and have been well appreciated by the world community and the have historical value for the next generation. We do hope the next generation will learn and grow their interest in seeing and developing, developing the culture. The, repatri the repatriation of the artifact and indeed very important to support the museum activities and the process, the reproduction, so that the younger generation will be involved in preserving the culture of their ancestors. The that all the artifacts are is good, will have condition and steadily displayed and the galleries of Museum Kapuas Raya as an educational purpose for the visitor. I think uh, this is the picture about this is the Chinese people, this is the textile. And this is program education for the kindergarten, elementary school, junior high school, senior high school. And this is the my museum, Museum Kapuas Raya, the region Sintang, the region Sintang, West Kalimantan, Indonesia. Thank you. And I'm sorry when not there, but uh, the, the picture, they are in the house. Thank you so much.
Well, thanks to you. Thanks to you for being so understanding this morning and uh, bearing with us um, whilst we sorted out our technical issues. Thank you to all of us as well. Merci à vous tous. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, these are, of course, the difficulties of technology and being live. Uh, panelists, I'd like to thank you for your patience and for sharing your expertise. You have truly highlighted the importance of uh, bilateral cooperation and uh, working with uh, local communities. And we've all understood how important this is. Uh, uh, um, uh, Ms. Hoiting, Ms. Uh, uh, Pavatanasiu, uh, please, uh, uh, I will invite you to go back to the room. And uh, Mr. Bruno, you will stay with me uh, up here at the rostrum for the presentation of the third case. Could we have a round of applause for our panelists for the first two cases? Thank you. And I will now call the participants for the presentation of the third and fourth cases. Mr. Bruno, as I said, will be with us for the presentation of the third case with uh, Ms. Pin. Could you please uh, join us? Uh, Pinyong, who's the director of uh, the uh, Division for Cooperation with International Organizations at the Dem Department of Communication Exchanges at National Administration of Cultural Heritage of China. So uh, Ms. Br Mr. Bruno and Ms. Pinjiang will present the uh, return of 798 six ancient pots and sculptures accompanied by the signature of a bilateral agreement on the fight against illegal art trafficking. I would please uh, ask you for a round of applause for Ms. Pinjiang. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you for joining me at the rostrum. And I would also call on the experts for case number four. Now, case number four is the repatriation of uh, uh, over one, 183 objects, exactly, from the University of uh, Manchester to the Anindil Yakwa community of Grote Island in the Northern Territory, Australia, to be presented by Ms. Georgina Young, uh, who is uh, a curator of uh, collections at the Manchester University uh, uh, Museum. Uh, in uh, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ophelia Rinick, uh, also, uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, Ms. Ophelia uh, Rubinik is the interim director for the uh, Return of Cultural uh, uh, Objects Program. Uh, and Mr. Chris, Mr. Chris O'Sullivan from the Partnership uh, Group of the Australian uh, Institute uh, uh, of um, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait uh, Islander Studies. Thank you for being with us this morning. Mr. Bruno, we will start with you, if you please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, in presentation of this case, uh, the return to China of 796 um, objects illegally acquired by Italy, I will retur repeat what I already said for the Fagan case in Greece, when two countries uh, adhere to the spirit of the 1970 uh, UNESCO Convention, it is always possible to find the appropriate solutions to, res to return and restitute to the uh, uh, country of origin the items that have been illegally uh, exported. Uh, the Ministry of Italy was honored to cooperate uh, with uh, the uh, Chinese authority to resolve a case of illegal export which impoverished the uh, Chinese uh, cultural heritage and therefore wounded world, world heritage and world culture. World culture is the sum of the cultural heritage and identity of all countries. And this is a good practice that we would like to um, draw your attention to in this prestigious forum. The dialogue established with our cultural uh, uh, colleagues of China has strengthened uh, our relations between our countries and deepened our cultural relations. Let me move to the concrete case. Let me say a few words uh, about the Carabinieri uh, Unit for the Protection of Cultural Heritage that carried out the investigation on uh, illicit export. The Carabinieri and the protection of cultural heritage, uh, the unit CCTPC has been created in in 1969, uh, this was one year before 
the UNESCO uh, 1970 Convention, uh, inviting member states to uh, adopt all appropriate measures to prevent the acquisition of illicitly exported goods and to uh, uh, encourage and uh, favor the restitution of stolen goods and to set up specific units to do this. This command is part of the Ministry of Culture and uh, is a Bureau uh, of Direct collaboration with the minister carries out missions of security and protection of, of the national cultural heritage through the prevention and uh, repression of any violation of legislation on the protection of uh, uh, cultural and landscape uh, property. Uh, this command unit is uh, made up of specially qualified officers uh, that have been trained specifically in the protection of cultural heritage with the Ministry of Culture. The common, the, the current structure of this Carabinieri unit uh, has a central command, a uh, directorate for operations uh, with competence throughout national territory for the most complex investigations, and is distributed in three sections, antiquities, uh, uh, archaeology, uh, fakes, and uh, contemporary art. And there are 16 regional units or interregional units. So the command of this unit with its operational uh, units present throughout the National Territory carries out tasks of prevention and uh, fight against uh, any illicit action uh, against cultural uh, and landscape property and uh, also carries out uh, sensitization of all police forces, organizes training courses in Italy and abroad as well as activities for safeguarding of cultural heritage uh, during any natural uh, disasters or armed conflicts. CCDPC also manages the database for cultural goods uh, illicitly uh, stolen that is unique in uh, the world with over 200,000 cases registered, over 8 million works of art, 1.3 million uh, are uh, uh, being uh, actively researched and almost all have photography. Uh, we also have a system, uh, an IT system that is very innovative, uh, SWAD, Stolen Works of Art Detection System, uh, which is automated in terms of uh, research with an artificial intelligence software uh, that is on the web uh, and social media that recognizes and compares images of works of art that may have been the subject of crim criminal activity. So it is highly specialized in the fight against crimes against cultural heritage and landscapes, and it is made available to all countries. Now, the uh, history of uh, this particular case started in 2007 with a report of the CCTPC informing uh, the unit in Monza, a town near Milan, of uh, the sale uh, through the telemarket television channel of a, a set of archaeological Chinese artifacts of doubtful origin. An immediate investigation uh, enabled the Monza unit to, to uh, call upon the uh, Milan uh, Tribunal uh, on this case and in 2008 832 artifacts for the period between the Neolithic and the second transition period uh, prior to the Ming dynasty uh, were seized by the judiciary uh, authorities. Uh, 36 of these items, uh, of the items seized had nothing to do with the uh, case and therefore were left to one side. The Ministry of Culture through the intermediary of the Carabinieri in Rome consulted competent authorities uh, of the People's Republic of China. And they confirmed uh, that these uh, were authentic archaeological goods uh, belonging uh, to the cultural heritage. They've been illegally exported. Uh, Oriental art experts uh, uh, said uh, that uh, most of these discoveries are similar. It was found by Archaeological digs in Guangzhou, Shanxi, and Sichuan provinces, uh, referring to the historical region um, between uh, 3,200 uh, BC and 17th century. 
There was a civil case uh, during which uh, the Milan judge ordered the restitution of 780 cultural artifacts to the People's Republic of China. On the 20th, uh, 9th of March 2019, uh, there was in Rome a document signed between the two ministries according to which uh, Italy had returned to China the uh, the cultural artifacts belonging to China. A memorandum of understanding was also signed uh, by the Ministry of Country and the National Administration of Cultural Heritage of China. Uh, concerning the prevention of thref theft, uh, uh, illegal excavation, uh, illicit um, uh, import and export, and promotion of the restitution. Uh, so, according to this, Italy and China committed to, to reinforcing uh, their cooperation against these activities uh, by a series of acts uh, which would uh, focus on inter alia continuous information exchange the parties and decided to take the appropriate measures uh, so that the cultural goods of the other country if they are of uh, doubtful origin would be returned to the original country uh, so as uh, to prevent their further uh, circulation and defend uh, national treasures. Uh, it's uh, by recognizing the importance of uh, national heritage as a main element of national identity that's possible to uh, create these lasting transborder relations. Uh, I now give the floor to my colleague. Yes, do please. Uh, suite. So we'll now give the floor uh, to Jan Pieng, who's online. Thank you. Excellent. Dear colleagues, good morning. First, let me take this opportunity to thank the Secretariat and Madam Chair of ICPRCP for organizing this very informative roundtable discussion on new forms of cooperation in return and restitution of cultural property. It is a great pleasure to co-present the case study of Sino-Italian cooperation on the return of 719 six pieces of Chinese artifacts. And today I have with me Mr. Zhi Xiaoyong, Director of Office for Return and Restitution of Lost Cultural Property from the National Cultural Heritage Administration of China. He will join us in the following discussion if there is further questions about the case. Now let me follow Ms. Bruno's presentation and give you a brief view of the latter part of the repatriation progress. So uh, upon receiving the information provided by the Italian site, the National Cultural Heritage Administration of China immediately investigated this case and confirmed that the seized objects were mostly elicited, excavated objects from belonging to China, and none of them had obtained legal export permit. In the spirit of the 1917 Convention, as well as the China-Italian bilateral agreement on prevention of theft, clandestine excavation, illicit import, and export of cultural property signed in 2006, NCHAR officially raised a request for the return of the object through diplomatic channel and provided a detailed report on artifacts, identification, and legal basis. During the long and sophisticated process of judicial action over mm. 10 years, NCHAR, along with the Chinese embassy in Italy, worked actively with Italian's judicial department to process with the lawsuit. And in 2019, the Italian court made a final verdict to return the artifacts and artworks to China. On March 23, 2019, in the presence of Chinese President Xi Jinping and former Italian Prime Minister Conte, Representatives of China and Italy exchanged the certificate for return of the 796 Chinese artifacts and artworks. President Xi Jinping solemnly announced that the artifacts and artworks would be on display after their return to China, allowing the people of China and the world to learn about the sincere friendship between China and Italy. 
So in April 2019, an NCHAR working group arrived in Italy and make inventory for the objects to be returned and get ready for handover and ship back of these objects. Within six days, the Chinese team completed the inventory of all the 786 items and hand over them together with the Monza branch of Italian Carabinieri Command for the Protection of Cultural Heritage. China also invited Xinhua News Agency and CCTV to shoot the document important step of the repatriation progress and interview the representative of the Italian Carabinieri Command. Their documentations and interviews provided important image and video references for the follow-up publicity of the collaborative repatriation. On April 10th, these artifacts and artworks lost overseas for more than 10 years finally returned to Beijing, China. And on 11th April, these artifacts and artworks arrived at the National Museum of China for shortage. NCHAR immediately organized experts uh, who are in the identification of cultural heritage and archaeology to carry out identification work. It was confirmed that the repatriated items were mainly excavated or hand down from China's Gansu, Shanxi, Shanxi, Sichuan, Henan, and Jiangsu provinces, dating from the Neolithic age and to the Republican period of China, which is 19. 12 to 1949. Among them, 16 three items are identified as grade three cultural relics, which are valuable objects according to Chinese grading system. On April 24th, a journey back home, an exhibition of Chinese artifacts and artworks repatriated from Italy celebrated its grand opening at the National Museum of China. The exhibition took place on the occasion of the second Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation that brought together distinguished guests from all over the world in Beijing. We arranged the exhibition on this particular date in order to showcase this model collaborative repatriation as well as the China-Italian friendship to the rest of the world. Uh, so this picture is about the former Italian Prime Minister Conte viewed and spoke highly of the exhibition. The China-Italy cooperation in the repatriating of the 760, the 96 pieces of cultural property marks the largest, largest scale repatriation of Chinese artifacts ever made over the past two decades. It ushered a new era for China-Italian cooperation in cultural heritage and set out a new model for international cooperation in the return and restitution of cultural property in the spirit of 1917 convention. We consider this successful repatriation should be attributed to the following factors. First, it should be attributed to the everlasting love of the governments and the peoples of China and Italy for cultural heritage of mankind. China and Italy are great ancient civilizations with great health of cultural heritage. And China and Italy are not only dedicated to the conservation of their own cultural heritage, but also to the conservation of the shared cultural heritage of mankind as a whole. China and Italy are strong proponents and active participants of the 1917 Convention. Collaboration in cultural property repatriation has also been included in the agenda of the head of state diplomacy, drawing great attention to the people of the two nations. This co cooperation demonstrates the love of the governments and the people of the two nations for cultural heritage and their importance attached to the conservation of cultural heritage. Just as Chinese President Xi Jinping said when he attended the certificate exchange ceremony and appreciated some of the repatriated items, time-honored history and brilliant civilizations are the common ground for our two nations share. Those of us convinced time not on a 10 to 100 year basis, but instead on a 100 to 1000 year basis. We should promote time-honored tradition of history and culture 
and continue friendly exchanges between our two great civilizations so as to move forward based on historical progress. Second, it should be attributed to the continuous progress of bilateral collaborative mechanisms building for the return and restitution of cultural property. Both China and Italy are the state parties to the 1917 Convention and in 2006 signed a bilateral agreement under the framework of the Convention to set out specific principles and approaches for preventing illicit trafficking and promoting return and restitution of lost cultural property. In line with the Mrs. Zhang, can you hear us? Alors, je pense qu'on a... Well, I think once again we have a bit of a technical problem. I think we have lost our connection. Okay. Well, in that case, so we'll have to leave it there for this second case. Let's move on to the last one of the day. On to our next presenters. Yamanu Marang Mujigala. Ewan Nandi Chris O'Sullivan. Baladu Rajari Gibi. Nandi Wagga Wagga. Thank you. How are you all? Uh, my name is Chris O'Sullivan. I'm a Rajari man from Wagga Wagga in New South Wales in Australia. I'm also a senior executive with the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, uh, more commonly known as IATSIS. Uh, I'm here representing IATSIS uh, to share one of the ways we support and facilitate Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural resurgence. Uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge our community partners, the Anandiliakwa people, the traditional owners of Groot Island in the Northern Territory in Australia. Uh, IATSIS is the only national institution focused exclusively on the diverse history, cultures and heritage of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, correction, Torres Strait Islander Australia. We're Australia's foremost institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research ethics, protocols, collections and publishing. We also care for a growing collection of more than one million items encompassing films, photographs, audio recordings, art and objects, printed and other resource materials. With funding from the Australian Government, IATSIS leads the Return of Cultural Heritage or ROC program. We facilitate the return of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural heritage material from overseas institutions and from private collectors. To date, we've returned almost 2,000 items to Australia, to 14 communities from 11 overseas institutions and private collectors. I'd now like to hand over to my colleague, Ophelia Rubinick, who is the acting director of the ROC program. We arrive at the art centre at Umbacumba on Greet Island. It's an old shed almost 30 feet from the beach. Manchester staff, Georgina Young, Dr. Alexandra Alberta, and Dr. Jabulu Chipangura have traveled a long, long way to join ROC staff member, Dr. Ian Johnson and I for the first person for the first in-person consultations with the Anindiliakwa community. We've been working with them online for about a year. And this is our second collaboration with Manchester Museum, the first in 2019, which resulted in returns to four communities. The women at the Arts Centre need to unstring and rinse the silk scarves that have been sitting in the bush dye before we start. George, Alex and I help and we start chatting about the plants that they used to make the dye. Old lady, and this is a term of respect, old lady Edith Mamarika, the oldest person at Umbacumba arrives and we get to work proper. We sit under a wooden shelter on the beach on large mats laid down over the sand. We show Edith and the other community members, mainly women for this session, photographs of the Unindiliaqua material, part of the Peter Worsley collection held at Manchester. Edith talks about each item and she asks many questions. For a while she finds it a bit hard to work out that this material is so far away from her country. We record Edith and the other community members' discussions about each item and their wishes to have it returned to their care on Greet Island. 
Our methodology involves in-depth collaborative research to create spaces where custodians make informed decisions about the future care of their cultural heritage. We compile detailed repatriation report that includes comprehensive provenance research of the collection and the discussion of this, how this material is best cared for according to the decisions of the community. This includes reference to the institution's repatriation policy or guidelines and to the 2007 United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And the repatriation request report for the Anindiliakwa community is now currently sitting with Manchester. Alex answers some of old Edith and the other women's questions about the objects, their size, their weight, how it feels to hold them in her hands. The women are particularly interested in the shell dolls and want to confirm whether they're painted, painted with red ochre or not. Then completely unexpectedly, the Umbacumba school arrives. All the children rush in and settle down on the mats and join in. Macy, one of the younger and prolific artists, translates for them. Anandiliakwa to English, English to Anandiliakwa. Edith is joined by her son and is sharing her knowledge and connection to the material. We're all passing around our computers so everyone, including the children, can see the photographs and there's much discussion. Alex is surrounded by kids. She has her phone out showing photographs and little swiping fingers lead to the photographs of other objects at Manchester. And suddenly the kids at Umbacumba are engaged with the museum's wider collection. Alex can barely keep up with their questions about dinosaurs. One very little boy looks over my shoulder at the photographs of the Anindiliakwa spears and says, hey, I know them. Can you get them back so I can use them for fishing? Edith tells the story of her father making the shell dolls and points towards the beach where the shells are collected. The women's scarves flap in the wind as they dry. One of them holds the yellow dye made from a fungus, like the one that's held in the Manchester collection, and Georgia asks if she can buy it. A piece of bush dyed silk makes it way, its way from Umbacumba Beach to the UK. This trip reinforces relationships. The exchange of dialogue connects us all, children, elders, curators, Iatsis, Manchester, all with the Anindiliakwa community at the centre. Community consultation on country is normal work for Iatsis, but this is not just on country work. We followed Anindiliakwa cultural decision-making processes, and we met on specific areas of country and spoke with the appropriate knowledge holders. We were open to unexpected opportunities, like including the school children, and we met with many Anindiliakwa people to deeply understand their aspirations for this material and to build relationships that now span the globe. Those discussions on the beach triggered the women through the Arts Centre to revive and reimagine making shell dolls. This knowledge has been shared at a recent Girls Health and Culture Camp, and there's early talk of an exhibition with Manchester. Old Lady Edith eventually tires, and before she leaves, she looks at us all. Talking made me feel good, she says, not sad. When they bring it back, it's for everyone, for all Anandiliakwa. I'll now hand over to Georgina Young from Manchester Museum. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for listening. I'm George Young, and I'm the Head of Collections and Exhibitions at Manchester Museum, which is part of the University of Manchester. I've su been supported in the work that we're talking about today by an experienced museum team, by Manchester Museum Director Esme Ward, and by the wider university. A Manchester Museum is, and has been since its public opening in 1890, a university museum. Our neo-Gothic building in the middle of campus is home to about four and a half million objects spanning natural sciences and human cultures. The museum was born of civic spirit, curiosity and ambition at the height of British colonial rule and its collections still carry that history. University of Manchester is the only UK university with social responsibility as one of its core strategic goals and its impact in terms of the UN's sustainable development goals is unmatched. Our work with IATSIS is bound up with these goals. Cultural revitalisation and strengthening 
including returns of cultural heritage, are directly connected to good health and well-being, to reduce inequalities and more. Manchester Museum also cleaves closely to the 2007 United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which Ophelia already mentioned, and it underpins our partnership with IATSIS. Critically in this case, our approach is not restricted to the clauses that sp refer specifically to restitution and repatriation, but embraces the articles in full. So the claim we're talking about with you today is for 183 cultural heritage items collected by social anthropologist Peter Worsley on Groot Island as part of his doctoral fieldwork in 1952 and 1953. They were given to Manchester Museum at the end of Worsley's academic career, by which time he was a professor at the University of Manchester. That's how they come to be with us. It's reached the point of a formal request and is due to go to our board for decision next month in July. And so in terms of the latest UK guidance, um, so Restitution and Repatriation, a Practical Guide for Museums in England, which was released in 2002 by Arts Council England, um, our sharing and reflections today predominantly focus on stage one of that work, which is developing understanding. And as Ophelia has articulated, we've taken developing understanding very seriously. And we've taken taking developing understanding to the communities who, to whom these belongings matter the most. Manchester Museum's ambition is to build understanding between cultures and a more sustainable world. And never before has a restitution or repatriation process at our museum felt like it honors that vision so much. And also, it ties with IATSIS's vision of a world in which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge and cultures are recognized, respected, celebrated, and valued. Um, our partnership is genuine and our missions align, and that is why this work is so rewarding. And in terms of the impact on Manchester Museum so far, uh, one of the things we often talk about at Manchester Museum is curatorial humility. It's really hard to convey that over a distance of thousands of miles. And it's harder still to maintain the authenticity of curatorial humility when you're insulated within a colonial edifice. By being on country at the request of the Anindliakwa, going only where we were invited, and waiting for the moments when conversations, conversations could happen well, by finding ways to explain ourselves plainly over island radio and face-to-face, -face, by sharing what Anindaliakwa belongings we hold on their land, by explaining how they felt in our hands and where they lived in our store, by being taken into a confidence and deeply listening to and respecting what was said to us. In those ways, we come to know curatorial humility and we hold it close. What's on paper as part of a return request no matter how comprehensive and nuanced that might be, does not replicate embodied understanding. Our formats and requirements for requests are deliberately designed not to feel like a conversation about kin with a new generation artist on a beach as bush dyed scarves dry in the wind. Those of us who participated in the fieldwork carry a small piece of that with us, and we're consequently better placed to help assess the case, particularly its ethical dimensions and see how our policies and practices might change to be better able to encompass the spiritual and the emotional, the lived and the law. Manchester Museum has framed the return of cultural heritage as a gain rather than a loss for some years now. And those gains in terms of relationships, in terms of cultural enrichment, of future action and more, feel that much stronger for time spent in person on Groot Island. So without us being present in the process, so little of what now feels possible in Manchester and with the Anandaliakwa would ever have been imagined. And so I sit here today with my colleagues to really advocate for not only government to government work, but really human work, person to person, with the people to whom these belongings matter most, to whose culture this is. And um, I think that's all I have to say. Merci beaucoup. C'était vraiment très, très important. Thank you very much. It was a very important thing to say. Effectivement, c'était très important. Indeed, 
it was important to explain what you said is to put the humanity of the center of our debate. Thank you very much. And now very briefly, we are moving back to Ms. Jiang, who is back with us again. Can you hear us, Ms. Jiang? No problem. So no. I work. Not to worry at all. It's great to have you back. I will just ask you to be extremely brief, as we've only got okay. about 20 minutes to conclude. Thank you. No problem. Uh, so uh, I will be consuming with the third uh, factor that we think attributed to the uh, uh, successful repatriation cooperation with Italian government. Uh, that is the solid effort of China and Italy. Uh, who both have domestically made in prevention illicit trafficking of cultural property. Uh, Italian colleagues have just now shared information on the Italian Carabinieri Command as the world's first and the largest police office specialized in cultural heritage protection. These are the very powerful measures the Italian government has taken to prevent illicit trafficking. And the Chinese government also attaches vital importance to the prevention of illicit trafficking and the return and restitution of cultural property. The Chinese government has established a national law system per, for preventing illicit trafficking, including the law on the protection of cultural heritage, the standards for the verification and approval of import and export of cultural property, and the uh, administrative uh, measures for the uh, verification and approval of import and export of uh, cultural property, uh, just to name a few. The National Examination and Verification Office for Import and Export of Cultural Property have also been put in place at major ports nationwide. And the National Cultural Heritage Administration has set up a Department of Exchanges and Cooperation, which is also the Office for Return and Restitution of Lost Cultural Property. China's competent authority of cultural heritage, public security, and customers has jointly established the Information Center for Cultural Heritage Crime and Stolen lost cult, uh, cultural heritage information publishing platform of China to carry out capacity building for preventing illicit trafficking. So in response to UNESCO's call for celebrating the International Day Against the Illicit Trafficking in Cultural Property, we have also hosted a national forum for two consecutive years to enhance the people's awareness. Meanwhile, in the active implementation of the 1917 Convention, China has also signed bilateral agreements with 25 countries on preventing theft, clandestine excavation, and illicit import and export of cultural property. And under this framework of bilateral cooperation, has received, we have received quite a number of successful repatriation with countries like the USA, Turkey, Australia, Egypt, and Switzerland, just to name a few. So preventing illicit trafficking of cultural property and facilitating their return to countries of origin are what the spirit of the 1917 Convention rests on and what we should do in pro protecting cultural heritage of mankind. And we hope that china italian collaborative cases could provide useful references for interstate cooperation in, in return of lost cultural property in a new context. We reiterated that Chinese government is willing to carry out practical cooperation under the 1917 Convention and actively facilitate regional cooperation in the spirit of convention. And here I would also like to draw your attention to the Alliance of Cultural Heritage in Asia, which was officially established in April this year, preventing illicit trafficking of cultural property and facilitating their return to countries of origin are part of Archer's agendas and priorities. We are willing to promote partnership between Archer and UNESCO so as to make Asia's contribution to the return and restitution of lost cultural property. Thank you for your attention. Merci beaucoup, Madame Jiang. Merci beaucoup. Merci à, à tous nos experts donc pour ces euh, troisième et quatrième, euh, quatrième cas. Pardon. Euh, vous nous avez euh, partagé tellement d'informations. Thank you to all our experts for the first, third and fourth cases, for all the information that you shared with us, for stressing the importance of bilateral agreements to fight against uh, illicit traffic. And you know that it's um, an issue that UNESCO promotes with all its energy. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're extremely late, as you noticed, but you, we will give you the floor in a few minutes. Just, bo just before this, I'd like to share with you some of the quotes that were uh, shared with us this morning. For example, Mr. Amani Bokum, who is uh, the general director of the Museum of Black Civilizations in Senegal, and who said that 
museums should not be n uh, sp uh, spaces for nostalgia but for life, uh, hope, and uh, our museum will not be a space for contemplation, it will be a, s a space for life and construction, including in uh, when it comes to language, digital spaces can be key. And we know here that the digital question is central, especially in Africa. So thank you, Mr. Bokum, Mr. Bruno, who is the Secretary General for the uh, Ministry of Culture in, in Italy, explained that when two countries take part in the spirit of the 1970 Convention, then it's possible to find uh, uh, relevant solutions. And that's what we're trying to do today, to find sustainable and relevant solutions. We also thank uh, Ms. Cancino, who is the Director of Restitution in the Ministry of Culture in Perry, for the many examples of return and restitution in South America, and for stressing how important it is to collaborate at the international and regional level. And now, without further ado, I will give the floor to the audience here before coming back on several quotes that we sh are very important today. So uh, a few practical informations as well before uh, hearing you today. Please uh, just be brief and we, you will just have three minutes so we can hear as many people as possible. Please raise your hands as well when you want to take the floor. And once you have the floor, please ask a question directly to one of our experts here or share a recent and innovative case of return and restitution of uh, cultural property. Also, once you have the floor, please press the red button just in front of you next to the microphone so we can hear you. And also, please introduce yourself before asking your question. And if you're online, you can also uh, share your comments and uh, a member of your team will come back to you very quickly. So who would like to take the floor first? It's not always easy to be first. Is there any comments or questions? Yes, you have the floor, please. Organization and this great. Hello? Thank you very much for the organization and this brilliant panel. Uh, of course, due to our very strong connections regarding the Parthenon uh, marbles, uh, we one more time would like to underline you did it already and uh, we are very happy about it. Uh, but when there is a will, there is a way, is the brief summary uh, of the negotiations ongoing for the cases, which are not very easy uh, when it comes to legal basis, etc., cetera, uh, and also talking about human stories in addition to the art, uh, art value of the cultural property was very impressive and inspiring. Uh, so I don't have a question, but I one more time wanted to highlight how inspiring it was uh, to hear the uh, efforts to cooperate even under very difficult circumstances and when really difficult and long-lasting cases are concerned. And we are hoping to hear more about Parthenon sculptures, about their uh, return and restitution, which inspires us all the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I just ask your name, please? I'm sorry, it was because of excitement, I guess. I'm Zeynep Boz from uh, Minister of Culture and Tourism of Turkey. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all, uh, all the participants uh, in this inspirational event. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. And I would uh, also um, uh, like to thank uh, Mrs. Um, uh, Zeynep Bos uh, for her remark uh, um, regarding uh, the issue of the Parthenon sculptures. For us, the Greeks, uh, this is a very important case. It's a case which have, uh, has, of course, uh, different aspects. And as uh, I said uh, previously uh, in my uh, short introductory remarks, uh, 
um, uh, fragments from the Parthenon sculptures uh, are dispersed in different uh, European museums, not only the British Museum, but of course the case which was submitted here within the ICPSCP, who is the organizer of this meeting, is pending. Uh, in the, on the agenda of the ICPRCP since uh, 1994. So we would, uh, uh, of course, continue our efforts. Uh, the brilliant uh, example of uh, the return from Italy to which Greece is uh, uh, very grateful uh, was unique because, uh, um, as uh, also Professor Stambolidis said, uh, and of course Mr. Bruno said before, uh, when there is uh, um, um, uh, a will, uh, there is always a way, and this uh, must, uh, uh, and as also was said by Mrs. Boz, um, this must uh, be uh, um, a precedent uh, and an inspiration for other museums uh, holding uh, uh, parts of the Parthenon sculptures to start uh, changing their views and uh, be more positive in terms of uh, returning. And I really think uh, that, uh, and we Greeks are very uh, optimistic and uh, believe that uh, uh, there is a radical change in the attitudes which is reflected uh, in the international press and so on. So we are always hopeful and uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for sharing, uh, Mrs. Uh, Papatanasio. And it's interesting, you know, you mentioned being inspiring, and in fact, it is about inspiring and uh, and realizing how important uh, this is indeed. Um, I would just like to um, go back to uh, something mentioned by uh, Mrs. Sadia Bunsra, all the way from Indonesia. Uh, who declared recreating relations for lost culture and preparing for future generations is also important. Um, I would also like to stay in English just a short while just to mention all of you who are contributing online. Thank you to everyone who is sharing um, their views today. Our online participants have also been actively sharing the, their opinions on the importance of return and restitution of cultural property. And one of the comments shared by our key partner, International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, that's the IFLA, of course, duly highlights the role of libraries in this discourse. The return and restitution should not only be limited to cultural objects, but should also include systems of knowledge production. This could be done through repatriating control over descriptions and subjects' headings, repatriating metadata and in initializing uh, digital unification uh, projects. Donc je suppose que ça rejoint également ce qu'avait mon... So I believe this is also uh, linked to what Mr. Bokum said about the, uh, this digital, the question of a digitalization, which is very important today. So now I'm back to the room. Has anyone any comments or questions? We still have another 12 minutes uh, before concluding our morning session. So is anyone willing to take the floor? Maybe a, a question or a comment, or maybe you'd like to share like a recent case? Alizy. Thank you very much. I have just a question. Uh, to whom uh, it may concern. Um, this is a general question, and uh, I'm really wondering, and uh, um, thank you very much for giving me again the floor. Um, what happens uh, if uh, um, there is a will uh, from the part of two museums, because we, we see several agreements con uh, being concluded uh, between states, between museums, or between a state and a museum. What is the situation when a museum which um, holds uh, a state, uh, foreign state cultural property and really wants to, to return back this property and tries to convince the respective state uh, to change its legislation or to, to, to give it the permission or uh, um, if there are any views on the matter? Thank you. Thank you very much. Who would like to take this question? who thinks would like to contribute? Maybe Mr. Bruno, would you like to? Uh, I'm putting you on the spot there, but you were looking at me. <laughs> uh, this, this is a wonderful question. 
as you rightly said, the legislation of countries needed to be changed. I mean, we have legal constraints. We have to work on a legal basis. And you cannot improvise a process or a procedure. So yes, there are agreements between museums, one museum and another museum, but you always, uh, you always need to go through also the will of the state. And this is what we did. With China, as I uh, said previously, we signed an agreement between the Ministry of Culture and the Chinese administration. And this was important in order to solve the issue. But as uh, the moderator rightly said, the spirit of the UNESCO uh, 1970 convention must be fully shared by all states. And so the, the, the spirit of the convention must first convince the countries concerned so that we can find a legal solution for those uh, that the cultural property to return to the country of origin. Thank you, Mr. Bruno. Or I see here online, but uh, it, unfortunately, that's not possible um, due to all the technical ah, issues. Okay. Yes, but um, what would be great would be for for them to contribute here using the chat um, the chat okay. box, and we'll definitely I get back to them. Here's now, yes. And um, uh, uh, my question was not addressed uh, uh, to Mr. Bruno because Italy was a successful case of return and there was a political will. But the issue is I heard previously that the Manchester Museum uh, decided to, um, to return uh, Aboriginal objects uh, back home, which is an uh, excellent precedent. And it seems that uh, the museums uh, uh, have the possibility to do it. Uh, what if the state, the respective state, does not agree with the decision of a museum. What is happening then? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, please, Mrs. Young. So um, the law in the UK is quite complex um, in terms of Manchester Museum as a university museum is not governed by the Heritage Act or the British Museum Act. So we, we operate under charity law reg legislation. That's where we sit and our um, and we need to abide by UK charity law, and that's the, the legal framework in which we've conducted our work with IATSIS, and we go through all of the due process in terms of informing the British state and our, our previous um, return to four communities in 2019 was, was supported. So um, the UK's law is complex. Um, we can, there are places where we can act within the law and we can do valuable work, and that is, what our case study today was about. Um, and I, I hope that that shows that the UK sector is, is diverse, is thoughtful, is listening. Merci beaucoup, merci. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. I would like to give the floor to Mr. Bukum again. I know that you would also like to take the floor again and perhaps to tell us a bit more about your initiative in Dakar with uh, uh, museum directors. Could you tell us more uh, details about this experience? Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you for giving me the floor. Now, our experience in Dakar uh, was uh, almost completely by chance. Uh, over a year ago, we had the pleasure to uh, participate uh, in a, a return forum. Uh, there were many museum directors, and my, my friend here uh, sitting with me, who will take the floor this afternoon, was one of them. But since we were all gathered together, we decided to share uh, a few things. So we created an informal committee with museum directors. Uh, it was not uh, in international institutions or state representatives. It was just us. And so it started to uh, function, and we decided to organize a major meeting in Dakar. And we were lucky that about 60 museum directors uh, turned up from, I, I think, 38 different countries, from Europe and from Africa. 
So we thought maybe one thing we could do is to perhaps uh, change our narrative a little. Europe has its own narrative. We have ours. And heritage is not exclusively about what is sitting in Western museums. So the issue of restitution was of concern, but it was not the core of our activity. We tried to concentrate, and I don't know whether you saw the Dakar Declaration, but we could uh, uh, disseminate it here if, if you're interested. We concentrated on creating a network a network of professionals that will try to change practices, to have an exchange about museum collections. We'll try through practice to ensure training and to organize exhibitions that will then be a roving, that uh, will have a uh, activities with, part, with, with museums, especially European museums that have African collections. And we also have other museums elsewhere that have completely different collections. And we decided to con not to concentrate only on traditional African art and its production. The aim of the game is, at the end of the day, to have also in African museums uh, that are not only there to show Africa. If you're in Paris, in London, in museum, you have arts from around the world, not only that region, not only Europe. There's also art from Africa, and we would also like to show some native European art in Africa, and to show also the major figures of artistic production. For instance, in Black Civilization Museum, a few months ago, we uh, showed, we had an exhibition of 15 paintings by Picasso. It wasn't easy. It was very difficult to get the insurance, uh, to move them around, to have the conservation uh, uh, conditions, but we did it. And so our aim is to change our museology approach to ensure that uh, collections can move around the world, and not only our collections, to ensure that African public, African audiences can have access to the major works produced in Europe, and vice versa. So the aim is to change our approach, not only focus on restitution and repatriation, to create a group that will give great attention to the creation of digital platforms, and making uh, available the inventories that exist in museums, and also help training, because uh, we also need training if we want to change the narrative, including in the expression and the comments on the objects that are uh, uh, exhibited in museums. And this is what we're trying to do in a rather flexible manner. So we're trying to move forward. A group was set up around the Dakar Declaration. And we hope that very soon we will be able to finalize a concept note uh, that will really launch the project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bokum, for sharing that experience with us. I think that somebody else wishes to take the floor. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Fabien Goublet, and I'm, uh, I'm a consultant in artistic uh, 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 and cultural items in France. And I participated in uh, writing a book on the restitution of museum collections, political and legal. Uh, collections, about 20 co contributions from academics and representatives of a variety of institutions. Uh, so that's a publication I wanted to mention, but I also wanted to agree with the previous speaker. We talk a lot about restitutions uh, from museums to museums or to states, and a very important aspect is the circulation of cultural goods. And we also need to talk about the return of artworks to countries by the art market. It would be a, a caricature to only talk about returns of, uh, for instance, African heritage in France through the uh, administrative uh, return procedure. In France, for instance, in, in Versailles, a, a lot of um, the um, furniture disappeared during the French Revolution. 
and uh, also items were taken out of churches. France has not requested the return of these of this cultural property, of these artifacts. So I think that we need to distinguish the restitution of property that was illegally acquired and the need, and we've seen the example of China with archaeology items that were legitimately returned to China because the, the country saw these illegal expo exports of archaeological artifacts, and yet China is also carrying out its own return activities uh, through uh, acquisition uh, of uh, uh, items that were circulating. So we should not caricature the whole debate on restitution. The whole world, Africa, in, my, in the article that I contributed to that publication, I discussed pearls that were important for Africa, pearls of the 17th century that we found in, in Africa, uh, and uh, archaeological artifacts in other countries. And the circulation of cultural uh, goods is important, and it must also benefit countries such as countries in Africa. I completely agree with what the previous gentleman said. Africa must be able to benefit from Western art and Western cultural property. There must be exchanges, but it must not specifically happen in a top-down uh, administrative manner. It must also go through the art market, and I would really defend the uh, art market techniques in Africa. We must really uh, make sure that this becomes a common practice and that all countries must be able to take ownership of their heritage. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution of today. Uh, these are highly important aspects. Mr. Bukum, very, very briefly before I conclude. Yes, I'd, I'd simply like to react to what was said. Uh, I think that there are two art markets. In Africa, you have a contemporary art market that is very dynamic, very active, and culture centers are also very active in Dakar, Abuja, Cotonou, uh, Nairobi, or, or elsewhere in South Africa as well. That, that art market is very dynamic. It functions. And then you have another art market. That is the resale of what was taken out of Africa or elsewhere one way, or one way or another. And I think that we, ma we must remain very vigilant because states or communities can act. Recently, Senegal, in fact, the Mui community, uh, bought back photographs of Mamadou Ama. And this happened very naturally. These were in a private collection. On the other hand, I also believe that African states simply cannot spend billions buying back what is in the hands of the art market around the world. I think there are African alternatives uh, uh, for those uh, items. Uh, the uh, authenticity uh, argument that is frequently used to justify uh, sometimes extremely high prices, uh, from my point of view, is problematic. Thank you. Thank you very much for that contribution. So very, very briefly before we conclude, exceptionally we're going to go online uh, to Mr. Sherif El Sheikh, who is part of the Egypt delegation. And I uh, would like to say Aid Mubarak to all of our fr Muslim friends. Mr. Sherif El Sheikh, can you hear us? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just ask you to take a couple of minutes maximum because we're just about to conclude. Okay, I, thank you. I, I'll try to be very brief. So first of all, I'd like to thank the Secretariat for hosting, uh, holding this important meeting. Uh, and I'd like to, to speak about uh, a case of restitution for Egypt uh, that uh, occurred recently. Uh, it is regarding the repatriation of two pharaonic artifacts which were clandestinely excavated in Saqqara region in Egypt and illegally exported by an art dealer uh, uh, running a gallery uh, in France. Uh, this, uh, this case uh, actually uh, succeeded due to the cooperation between the, uh, the Egyptian and French authorities as well as the cooperation of the uh, of uh, of the uh, head of archaeological uh, site who uh, discovered the theft um, 
in last October, the French court ruled uh, to return the two artifacts to Egypt in a case which the art dealer was accused of looting, looting a number of ancient Egyptian artifacts through the clandestine excavation from an archaeological site in Sahara. So the deal occurred. Uh, the uh, this uh, unique of this uh, case is that uh, Egypt joined uh, the case as a stable port, uh, and for the first time, the Egyptian law number one hundred and seventeen for the year nineteen eighty three on heritage protection was applied in the French court in a precedent that, uh, according to my information, didn't happen before. And uh, again, uh, this was a, a successful case uh, that uh, that uh, is a result of the cooperation of the Office of Combating Trafficking in Cultural Property, the OCBC of the French Ministry of Interior, and Mr. Uh, Vasile Dubrave, uh, the French uh, Bulgarian uh, uh, archaeological uh, uh, head of archaeological mission in Saqqara, who discovered this site and who discovered the theft and reported it and provided all the necessary information to to the French and uh, Egyptian authorities. Uh, so uh, that's that's what I wanted to uh, to to speak about uh, briefly. Well, and uh, recently, uh, our. Uh, uh, Prosecutor General received the two key, the two artifacts in a ceremony held in Paris this month and participated by UNESCO uh, officials. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Hein, de nous... Thank you very much indeed for presenting that update. Once again, Aid Mubarak to uh, all those concerned by this celebration. We'll go back to Greece for a minute to hear once again. Mr. Stampolidis, director of the Acropolis Museum, who would also like very briefly to make a comp contribution. Mr. Stampolidis, you have one minute. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like uh, to say that um, uh, to move forward the question of Mrs. Papathanasiou, not only if there are two museums, they are um, in contact and favorable. What is happening if the population, the common opinion of a country is favorable for uh, giving back cultural property and statesmen do not? I mean, in the case of the Parthenon's cultures, 78% of the uh, British population is favorable uh, to return uh, the uh, uh, property, the cultural property uh, uh, of the Parthenon in Greece. And as you know, the decision of 2021 in the UNESCO uh, gave uh, the solution for uh, uh, intergovernmental uh, exchanges and uh, opinions. What could happen if the uh, population of a country is favorable and the statesmen do not. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Merci à vous tous. Il est... Well, thank you very much to uh, all of you. We have reached the end of the morning and we do note how important this issue is for all of us and for UNESCO that has organized this first uh, a panel uh, in the follow-up of Mondial Cult 2022. So this has been a, a wonderful exchange, and I hope that you've appreciated it as much as, as I have. It's been a great pleasure to be your moderator this morning. I uh, do wish you will have a fruitful afternoon, and please be back in the room at 2 o'clock sharp for the dialogue on strengthening cooperation with uh, police, customs and legal authorities and the judiciary. So enjoy your lunch and uh, many thanks to uh, all of our contributors this morning. Thank you.
May I ask kindly to take your seats, please? Because we are going to start. Um, your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope you are all comfortably. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, one minute. Long. You tell me. It's okay, you can go ahead. Okay, okay. Now, we can go down. Uh, your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you are all comfortably seated. Uh, for these who are following us online, uh, I hope that you can hear me well. Um, before starting these afternoon's discussions, uh, I would like to recall that simultaneous interpretation in English and French is available. Do not hesitate to, to let our, our colleagues from the UNESCO Secretariat know if uh, you are not able to hear the interpretation. I am delighted to be with you for the second part of this round table on the new forms of agreement and cooperation in the field of the return and restitution of cultural property. The presentations and discussions that took place this morning were fascinating and augur well for this afternoon. The omens are in our favor. This afternoon session will be divided in two parts. The first part will consist of a second international dialogue. We'll hear law enforcement authorities and governmental institutions from Turkey, Serbia, and the United States of America, who will explain how the work with the police, customs, and judicial authorities may help to solve cases of return and or restitution of cultural property, and what lessons have been learned from past practices. Afterwards, we will launch the second set of presentations on the new forms of agreement and cooperation for the return and restitution of cultural property. We are fortunate to have with us a diverse panel of experts from governmental and museum institutions from Benin, Germany, France, Mexico, Nigeria, Peru, and the United, States, the United Kingdom and the United States of America and Yemen. As this morning, after the presentations, the audience will be invited to interact with the panelists, ask questions, and share their own experiences. From the online participants, I will ask to please share any questions you may have on the Zoom chat. We will then share them with our panelists. Please bear in mind that we are here to learn from each other, identify and exchange best practices. Now, I wish to welcome our first round of panelists whom I invite to join us on the stage. Madame Seineb Boss and Madame Jelena Brodunochik, Stanislav. Apologies for the pronunciation. Madame Saini Boss heads the Department of Combating Illicit Trafficking Culture Property at the Ministry of Culture and Tourism of Turkey and is a dearest friend of all of us. And Madame uh, Yelena Bartonocic, she's policy advisor at the Department of International Relations and European Integration of the Ministry of Culture and Media of service. The floor is yours. La parole est à vous. Thank you very much. Um, this is just a great honor to be introduced by you, uh, dear Mr. Cordero. Uh, you have always been a pioneering expert and enlightens our ways. 
all the time during our research and studies. Uh, so today we are planning a little bit a different uh, way of dialogue because we will keep throwing the ball to each other if you would excuse us. And if you get bored at some point, just warn us and we will cut there. Uh, so I work for the Minister of Culture and Tourism of Turkey and as very kindly introduced, uh, I am the head of combating illicit trafficking department. Uh, and uh, I'm not a law enforcement, I mean, in the conventional uh, labeling. But of course I'm enforcing law. Uh, we are enforcing the uh, protection of cultural heritage uh, law, maybe not by undertaking operations, but supporting them. Or uh, maybe we are not, you know, uh, going to the customs and searching the suitcases or the cargoes, but we are supporting the ones who are doing that. So uh, today I would like to go a little bit back with you and uh, tell a personal story of how I perceived uh, when I first started working for the Minister of Culture and Tourism in 2007, uh, the 1970 convention. Uh, so it was my first week and I was given the convention's text to be, to learn it, to study it. And when I came to Article 3, I was like, I found it, I found it. I mean, I found the secret how we are going to fight against the list trafficking because Article 3 says, the import, export, or transfer of ownership of cultural property affected contrary to the provisions adopted under this convention by the state parties, thereby shall be illicit. So it is illicit internationally, I was like. And if we are talking about a cultural property, which was taken out of Turkey, let's say, after 1906. We have very early legislation. We have legislation from 1860s, etc. But the most strict and clear legislation, uh, to me, uh, is 1906. It doesn't have any exceptions con concerning the ownership and the prohibition on illicit export is very clear, etc. So I was like, if there's an object in a museum, in a collection, in an auction house, whatever the case is, doesn't have a provenance that dates earlier than 1906, and if it is prohibited in my national legislation since then, and if the 1970 convention says that thereby shall be illicit, then I should be returning everything back. Poor predecessors of mine, they didn't read the convention well, so they couldn't understand. Now I'm the smartest and I understood. Of course, it was not the case. It has never been that easy. Will, intention, consent is very much important to cooperate. And uh, during the, this morning's discussions, as said by Mr. Bruno very rightfully, if you want to do something, you really can do it, at least in the spirit of the convention. If you cannot directly execute it for that very specific case, you should have the spirit of doing something about it. And again, we should refer to uh, the director of uh, Athens Museum saying that if you have the will, there is a way. This is really the complete experience and this experience really based on cooperation. We are having cases, we are getting in touch with colleagues and we are at different uh, countries. For example, for a piece that's being sold in an auction house and we are providing some scientific data. With scientific data, I mean, I know that everyone in the world can request, I mean, not everyone in the world, but every agency in, the, in a source country can, re can request to their academics to prepare a scientific report and then send it to the uh, country where the auction, let's say, is taking place. So you may think that it's not that much a convincing way of taking action, but there are objects which are just characteristic to some countries which cannot be found anywhere else. And when they are being protected by national law, as well as by the international, then you should expect an action to prevent that sale, to return the object, to change the behavior. Sometimes we see it, I have to admit, and 
uh, after Yelena's introductory remarks, I will be giving you some brief examples of such kind of actions. But of course, I'm going to avoid giving bad examples because my purpose is not really uh, criticizing any, uh, how to say, behavior for such kind of requests, but then encourage also other countries, other colleagues also endorse the matter and understand that we are talking about something serious and we have nothing to do but embrace the requests, endorse the requests, trying to understand the philosophy behind it, apart from reading it from a diplomatical point of view, thinking about our political relations. Of course, there are truths of life, and of course, there are things that we should be concerned from a state point of view. That's for sure we are experiencing this all. But sometimes, instead of an uh, obligation, we are doing it because we feel more convenient. It has the you know, problem of the other state. It's not my problem. No, it is the problem of all of us. So let's consider it like this, and let's, let's start it like this. And I will just throw the ball to Yelena for her great introductory remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zeynep, for, for the introduction. And uh, I would like to use this opportunity to thank uh, everyone at UNESCO and especially Secretariat of the 1970 Convention for the, one of, um, new opportunity to share our experiences and to see how actually, as it was mentioned before in the morning session and now by Zeynep, when there is a will, there is a way. And one of the key elements is that are the law enforcement uh, agencies that neither of us are part of, but definitely uh, as members of the Ministry of Culture, in my case, I I'm not head of the <laughs> Department for Fighting Illicit Trafficking because unfortunately we still don't have that, but I am a focal point for the 1970 Convention. And uh, what is especially, I think, important for both Zeynep and me in this case is that we work directly with each other in many cases that we had uh, and in the past and now currently. So it's really a first-hand experience how this bilateral cooperation can work. And uh, ministries of culture, uh, they are really not law enforcement agencies uh, in the literal sense, but definitely are a very important part of this chain uh, without which the, we couldn't do what we do or be efficient. Um, illicit trafficking cultural property has so many aspects that appear uh, with the contemporary times. We can see new problems that appear. There are so many different forms of illicit trafficking. Uh, we can see it all the time. But I think uh, what we need to have in mind that without joint cooperation on national and international level, it's really hard to do your work. And it's, as Zainab mentioned, it's easier to say, it's not my issue, but actually it's a joint issue. We share all the problems. And as we saw, uh, Serbia had an opportunity to participate in a few projects that included different countries. Um, we saw that we can recognize the problems in other countries and share them and see what are the possible solutions for, for this issue. And especially important is to, to actually have a really prepared and aware law enforcement officers from the police, customs, um, uh, public prosecutor offices, uh, ministries of justice. Uh, the procedures are long, it takes time, uh, and it can be discouraging in some steps, but still it's necessary to prevail and to continue working together uh, on this issue. And this, the 1917 Convention really gives us a great basic framework to, to cooperate together and to find joint ways to solve this issue. And uh, I would like now to give a floor back to Zainab to, to, for the first part. Thank you very much. And Yelena, before you finish, maybe can you give us an understanding? Where is Serbia, what is Serbia's position in all around, what's going on? Is it a destination country? Is it a source country? Is it a transit country? Do you have examples of different positions? Yes, uh, as uh, Serbia in this status uh, to say as both transit and origin country. And for us, it's something that um, 
it, it, we have a double the problem uh, in a sense. And I think it's, uh, we are rarely uh, or ever a destination country just because um, our art market is underdeveloped and it's not regulated differently than any other trade. So in that sense, we are not very attractive as a de destination country. But as an uh, origin country, uh, we, had, we have a lot of uh, examples, both good and bad. I will concentrate on the good ones. Uh, we saw, um, I'm, most often we have uh, cases of archeological objects, which I think are in general most often an issue or subject of illicit trade. Um, because we have a huge number of archaeological sites, uh, marked or not marked, and everything by the law on cultural property, state is an owner of anything that is uh, on earth or underwater, undiscovered on its territory. So uh, basically that means that uh, whatever you find, it, we, you need to report it back to the Ministry of Culture uh, for further uh, research. Because of that, and because we have a really rich history in our territories, especially uh, a famous Vincian culture is um, on our territory, and which is very popular apparently in the last 10 years in art market, we quite often have cases of Vincian culture objects appearing. Uh, on one hand, very often those really are uh, original objects, but on the other hand, we also had the cases of uh, fake objects that really look really good replicas. And in, because of that, we also needed to add a regulation uh, to regulate uh, production of replicas that are souvenirs uh, in the country so we can follow. And so the custom officers and border control has easier job uh, in, in these cases. On, that's one side of it, and it's the story of archeological objects. We have uh, now ongoing bilateral um, consultations with uh, Germany um, for return, more than one looted. Actually, it's uh, looted, but they f it was seized by the German authorities. So we had a few, more than one case uh, with Germany, which is uh, very popular for a destination country, sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, the system works. Uh, as we talked earlier, it shows that the system works and that we managed to return some objects. We are now in process. As I said, it takes time but it's not impossible. On the other hand, we have um, objects that disappeared from the museums, which is maybe the rarest case, but uh, just last year, um, we had, last, no, the year before, 2021, we had um, a seizure of a painting by Vlaho Bukovac, which was uh, in, uh, in Switzerland, which is a result of cooperation of the, our national police officers and the Swiss uh, a police officer in customs, uh, which was stolen from the museum of Vojvodina, uh, one of the annexes of the museum in 1993. So it's almost 30 years later and the painting appeared. So this also, these successful cases give us opportunity to see actually how the illicit trader works and their mindset and how for some objects it's easier, for archeological si uh, objects it's easier maybe to, to pl place them on market faster than something like this. Uh, the painting is very recognizable. It's not easy to, to hide, but still it managed not to be seen anywhere for almost 30 years. Luckily, we were lucky to, uh, uh, to uh, it was seized in the try, when the dealer tried to sell it and it was returned last year in quite bad condition uh, to the Museum of Vojvodina and now is in the process of conservation. And just to, these two brief examples show us actually how much we lose in the illicit trade. The sites are damaged and the context uh, is uh, lost and any archeological uh, archeologist that you ask them will say, but when they remove it, we, we lost so much more than just an object. We lost layers of uh, a story that that site says. Uh, on one hand, and also the how in the process of having it illicitly traded, we also see a damage to the objects that are maybe more uh, contemporary, in a sense, in better condition, but still they, we now have a process that we need to, uh, to do to actually being able to display it. And when it comes to the transit, 
Um, we are part of so-called, as UNODC says, a Balkan route, which uh, includes, um, first and foremost, is referred uh, for um, drugs and uh, weapon trafficking, but also is recognized as the same route that go, uh, the illicit uh, cultural property is moved by. Uh, in that sense, uh, with the colleagues from Turkey, we have um, actually the first uh, seizure that we had and first case of return that we had was for, to Turkey. Um, it was uh, a little bit more than 2,000 coins that were stolen. Uh, in 2004, seized at the border crossing and were returned in 2011 uh, to Turkey. So um, now, uh, at the moment, we have two ongoing cases, uh, which we really try to, to manage to return everything to the countries of origin when possible, when we have any kind of hints and when our experts can also give their opinion and suggestions to which country we should refer to when, uh, when some uh, objects. In that sense, uh, because it's um, uh, a transit, but also origin, uh, can you please tell us the, the story of Turkey in this case? Of course, thank you very much for the information provided. Uh, yes, Turkey experiences the same model. Uh, we are more known as a source country, but uh, after everything happened in the region and uh, unfinishing wars and unsettlements, etc., uh, we are also experiencing being a transit country. Uh, we are also not a destination country at all, uh, but we are on the route, that's for sure. Uh, and here, when talking about uh, being a transit, I guess this is the one of the most important points that we should refer back to cooperation, uh, because um, when we seize a cultural object, if we are in a position to identify where it is from, we do not wait a second until we inform the relevant authorities. Most of the time, I don't even check if they are a state party to 1970 convention, because I still act on in the spirit of the convention. No, nothing is preventing me to do so. And uh, we are getting in touch uh, with the colleagues in the responsible country, and we start requesting at least some reports on it to get some rational, to understand better the origin of the uh, artifact. And of course, it is very important to convince our local authorities, national authorities, because when it belongs to your state, I'm sure that we all experience the same thing, uh, when it belongs to your state, when it is your own problem, it's easier to own it and to take action to protect it. But when it is a problem of another party, uh, then the level of owning can degree slightly. So this is the point that we should refer, refer to cooperation and not decreasing the level of concern, but increasing it even more in order to give a strong response. Uh, so this is what we are trying to do. And sometimes, as I said during my first remarks, the diplomatic situations may be difficult, but I'm a cultural heritage professional, so it's not my job to be afraid of the diplomatic situations, but at least to get ready for the days that we will be able to work together all the pro problems out. Uh, so this is what culture stands for. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, as a source country, uh, it is also important to cooperate, again, at national and international level. National level, um, the first thing we realized uh, when first started working in the area was uh, the cooperation among the national authorities was not at the level that it should have been. There is a certain level of cooperation, but it was not like the like a model, you know, it wasn't as exemplary as I am very proud to be uh, today. Uh, now we have a uh, dedicated police unit, we have a dedicated gendarmerie unit, uh, there is a unit within the military, uh, there is a unit within the customs, uh, and the communication between the national authorities is incredible. We are acting sometimes as if I am being the unit of the police agencies, and sometimes they are acting as if they are a unit of the Minister of Culture. So if we just put the egos 
in uh, inter-agency uh, competition aside, then our way is so open. This is my experience, I'm telling you. This really is like that. So we managed. I'm very proud of saying this, and I hope that if uh, it could pose a, a model, I, I will be just happy to share it with you again. Uh, and in addition to that, at the international level, cooperation is very much required because national cooperation means preventative measures uh, in other ways. But uh, international cooperation means also return and restitution. Why re return and restitution matters? Because return and restitution aims at killing the supply-demand equilibrium. So as source countries, as we are being reminded sometimes by some marketing countries, we have our museums full. We know that. We have very important, unique cultural objects. We are fully aware of that. We don't need the objects, literally, to return them for aesthetic values or to reach to a score. We are doing this because we would like to change a behavior. This is so basic. We don't want illicit excavations going on. And in order to stop illicit excavations, in addition to the preventative measures that you have to adopt at the national level, you also have a strong response at the international level. And to make people understand, well, I shouldn't buy this. Then Turkey will chase me. So let's not spend money to something that I may need to return. This is the whole thing. So that's why it's important to support each other. Uh, and with this uh, saying, I would like to inform you about um, an ongoing cooperation. Uh, Yelena already uh, g gave us the um, example of Serbia and Turkey cooperation ongoing for more than two decades now. And really, whenever they see something, they immediately inform us and we take action by taking their lead and sending the requested documents. And even, if to, even today, this morning, we were discussing on the matter and she said that I didn't receive the report. Uh, and we decided to uh, take it to home and try to understand where it was stuck, where it is stuck. So cooperation could be even at the personal level, putting a face to the case and knowing each other and discussing each other. One last point that I would like to talk about very briefly. Uh, we have a great cooperation with uh, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office in the USA, as well as the Homeland Security Intelligence, HSI. Uh, one day I received an email, it was, I, I would say, f five years ago, six years ago, uh, and I was working as an expert in the Ministry of Culture and Tourism. The email I received was from HSI, and it was, he, the email was requesting some information, and I was a little bit scared, I have to say. An archaeologist working in the ministry receiving a, an email from a law enforcement authority, which was established under 9/11. After 9/11, so it, it scares you a little. You you think that are you authorized to share information? Is it the correct way to share information? Have they go through the regulatory letter process? Is it diplomatically all right if I share information? Of course, this answer of these questions can vary depending on each agency or each country that you cooperate with. But my experience uh, concluded in the best way possible. And I replied to that email after making some amendments in the terms of reference of my units. <laughs> this works. And now today, we are on daily contact. And all the objects that you saw rolling behind me uh, were returned owing to the joint cooperation, joint investigations and cooperation with uh, Manhattan District Attorney's Office as well as HSI. Uh, they are really working as if they are working for their own country's cultural heritage, and this really encourages us to do more work. So we are motivating and inspiring each other, and you know, uh, providing some evidence uh, is not a matter when it comes to openness. They're asking what they need directly and we are providing what they need. I very much hope that our uh, applications to other countries as well 
will not end up with a simple and with a direct answer saying that you don't have enough evidence. If I don't have enough evidence, why not to help me to sort it out? Why not letting me know what kind of evidence will work for their country and jurisdiction? Why not encouraging me to provide more? So this is where I aim to reach uh, concerning the level of cooperation. And I would like to uh, finish my words with asking a simple question to, with, with a very brief answer to Yelena. Are you obliged, Yelena, to inform other countries when you seize an object originating from another country? Uh, thank you, Zainab. Uh, well, no, uh, by law we are not obliged, uh, but it's uh, a practice that was established quite uh, long before uh, I started working in the Ministry of Culture, uh, as, uh, because there is a very, uh, as Zainab mentioned, we have a, a 1917 convention, which we are a for, uh, member state for a very long time. We have a national legislation. There is framework for working bilateral agreements. Uh, but there is an intention to return objects. There is no intention to keep something that is not originating from your country. Um, that's why also the, um, it's important, for example, uh, Serbia and Turkey have signed last September an agreement uh, for cooperation uh, in, uh, to, to fight illicit trade of uh, um, uh, uh, cultural property. Before that, we had a 1970 convention. We didn't have uh, uh, obliged the methods to we, uh, so we need to, to uh, return or to communicate. But there is always a, a good will to return it. And we saw that in our case toward the countries whose objects are found uh, uh, on our borders, but also we see that in example from other countries toward us. There is a clear intention to try to return each uh, objects where they belong so they can feel, as Zainab said, it's not about keeping the score and having as much objects as one can, but actually to have a whole picture. Having in mind that culture is such an important element of social cohesion for anyone, it's very important to be able to see it completely. And um, that's why I think, for example, in cases uh, with Turkey, it was objects that were seized uh, in coming or going out of the country from Serbian borders. And why is it important to have a communication with the law enforcement? And not just on the national level, which is of course essential for prevention, but also for stopping, especially in the cases of us as a transit country. Um, the last case that we have is from 2019 and objects were seized from a person who was already marked in the system and someone that was a few years before arrested at the Croatian border. So because of the regional cooperation and sharing uh, information between the countries, uh, they, they, the Custom and Border uh, Patrol uh, Police decided to have a more thorough um, uh, a look through the car that was going by and it was seized, almost 3,000 coins were seized uh, in that case. So it's a huge amount of uh, objects and that's why it's important to always um, try to build the capacities uh, of, uh, on, of national agencies and to transmit the, the importance and um, of protection of cultural heritage for both our and other countries um, in the context of both convention but on national legislation as well, and to make it easier for them. They are not experts. They are not always sure what are they seeing, but to at least uh, put the bug in their ear to think about what they are seeing when they are uh, going through the uh, cars and buses and everything that goes through the border controls for them to think about it and to keep awareness, to raise awareness of the local um, local communities and municipalities because archaeological sites, uh, having in mind the huge amount of, of archaeological sites, it's necessary to have, um, to have locals also being aware of importance of their heritage and what they, they have. Perfect. Well, so we thank uh, you for the listening. I would like to thank uh, our speakers for this very interesting and concrete 
uh, discussion. Well, this uh, discussion has enabled us to understand the importance of the cooperation with the various services of law enforcement agencies, whether it is police, customs, or judicial authorities, in order to work more effectively for the return and restitution of illicitly trafficked cultural property. We now uh, we know that the difficulty of carving online trafficking and the vulnerability of the areas affected necessitate a stronger international mobilization and collaboration today, which is why when you have any doubt and concerning the provenance of a culture object, UNESCO encourages you to contact and inform the authorities concerned at your earliest convenience. All of us need to work together to protect this heritage for future generations. And without further ado, I would like to open the second part of this day on new forms of agreement and cooperation in the field of the return and restitution of cultural property. I would like to invite the experts from the first three cases to join me at the podium, Professor Ava Isa Tijani, uh, uh, Monsieur Thomas Bergvist Rieden, uh, uh, Madame Alison Davies, and Madame Maria Villarreal. For the first case, I would ask you to welcome Dr. Nick Merriman. He is chief executive of the Hordiman Museum and Gardens, who is online with us, as well as Professor Ava Isatiyani, Director General of the Nigerian National Commission for Museums and Monuments. They will present the case of the return of Benin bronzes to Nigeria. Before giving you the floor, I would uh, like to remind you uh, to limit your presentation to 15 minutes due to a very busy agenda and in order to allow questions and exchanges during the, this round table. The floor is yours. La, la parole est à vous. Uh, okay. Uh, Thank you very much, Your Excellencies. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the 1970 Convention, uh, UNESCO Convention Secretariat for organizing this uh, uh, dialogue. Uh, uh, the case of uh, Nigeria is uh, actually is widely publicized, and uh, uh, Nigeria is, uh, in Africa, is uh, the leading you know, country in terms of uh, repatriation of, uh, you know, uh, stolen uh, objects uh, across uh, the, uh, the, uh, the country, uh, I mean, across the continent. So the success uh, story is really quite wide, but in this case, we are focusing on uh, collaboration with the Honeyman uh, Museum and Gardens, uh, London, where we are able to repatriate 72 objects uh, uh, to Nigeria. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, I want to just uh, uh, give a background of this. Uh, the antiquities are in focus under our resolutions with the Honeyman Museum and Gardens represent important epochs in the history of the Benin people in Nigeria. Uh, they are the record of uh, Benin history. Uh, the artifacts are actually 
were stolen uh, during uh, the uh, British uh, uh, colonial soldiers uh, punitive uh, expedition of 1897, where they ransacked the palace of the Oba of Benin and the communities uh, and uh, cut it away with uh, so many Benin bronzes, uh, which are today uh, actually in many museums and uh, private collections across the world. Uh, so we, I want to first uh, just highlight a little bit, uh, uh, Nick will come in to give the details, uh, the, uh, the Honeyman approach. Uh, actually, Honeyman uh, acknowledges uh, in its policies that uh, some of the objects in its collections have been ac uh, acquired at different times and under a range of circumstances of which will not be appropriate today, such as through the forces uh, force or other forms of uh, duress and retention of same is experienced as an ongoing hurt or injustice. So we appreciate the spirit of the Honeyman in this case. Uh, I would like to say that there are many museums that have different approaches in our you know, effort in repatriating some of the uh, collaboration and, and I mean an agreement. We make sure that uh, where you know all accompanying information, digital data, and you know uh, communication and anything relating to all the objects, they are also transferred to us. So it's not just the objects, but also you know uh, the digital data that the museums hold. So we are now taking ownership, legal ownership of not only the objects, but also all the data, all the information. Uh, that comes with this, uh, 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 with the objects. But also, uh, the National Commission for Museums and Monuments has always stated that it is not averse to all sorts of collaborations upon concluding legal transfer of title, including loans, uh, circulation, touring exhibitions, uh, and that's what the future holds for the two of us. So we. Uh, in our agreement, what the future holds for the two of us. So we, uh, in our agreement, we also want to see that uh, we continue in different kinds of collaboration. It's not just, you know, uh, signing the transfer agreement and taking back the objects and all the accompanying uh, information and data and documents, but we want to work together for the future. And that is why we, uh, agree on uh, loan agreements, you know, and uh, joint exhibitions and so on. And in doing that, uh, we also want to key into what uh, uh, Professor Bokum earlier said, you know, we want to change the narratives. We observe that uh, many of the objects that are displayed in Western museums uh, actually does not give the uh, correct information impression of the objects. So we want to see, we want to see that our curators also take part in any joint exhibitions uh, uh, that will take place in such museums so that the narratives are actually uh, presented uh, correctly. Uh, these objects are actually functional objects and they portray the daily lives of these communities their religion, uh, you know, power, and so on. So we don't want to see, you know, objects uh, uh, in cases with just little information accompanying such a kind of thing. So uh, it is important for us uh, to highlight this. So what happens, you know, uh, so far, you know, with, uh, after this Honeyman? We have so many other agreements. I want to now widen uh, this uh, just so that uh, Nick will come in to give some details about the uh, Honeyman uh, collaboration. I want uh, us to also know that Nigeria signed agreement with many museums and countries. Uh, we have signed agreement with, the, uh, with Germany, Federal Republic of Germany, where all the public museums that have Benin bronzes in Germany uh, uh, agree to repatriate uh, uh, the objects in their collection. So we were able to do that. Uh, we have a total of 1,130 objects 
that are going to be repatriated to Nigeria. As some of you may have uh, also seen, that uh, the German uh, foreign minister and that the state minister of culture traveled to Nigeria with about 20 uh, objects to symbolically uh, show that, and uh, we are happy to receive that, and uh, we are making arrangements to return the rest. As also part of this repatriation, uh, we need to have some responsibility as well, where we need to have the enabling environment for these objects that are being repatriated so that you know we don't uh, uh, just get the objects for the sake of you know coming back to their original you know place but we want to take this opportunity to see that uh, we also upgrade our museums build new structures and uh, train our curators to and provide the enabling environment for proper conservation of these objects and as part of that we have already started the construction of new museums in Benin City uh, and uh, new storage facilities. Uh, we have also signed an agreement uh, with the uh, Smithsonian Museum of African Art, uh, where we have already repatriated about 22 objects, and so many uh, other museums are coming on board. The Cambridge uh, Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, uh, the Museum of Natural History uh, in the uh, United States, and uh, Ch Chicago Field Museum, and so many others. So the case of Nigeria is really unique. We have so many you know, museums that are willing and ready for us to go and sign agreement for the repatriation. I don't want to take the whole time. I will allow Nick to come in at this time. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Abba. Um, I will now uh, share my screen so I can give you some details of the uh, project that we did uh, with our Nigerian colleagues. Um, the Horniman um, is a, uh, a colonial museum founded uh, with collections dating from the 1850s through to really the 1950s. It's in southeast London. It's a museum of global culture and nature with gardens. And when I became director in uh, 2018, I felt we needed to begin to confront this issue of having collections from around the uh, uh, British Empire. So we developed a project called Rethinking Relationships and Building Trust around African collections in 2019 to 21, uh, involving also the Pitt Rivers, uh, the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge and World Museum Liverpool, where we worked with partners in Kenya and Nigeria to map collections against colonial scientific and military expeditions and aimed to discuss with colleagues in those countries what the future of these collections might be. And as part of that project um, at the Horniman, we did a consultation with our large local Nigerian British diaspora community on the future of the Benin material that we hold. Uh, we felt, for example, we wanted to discuss whether it was they felt it was good for the Horniman to have a display in the museum so that community members could bring their children to learn about this African uh, culture. They said no, 100%, it was stolen, it should be given back, but then we should uh, ask to borrow some material back on loan. As part of this work, we began to develop a restitution policy, um, really in anticipation of an Australian Aboriginal claim. which has only just happened. And as Abba mentioned, um, we decided that uh, claims would be um, uh, able to be discussed by our trustees when they were acquired illegally through force from people who weren't the legitimate owners under compulsion. And we would also take into account cultural uh, and spiritual significance. With the Benin material, as Abba has said, there's no um, doubt that they were looted. Here are photographs from the British um, expedition and looting in 1897. Here are some tusks with a photograph with the word loot put underneath. So there's never any doubt. And Frederick Horniman, the founder of our museum, seems to have been the first collector in the UK to acquire material from the looting of Benin City because he acquired it just a month after the looting took place. Mr. Hyder, who sold it to them, participated in the looting and actually wrongly told him these were really some of the very few objects to survive from the looting. Here's some examples of what 
we have at the Horniman called bronzes, but also we have wooden and ivory items. Um, the timeline was, as you can see here, uh, along with a few other museums in January last year, we got a formal request to return the material. We had already constituted a subcommittee of our trustees. Um, one of the big tasks always with these claims is to actually determine which objects are within scope, because often the documentation from these 19th and early 20th century collections is is not very good. So our curator did a lot of work on the documentation, produced a report. We had two independent academic experts review this. We had to take legal advice on our collections. Uh, did they constitute what's known as a permanent endowment? And uh, unlike the British Museum, which has primary legislation, the Horniman is governed by charity law. Of course, charities are not supposed to give away their property, so we had to take advice on uh, from the Charity Commission on how that might be possible. The trustees last March reviewed the um, subcommittee's recommendation, which is that they were clear that the items were acquired inappropriately and through force, and in the light of this, it would be appropriate to return them to NCMM. We had to do further legal uh, work. Uh, we had to do further research to determine exactly what was in scope and to do some consultation to complement the consultation with the Nigerian community. And we did that through the next uh, few months. We discussed the matter with Horniman members who are our regular visitors. They, of course, they also broadly said, yes, they were stolen, so you should return them on moral grounds and ask to borrow some material back for display. We also consulted school children who did our sessions on ancient Benin, um, and they were also very clear that the object should go back. Uh, the government department also, uh, we kept informed and they wanted to see a thorough pro process. We kept it fairly quiet with the media, research in our archives and endowment. We prepared a case uh, to the Charity Commission under what's called Section 106. Our trustee board met in July to finally agree 72 items that were in scope. Our lawyers applied for permission. Um, we were then told to uh, apply for a different permission under Section 106, which is moral grounds. And you can see things move quite quickly. In August, we got authorization from the Charity Commission, and then actually lots of detailed work on transferring the title, export licenses. Um, ABBA and his colleagues at NCMM just wanted six items to be returned immediately. So the other 66 are on loan to us, continuing in the Horniman. And then on the 29th of November last year, we had a marvellous handing over ceremony. We also changed the display uh, to recognise that ownership had been transferred. Here's the display as it is now from display. Uh, and in terms of the future, as Abba has said, this is the beginning of a relationship rather than the end. Our schools team is working with schools in Nigeria to do uh, uh, partnership projects. We're co-curating a new display of our Benin case with our local community and colleagues in Nigeria and we hope to assist with capacity building wherever we can. So we've been delighted at the very positive professional cooperation, and we look forward to working uh, further with them in the future. Thank you for your attention. Thanks to our distinguished panelists for this interesting presentation, which conveys that there exists a variety of solutions around the return and restitution of cultural property. Restitution, pure and simple, or with compensation, but also, if allowed and accepted in national legislations, loans, long-term loans, as well as restitution accompanied by culture collaboration measures. I would like now to ask you to welcome Professor Thomas Bergquist, 
Rieden, a researcher from the University of Lund in Sweden, who will be speaking in his personal capacity, as he has willingly returned to France, 36 pages of medieval manuscript that were stolen in the 1980s. The floor, Professor Bergquist, is yours. Thank you. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation to participate in this talk about important and exigent cultural matters. I hope that I, in some respect, can contribute with a few reflections from the perspective of the common man. I will not tire you with the complex history of the manuscript itself. That is another story. But I can mention that I happen to be a researcher with a PhD in art history specialized in medieval art and illuminated manuscripts, which has some bearing in this case. <clears throat> the story of the purchase, in short, is that I saw one beautifully illuminated leaf being auctioned on an internet auction platform. The quality was considerably higher than most medieval leaves, so sadly offered separately on the market. I started to try to find parallels and realized that the leaf was part of an early 14th century book of hours, actually made for the princess Isabelle de France in 1323. I didn't manage to buy the first leaf, but a few days later another was offered and I began to suspect that an important manuscript was about to be slaughtered. I won the auction and asked the seller if there were more leaves. There were. After having received a somewhat credible provenance, I bought them all and managed to trace all three leaves that had been sold previously. One in Arizona and two, strangely enough, in my own country, Sweden. I gave the owners offers they couldn't refuse and had thus collected all 36 leaves that had been scattered. According to the seller, though, there had been another four leaves in very bad condition, which had disintegrated totally. A footnote here is that there are eight different artists represented in the manuscript. Had more leaves been scattered, or died, um, no one would ever have realized that they belonged to the same manuscript. <clears throat> it was a matter of days before they would be dispersed. I began my research within the liter literature and especially with the help of the database, database Initial of the IRHT, the Institut de Recherche d'Histoire de Texte. I located a very similar manuscript preserved at the Mediathèque Chécano in Avignon, which according to the database consisted of 52 leaves. Convinced that I had found another hitherto unknown portion of the same manuscript, I contacted Avignon and the IRHT in order to get access to more than the, the 12 pictures that were online. Their answer came, there were only 12 leaves left. A simple addition of the numbers made it absolutely clear that I had the stolen leaves in my possession, all but four. I immediate, Im immediately contacted the Mediatique Chicano again in Avignon, and in this case, the theft had occurred between 1955 and 1980 when I was a child. This made it obvious for all that I was not the perpetrator, but after informing me about the Unidroit Convention, I nevertheless decided to return the leaves unconditionally without any demands for economic, economic reimbursement. This started a lengthy process with some unforeseen and rather frustrating bureaucratic turns, involving a separate dispute between the Fondation Calvé in Avignon and the town of Avignon about ownership, where they actually cited Cicero's quosque tandem abutere Catalina patientia nostra. Uh, but I see the process itself also as a witness to the seriousness and uncompromising effort with which the restitution was handled, with the highest regard to the importance of the cultural heritage. The final twist of the process is that seven years after it was initiated, 
I finally found the four remaining leaves by pure chance. The seller had died, and these four leaves were, of course, the best of them all and not in disintegrated. I alerted everyone, invol everyone involved in, in, in my case, and Mr. Monsieur Mathieu, you see, <laughs> uh, then working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, instantaneously contacted the, the Ministry of Cultural Affairs, and within hours, the leaves were seized, and all lost leaves eventually found their way home. The unusual in this situation is, I suppose, that the initiative came from a private citizen as opposed to when a cultural institution has identified a lost object on the art market or in a collection, and hence initiates a demand for return resulting in a possible settlement or a lengthy dispute. I think it will be meaningful to try to involve private citizens in future cases as transparently as possible in how the process develops in order that they not feel abandoned or even incriminated. In my case, a very able and friendly lawyer was appointed by the city of Avignon to be a middleman. Then suddenly another lawyer representing the Fondation Calvé contact, contacted me. This situation became somewhat confused and I refused to be caught in the middle. At some point, I tried to communicate with the curator of the manuscript collection at the Mediatique Chekano in purely scientific matters, but she was apparently prohibited from having contact with me. However, I could see clear messages from her to me in newspaper articles about the restitution. There was also a political dim dimension that I could detect from the minutes of the Conseil Municipal, where the opposition leader ob obviously accused the mayor and thereby indirectly me of being a fence. Once the dispute was settled, there was suddenly an entirely different o and overwhelmingly friendly atmosphere. The sense of relief in the situation was apparent. And the conclusion with the actual restitution of, at the French ambassador's residence in Stockholm was an unforgettable occasion, as was the generous and moving reception in Avignon last, last year. With these experiences in mind, I think that it's important to have a predictable way of conduct, a checklist that can be openly communicated to the donor, including continuous information about the progression of the process. As an example of another kind of restitution process, I can mention yet another manuscript which I have restituted. It was an Italian 16th century prayer book stolen from the Royal Library in Turin in 2012. When I had identified the manuscript, I contacted both the director of the library and the Carabiniere Tutela Patrimonio Culturale, and then went to the local Swedish police office where they hadn't got a clue what to do. I had to tell them that they had to seize the manuscript from me, contact the Italian embassy, and instead of preserving it among drugs and weapons, I had arranged to preserve it in the climate control safe at the university library of my town. When this story reached the news, it was totally anonymous a Swedish professor brought down a nefarious ring of art criminals, etc. Probably I should be glad that my name was not mentioned since the theft turned out to be part of a mafia structure reaching to the top of the Italian society. This case didn't reward me with anything and I suppose it can work as an example of how my earlier experience made the return a categoric imperative for me, but someone else could very well have felt unease and kept silent. There may very well be many stolen artifacts in private collections which would be returned or restituted if there was any form of positive and encouraging incentive, or at, last, or at least a way to avoid the risk of incriminating oneself. To a private collector, it's not easy to ensure that you don't buy stolen works of art, whether they be illicitly exported objects, looted archaeological goods, or objects plundered by the Nazis. The auction houses do not, or very seldom, reveal the provenance of their objects. This ought to be mandatory in order to establish a mutual confidence. The different databases are not always accessible for non-professionals, making it very difficult even for the proactive and moral buyer. 
the initiative to build a virtual museum of stolen art as part of the Mondia Cult uh, 2022 agreement seems to me to be an excellent idea in this respect. It, it will hopefully enable pri private citizens to check their artworks legitimacy. legitimacy. But it's, it will also enable officials and others to actively search for lost works of art more effectively. But one huge problem is the way artworks are being mutilated in order to disguise their identities. Manuscripts are sold as separate leaves, paintings cut up in pieces to give different measurements than registered in the databases, etc., resulting not solely in the loss of the artworks themselves, but also when dispersed or fragmented, the loss of their historical context and significance. In the case of the Avignon manuscripts, I'm sincerely happy to have contributed to avoid this loss of identity. For me personally, the decisions to act as I did was not hard to make. I imagine that I perhaps have some sort of moral compass, compass acting by example before my daughters, teaching them that if you find something that belongs to someone else, you return it, period. The economic loss has been duly overcompensated in cultural and social capital with the gratitude of the Fondation Calvé, the city of Avignon, and the French Republic, resulting even in an invitation to speak at the UNESCO headquarters, and not least in having a story, impossible to buy for money, that still works at dinner parties. Thank you. Paul. Paul. My deepest recognition and gratitude to Professor Thomas Berkwitz Frieden for his commitment to preserve and safeguard cultural heritage. The recognition, you have the recognition of all the cultural community, Professor Thomas Berkwitz Frieden. I thank you also very much uh, for this very interesting case, which serves us as a reminder, if one was needed, of the particular vigilance and due diligence that needs to be exercised while purchasing cultural property, even for private collectors, with special attention to the screening of online offers. I wish now to invite our next speakers who will discuss several return and restitution cases from various federal states of the United States of America to Mexico through their diplomatic representations with special emphasis to a restitution, a recent restitution made by the United States of America to my country. It was a very sensitive case, but very successful. Madame Alison Davis, Culture Property Team Lead and Executive Director at the United States Department of State, and Madame Maria Villarreal, Legal Coordinator of the National Anthropology and History Institute of Mexico, and dearest friend. You have the floor. Good afternoon, my name is Maria Jose Huelva, Huelva, Director for the Restitution of Cultural Property in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. Uh, I have the honor uh, to present Ms. Villarreal and I will help her with the English translation. INA is the institute that Maria Villarreal is the legal coordinator for the National Anthropology and History Institute of Mexico. It's responsible for over 55,000 archeological sites from which 193 are open to the public. And also, they have more than 162 museums at charge of Ms. Villarreal. So. Thank you. Muy, muy buenas tardes. México, al igual que muchos países, cuenta con una excepcional riqueza cultural. 
Mexico, like many countries, has an extraordinary cultural richness. La primera fuente de legislación encaminada a la protección del patrimonio cultural en México la encontramos desde, el, desde 1827 en una ley en materia arancelaria que prohibía la exportación de las antigüedades mexicanas. The first source of legislation aimed for the protection of cultural property in Mexico. It, it was a custom tariff law in 1827 where the export of Mexican monuments and antiques was forbidden. La actual legislación mexicana considera que los bienes arqueológicos son propiedad federal, inalienables e imprescriptibles y por lo tanto están fuera del comercio, lo que significa que no pueden ser tratados como mercancías. Mexican, legis Sorry. Mexican legislation established that archaeological pieces and monuments are state property and therefore are out of commerce, which means that they cannot be treated as mercantiles. Actualmente México tiene registrado un total de 55,078 sitios arqueológicos en el territorio nacional. Currently, Mexico has a total of 55,078 archaeological sites registered within the Mexican territory. La categoría de bienes nacionales, además de considerarlos como propiedad exclusiva del Estado, los reconoce como fuente de la identidad nacional y del conocimiento de nuestras raíces. The category of national heritage, in addition to considering them as exclusively property of the state, recognize them as a source of national identity and a source of knowledge and of our cultural roots. El robo y saqueo del patrimonio cultural es de grandes magnitudes. En muchos de los casos se trata de actos clandestinos que impiden a los estados afectados tener registro sobre el modo, tiempo, lugar y bienes culturales objeto de estos ilícitos. The theft and looting of cultural heritage is a problem of great magnitude. In many cases, the clandestine acts affect states from having the necessary information regarding the manner, time, place, uh, and place of the commission of the crimes. Además de la pérdida de la información sobre su contexto, se desvirtúa su significado cultural y su investigación se torna limitada. As well as the, as, sorry, as well as the loss of cultural objects and knowledge of, within the context, of the cultural object, it, it is also lost the cultural meaning as its research become limited. En virtud de que estos bienes son producto del espolio, su salida ilegal y llegada al país receptor evidentemente no es declarada ante las autoridades, por lo que no se conocen cuándo fueron exportados, sino hasta que aparecen en el mercado. Given that these goods are the result of looting, their exit and arrival to the country of destination, and obviously is not declared to, to the authorities. It is not known when they were exported until it, they appear on the market. Um, en virtud de ello, al ser tratados como mercancías, les despojan de su valor cultural, cuya información queda confinada dentro del ámbito particular y regido por las leyes domésticas. These goods are treated, as these goods are treated as merchandise, stripping them of their cultural value. Uh, this knowledge stays within the private sphere and this Uh, the, the, um, the merchants are protected by domestic laws. De esta forma, los precios, los nombres y de los comerciantes y los de los clientes, las rutas de abastecimiento y todos los elementos intelectuales y materiales se convierten todos en asuntos que atienden a oculta, que, que tienden a ocultarse entre los participantes que trafican con el patrimonio cultural. In this manner. Prices, name of merchants and customers, supply routes, and all the intellectual and material elements tend to become information that remains among the participants of this illegal traffic of cultural heritage. En este mercado, insisto, los bienes culturales son tratados como mercancías de conformidad con las legislaciones locales que pretenden resolver las dudas sobre su propiedad. Esto sin tomar en cuenta su propiedad, perdón. In the art market, cultural goods are treated as merchandise in accordance with the local le legislation that seeks to answer the question regarding the ownership issue. Esto sí tomar en cuenta las demandas de los estados que reclaman su origen, negándoles, negando así el derecho humano que tienen los pueblos originarios, herederos de estas culturas, a conservar estos bienes que les, son, que les dan identidad. This without taking into account the claims of the state of origin, thus denying the human right of the indigenous people, heirs of these cultures, to preserve these cultural objects as part of their identity. Se requiere la voluntad del ánimo conjunto de la sociedad internacional y de los estados para que la legislación internacional no pierda efectividad para la protección y restitución de bienes culturales. 
We believe that it is necessary to maintain the cooperation and encourage the international community so the international law does not lose effectiveness in the protection and restitution of cultural objects. La riqueza y diversidad cultural de México emana de las grandes culturas que habitaron el territorio nacional durante la época prehispánica, cuya herencia y legado son motivo de una profunda admiración y reconocimiento tanto al interior como en el extranjero. The richness and cultural diversity of Mexico emanates from the great cultures and in that inhabited the national territory during the pre-Hispanic times, whose heritage and legacy are objects of deep admiration and recognition. Por ello, uh, el, estas, este, esta, estos, estos bienes has, han sido comercializados de manera ilegal, vulnerando los derechos humanos de los pueblos y comunidades indígenas herederos de estas culturas milenarias. For this reason, their cultural creations have been illegally traded abroad, violating the human rights of indigenous people and communities which are the heirs of these ancient cultures. Nuestro país ha tomado muy en serio el trabajo de la recuperación de este patrimonio a nivel internacional, por lo que en el 2023 se han recuperado 338, solo en, los dos, en este año se han recuperado 238 piezas arqueológicas del extranjero. Mexico has uh, really taken uh, significance in the issue of uh, cultural property and traffic illicit traffic of the cultural goods. So far only in 2023, 338 archaeological pieces have been recovered from other countries. Uh, entre estas piezas que hemos recuperado, hay una que es muy importante, que a la que me voy a referir a continuación, que es el conocido como monumento número 9, eh, 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 cuya recuperación sin duda representa una de las repatriaciones más importantes del siglo XXI para México. One of the most recent achievements is the case that I will present today, Monument 9, which undoubtedly represents one of the most important uh, reputations of the 21st century for Mexico. El, el monumento número 9, conocido también como Monstruo de la Tierra o Portal al Inframundo que estamos viendo aquí y a la entrada de este salón hay algunas uh, póster que dan cuenta de este maravilloso de este, esta maravillosa talla, es una pieza que fue espo, eh, espoleada en la zona arqueológica llamada Chalcatzingo, ubicada en Cuernavaca, Morelos, en México, centro de la República. Monument 9, also known as Monster of the Earth or Portal to the Underworld, that we can see on screen and also on the posters that are in the lobby. It's a piece that was looted from Chalcatzingo uh, archaeological zone located in Cuernavaca, Morelos, in the center of Mexico. Chalcatzingo de origen náhuatl, eh, el lugar más, par, eh, más preciado de los chalcas, ven, eh, venerado lugar de aguas sagradas o de jades preciosos, ese es el significado de la palabra, es una zona de monumentos que ha sido re, reconocida por su destacada iconografía, Olmeca, madre de las culturas mesoamericanas. Chalcatzingo, it's a Nahuatl word that means the most precious place of the chalcas, also revered place of sacred water or place of precious jades. It's one of the archaeological zones that has been recognized by the outstanding Olmec style uh, iconography. The Olmecs are the mother culture of Mexico. El monstruo de la tierra o portal al inframundo forma parte de una serie de petrogravados de Chalcatzingo que data del preclásico medio alrededor del 700 o 500 antes de Cristo, lo cual lo convierte en los monumentos más antiguos hasta ahora descubiertos en el altiplano central de México. The Monster of the Earth or Portal to the Underworld is part of a series of Chalcatzingo petroglyphic dating to the Middle Preclassic around 700-500 BC, uh, making it one of the most oldest monuments in Mexico so far discovered of the central highlands of Mexico. El monumento número 9 mide 1.8 de altura y 1.5 de ancho y tiene un peso de casi una tonelada. Muestra una criatura fantástica de rostro redondo y boca muy grande de abultados labios. Por su gran extensión se especula que estuvo relacionado con, la, con rituales de la fertilidad o peticiones de lluvia en los que algún individuo atravesaba la boca del monstruo simbólicamente se estaría internando en el inframundo, de ahí su nombre. Monument 9 measurements are 1.8 meters high and 1.5 meters wide. Uh, it weighs almost one ton, shows a fantastic creature, creature with a round face and a very large mouth with bulging lips. Uh, due to its great extension, it is believed that it was related to fertility 
uh, rituals or requests for the rain, in which uh, some individual went through the mouth of the monster, symbolizing their entry to the underworld, hence the nickname of the piece. Aunque se desconoce con precisión cómo y cuándo dicho monumento fue extraído del país, se sabe que fue um, fraccionado o partido en varios, uh, en varios pedazos, dañando, lo cual ocasionó um, el daño de la pieza, y, uh, y yes, pero esto facilitó su extracción il, uh, ilegal y posteriormente fue vendido en el mercado internacional del arte. Although it is unknown precisely how and when the, mon the monument was removed from the Mexican territory, it is, it is known that it was broken into several fragments, damaging the piece and facilitating the looting of the piece, and it's subsequently withdrawn from the international art market. Se presume que esta pieza salió del país um, a los primeros años del segundo, uh, de, um, a los años 50 de, de, del siglo pasado. Uh, we believe that the piece went out of the Mexican territory around the fifties. Uh, en el en 1938 apareció un dibujo del monumento publicado por primera vez en American Antiquity por David Grove, lo cual sirvió como primera pista para el inicio de las investigaciones de los arqueólogos para la eventual identificación de la pieza, um, ya que en ese momento no se contaba con ninguna fotografía. In the year 1968, a drawing of Monument 9 was published for the first time in the publication American Antiqui Antiquity by David, David Grove, which served as the first clue for the start of the investigation by the Mexican archaeologist, which led to the eventual identification of the piece, since it did not, uh, we did not count with a photographic archive at the time. Durante el tiempo que permaneció en Estados Unidos, esta pieza fue exhibida en museos y exposiciones de ciudades como Washington D.C., Chicago, incluso fue presentada en el Museo Metropolitano de Arte de Nueva York. During this time, the monument remained the, the monument remained in the United States. It was exhibited in museums such as uh, the Museum in Washington D.C., Chicago, and it was also exhibited in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Tras su última exhibición pública en los años 90, se perdió el rastro del monumento, ya que fue retirado del museo y el coleccionista, al parecer, lo trasladó a Nevada y no fue hasta el año pasado que la unidad de tráfico de antigüedades de Manhattan lo localizó en Denver, Colorado. After its last public exhibition at the Met in the 90s, um, the piece was removed from the museum and the collector apparently moved it to Nevada, and it was until last year, 2022, where the Antiquities Trafficking Unit of the, of the Manhattan District Attorney Office located the piece in Denver. A partir de ese momento se inició un arduo trabajo de, uh, de, coordinado entre la Secretaría de Cultura a través del Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia y de Relaciones Exteriores. From that moment on, coordination uh, work between the Ministry of Culture through the National Institute of Anthropology and History and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs con las autoridades del Estado de Nueva York en los Estados Unidos para concretar la recuperación e inminente repatriación a nuestro país del monumento número 9 de Chalcatzingo. The Mexican authorities started working with the authorities of the state of New York to the recovery and eventual restitution of uh, the peace to our country, the monument 9 of Chalcatzingo. Después de llevar a cabo todos los protocolos que se necesitan para estos procedimientos el 19 de mayo pasado, arribó a la ciudad de Cuernavaca, Morelos, este emblemático monumento arqueológico. After carrying out the protocols that are needed in this procedure, in May 19, 2023, 2023 Monument 9 arrived to Cuernavaca, Morelos. La Convención 1970, en su párrafo segundo del artículo segundo, establece el reconocimiento de los Estados partes entre, um, ante la problemática del empobrecimiento en, en, en cultural de los países que enfrentan el tráfico de bienes culturales, así como la necesidad de establecer la cooperación internacional para afrontar dicho fenómeno. The Convention in paragraph 2, Article 2, established the recognition of the state parties to the problem of cultural loss of countries due to the trafficking of cultural property, as well as the need to establish international cooperation to deal with this phenomenon. Sin embargo, para lograr que la Convención de 1970 tenga los alcances necesarios para el cumplimiento de los propósitos, consideramos necesario que los Estados partes se comprometan 
al reconocimiento irrestricto de la propiedad de los pueblos originarios sobre su patrimonio cultural y por tal motivo la obligación de ser retornados a su lugar de origen. However, in order to ensure that the 1970 Convention has the necessary scope of the fulfillment of its purpose, we consider it necessary for the state's party to commit to the unrestricted recognition of the ownership of na native people over the cultural heritage, and for this reason, the obligation to be returned to their place of origin. Finalmente, es necesario un cambio de paradigma en los procesos de restitución de pro la propiedad cultural a efecto de de entender que la carga de la prueba para el Estado peticionario debe ser exclusivamente para acreditar que se trata de un bien perteneciente a las culturas asentadas en, en ese país, eh, la cual se realiza a través del dictamen técnico emitido por un especialista. Finally, it is necessary to shift the paradigm regarding the restitution of cultural property in order to understand that the burden of proof uh, of the petitionary state must be exclusively to prove that these uh, cultural objects belong to the culture, culture settled within the territory, which can be proved uh, by the technical opinion issued by the specialist. Y por otro lado, es, um, es obligación del procedor acreditar la, la salida le, uh, legal y posesión del bien de su país de origen, que en el caso de México se traduce indudablemente en una autorización del Estado es un certificado de exportación. And on the other hand, you have the obligation of the possessor to prove the legal exit of possession of this piece, which in case of Me Mexico, it is uh, through a state authorization and an export certificate. Muchas gracias por su atención. Thank Buenas you so tardes. Gracias. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today um, with my Mexican colleagues and share a little bit of the perspective from the United States. My name is Allison Davis, and I work in the Cultural Heritage Center of the US Department of State. Um, related to this case, um, I'll start the story in the 1960s when thefts of large monumental sculptures from archeological sites in Mexico and Central America were increasing and at the same time, these objects began to appear with more and more frequency in the United States. And the monument from uh, Chalcatzingo that we're talking about today is, is one of those examples um, that was first published, as they mentioned, in American Antiquity in 1968. At that time, the United States first recognized the role that our art market can play in the destruction of cultural heritage of other countries when illegally acquired cultural objects are bought and sold. And so in response, at that time, the United States took three actions. The first was to sign a treaty with Mexico. It's called the Treaty of Cooperation between the United States of America and the United Mexican States, providing for the recovery and return of stolen archeological, historical, and cultural properties. Signed in Mexico City in 1970, and the treaty entered into force in 1971. This is the first and only true treaty that the United States has related to cultural property trafficking. And if you look at the contents of the treaty, um, really what we agreed to do was to employ the legal means that were already at our disposal to recover and return stolen archeological, historical, or cultural properties. We recently celebrated the 50th anniversary of that treaty um, by supporting a project in collaboration with INA on preventive conservation and prevention of illicit trafficking of cultural property. The second step, step that we took at that time was that the United States came here to UNESCO. We were the only major market country that participated in drafting the 1970 convention. And the third step was that in October of 1972, our Congress passed the regulation of importation of pre-Columbian monumental or architectural sculpture or murals. This was the first US law to restrict the import of cultural property into the United States, and it was specifically designed to address this issue of large sculpture, like the monument we talked about today, that were being um, illegally uh, brought into the United States. A bit later, um, the US versus McLean court cases in 1977 and 1979 established that Mexico's 1972 national ownership law could be used to prove that pre-Columbian archeological material was stolen so that we could apply our own US National Stolen Property Act in the case of uh, these types of items. 
These are all really foundational moments in the history of the U.S. efforts to combat cultural property trafficking. These developments in U.S. and international law really led U.S. museums to begin to scrutinize acquisitions of objects, especially pre-Columbian objects, without provenance information that predated 1970. And at auction houses, we saw major declines in sales of pre-Columbian archaeological material starting in the 1980s. And we also saw an increased emphasis on provenance information in the market from buyers and sellers. But up to that point, overall the goal of the law and the policies in the 1970s and the 1980s was really to prevent further destruction of cultural heritage, further looting of archaeological sites. There really, um, it wasn't the goal to return cultural objects that had been obtained by U.S. institutions or inv individuals prior to 1970, such as the monument that we're talking about today. About 20 years after that, in 1990, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA, had a very different goal. That goal was to treat Native American human remains and certain types of sensitive items with respect, regardless of whether or how they were collected. This is a U.S. domestic law. It requires federal agencies and museums that receive federal funds, which is most museums in the United States, to inventory holdings of Native American sacred objects, objects of cultural patrimony, human remains, and funerary objects. They're required to notify and consult with Indian tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations to attempt to reach agreements on repatriation or other disposition of those items. And they have to repatriate items to tribes that have cultural affiliation with them. The NAGPRA process is available to 574 federally recognized American Indian and Alaska Native tribes in the United States. Um, these entities have tribal sovereignty, they have self-governance, and they have a government-to-government -government relationships with the United States federal government. NAGPRA has led uh, to the repatriation of the remains of approximately 100,000 individuals and 2.2 million items from U.S. institutions. And this expansive and longstanding domestic process has truly shaped museum professionals and American public opinion for more than 30 years. Um, the spirit of NAGPRA has shaped processes outside the law. The U.S. federal government helps tribes pursue repatriation from foreign institutions. Um, U.S. institutions have returned human remains and other sensitive items to indigenous communities in other countries. And recently, um, in December 2022, we have a new law called the Safeguard Tribal Objects of Patrimony Act that asks us to establish a framework for the government to federal government to work with tribes to pursue voluntary repatriation, both from institutions and from individuals. That includes um, some incentives, at least tax incentives. Um, so if we look at the situation in the United States today, U.S. institutions and individuals are just more open to carrying out voluntary returns of items that were acquired in the past under conditions that we would not see as acceptable today. Uh, so for example, in this case, the situation with the acquisition of Monument Nine. And that's especially true when the return or repatriation is to a community of origin that is an indigenous group or another country uh, or another type of um, community that needs the item. Some leading institutions just this year, including the Smithsonian Institution, are formulating and adopting policies on ethical returns. And so I think looking forward, we're going to see um, increasing actions in this, in this area. To support the emerging trends, the U.S. government continues to invest in programs that support both voluntary return and shared stewardship uh, in order to enhance understanding, appreciation, and also care for cultural items. Exchange programs build personal connections between institutions, foreign governments, and communities that foster mutual and understanding and trust, uh, both of which are really essential for carrying out this type of work. And in addition, Technical assistance and training programs aim to build capacity in institutions and communities to respectfully care for items when they are returned or even if they were to remain in U.S. institutions. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Uh, 
thank you very much for this interesting presentation of these various return and restitution cases. The former intended to be emblematic in a frame of international cooperation between Mexico and the United States of America. And now, if you allow me, well, we want to have a little break, uh, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, and uh, we'll have, we want to reconvene, but please uh, be on time, because then we could run out of time very easily. Thank you very much again for your patience and your cooperation.
de temps pour la discussion. Tant on est à l'île, il va falloir. Merci beaucoup. <rire> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, may I have your attention, please? Well, uh, please uh, uh, be so kind as to be seated, because we, 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 we are running out of time, and uh, it is of the utmost importance that we could finish all the presentations, and to give uh, all of us and all of you the benefit to try to take the floor and to try to encourage this round table. So thank you very much in advance for your cooperation. Um, uh, uh, I will now switch, switch to French. If you could put your heads on. I hope you've got your headsets on. I'm now going to suggest that we move on to a presentation. Many of you have heard something about the restitution of the 26 royal treasures of the Abomey Palace in Benin. Let me welcome up to the podium Mr. Emmanuel Casariru, who is the president of the... Kebonne Jacques Chirac Anthropology Museum in Paris, and uh, Alain Godonneau, who is director of uh, museum programs at the National Agency of Heritage and Tourism in Benin. You're welcome. So let me now give the floor uh, to our distinguished guests. You have the floor, sirs. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I have got a PowerPoint presentation together. I hope that can be put on the screen. So I'll be doing a duet here with Emmanuel. I'll be reporting on our experience uh, with the restitution of 26 royal treasures uh, uh, to the Republic of Benin. Because, and I specify Republic of Benin, it's not Benin, Nigeria, it's Republic of Benin, which is a separate country. So perhaps we can start now, please. Uh, cultural cooperation uh, between France and Benin is a part of a broader context. Development cooperation in general, and I'm sure you will appreciate uh, the difference I draw between Franco-Benin cultural cooperation and development cooperation in the broader sense. So the restitution of these 26 items, which were taken in 1892 by French troops from the palace in Abouye, is something that took a long time. It was quite complex and required the full mobilization of everyone in both countries. Uh, there was uh, intensive diplomatic dialogue, including the highest uh, state level, uh, with the two presidents, Macron here and uh, President Talon in Benin. There have been legislative steps taken in 2020, on the 24th of December, there was legislation passed in France. And in 2021, 22nd of October, there was legislation of a similar sort taken in Benin. And the point of that is uh, to reorganize uh, the protection of Benin cultural heritage, uh, including return restitution. Then was the technical practical organization of the restitution and transfer of the items. Uh, and in this uh, process, the museum, the Cabonli Jacques Chirac Museum, played a key role. We on our side were following the whole process from the beginning, 
that's to say sorting out the technical details uh, and I stress uh, this side of the red tape, the paperwork, because it's a very important, not just getting the items back, but what was most important for us uh, was to get to the full technical documentation dossier uh, that was passed on to us by the museum. And it contains all the necessary information about the 26 items. And I'd like to thank my colleague Emmanuel for that. Then there was a high-level Benin Culture Week organized at the museum. And there again for a week, Benin had a presence at the Cape Bonny Museum with this exhibition, which was honored by the visit of President Macron for a whole afternoon. And when you know how busy presidents can be, and therefore how stressful and demanding that was for us to organize them. Let me express my deepest gratitude to everybody at the Cape Only Museum. And in particular, its president, uh, I would like to ask him to pass on our gratitude to all his staff. It was a great pleasure for us to work with him. Now, we've moved on. These items restituted were exhibited at Cotonou uh, for three months and it was a huge success well beyond our expectations in the three months we had 235,000 visitors that's uh, four to five times what we expected uh, we thought uh, weekly numbers would be something like 1500 a day and it turned out to be, on average, 5,000 a day, with a peak at 10,000 per day sometimes. Maybe we could see a few pictures of the exhibition, which I'm sure you will appreciate. If we can just scroll those through, please. There we go. What's really interesting to note is that this restitution as I was saying, my introduction is a part of a broader development program. Benin has decided to use its heritage as an economic asset, uh, uh, driving wealth and employment. Uh, we're a small country, but we nonetheless managed to invest a billion euros uh, in the heritage area in general. We have four major museums, uh, Kings and Amazons, Daxomi to Abomi Museum. That will have 35 million euros uh, as part of cooperation development with France. We'll be receiving that amount. Then there is also the Creative Cultural Quarter or District in Cotonou, Q3C, with its Contemporary Art Museum and the Franco Benin Cultural Institute, which will be funded to the gym of about 90 million euros in Oda. Uh, we have the House of Memory of Slavery, an international Vodou Museum of Porto Novo. Uh, that is an institution that represents uh, Benin culture, but also cultural items from Cuba, Brazil, United States, and other transatlantic states, because that's a, a broad cultural area. So those are the four museums we have. At the same time, we are rehabilitating our cultural fabric in the country. Thanks to this outstanding cooperation with our French partners, K. Bonley, of course, but there are others, the National Heritage Institute and the Associated Museums are able to draw strongly on the French experience and see what they have developed here and see how it can apply to our particular national context in the light of our resources. So that's enough for me. I'll hand over to Emmanuel to tell us the rest of the story. But let me say once again, thank you so much for this partnership that uh, fully satisfies us. Thank you. Mm.
Merci. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Alan, for those very kind words. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is a fascinating story, this restitution. It's a story that once again reunites two countries with a sort of balancing out between them, trying to move on from what happened in the past, but at the same time recreate our bond so that we continue to travel together in this renewed relations. And for the museum, the Cape Henri Jacques Chirac Museum, it was an extraordinary adventure, I have to say. And maybe I should start by saying something about uh, the way the museum operates. Uh, Cape Henri Jacques Chirac Museum is a national French museum with anthropological collections for Africa, of course, Asia, uh, and el elsewhere in the world. And we have collections covering about 400 years. Uh, and the s stories, the backgrounds of these items are often complex. Uh, sometimes we don't know all the facts. Uh, and therefore, we have to investigate. Uh, so when a request comes in, we have to do a lot of historical research to find out how the items arrived and what it can say about the relationship France has had with other parts of the world through these items. In this case, in the case of the Republic of Benin, these were items that were confiscated during a military campaign in 1892 in the Palace of Kings of Duami, which was Bienza at the time. And so they were seized not by the army as such, uh, but by the commanding officer uh, that took them for himself. So this is a slightly different situation from what we had uh, earlier with Benin City, uh, because uh, there the financial expedition was paid by the sale of the items, uh, but uh, this was a sort of private initiative uh, by a French officer who then donated these items on two occasions when he returned to France, and they were held at the, Muse the Trocadero Museum and then in the Musée de l'Homme. The Cape Henri Jacques Chirac Museum is run under the principle of the innovative collections that say once the items are in the collection, they cannot be removed. And it was thanks uh, to this uh, that um, many of them, 400 years of collections, remained in the collections despite the ups and downs of French history. But it's also a principle uh, that admits some exceptions. And the restitution of the 26 royal treasure items is uh, a first in the museum's history, and for France uh, too. And it was an exemplar, almost a prototype, uh, a sort of exploration of the way this could be organized. To date, uh, the items were very hard to extract from collections. Uh, and with the speech at Ouagadougou by President Macron, uh, in 2017 made it clear that he wanted there to be temporary or temporary restitutions in the next five years for African countries that would request them. So this change of a direction made a big difference uh, to the request submitted by the Republic of Benin because that meant it was admissible. We then process to that request. It has to be said uh, that uh, these items had been in the museum for a long time. And we often explained that there was some uh, problematic uh, context to them. And there was a colleague 
who who was the director of the museum who did a PhD thesis on it and that provided information that enabled us to respond uh, to the request uh, this historical research is often long and painstaking people say that we exaggerate how long it takes to investigate provenance you shouldn't rush things through uh, because research workers need more time than people who work in communication. But uh, the work was done, and we produced a reply fairly swiftly. And we saw that we would be able uh, to put some flesh on this, these legislative bones voted through by French Parliament in December 2020, whereby not just these 26 items uh, could be restored, but also a sabre to Senegal. So it was a key moment in the history of the museum and for collections in general, because for us it was when we started to work together. And we saw that this restitution shouldn't be the end of a journey, but the beginning of another. And as you said, Alan, very early on, we started working on what scenario might apply. And I have to say that it was a very interesting cultural experience uh, because we all work differently. We all have our patterns of working and you need to blend all that to find a way of working together. And in that sense, the human sense, it was very rewarding. As you said, Alain, also, uh, we tried uh, to make sure that uh, that historical event uh, would be remembered with an event much less uh, spectacular than yours. Uh, but we got some items together and we invited the potential visitors uh, from Paris, uh, but also from the rest of the country, to come and see these items, uh, which had been in French museums uh, for a, a long time and were about to leave the country. This. Uh, exhibition was done jointly with you uh, so that uh, we could have another angle of insight because uh, it's a very important to, to draw on information that can be supplied by the country of origin for example which is what happened here and I must say I was struck by how much information you had in your Cotonou e exhibition you presented things slightly differently and we see from this uh, that these processes generate value added. In any case, this first exhibition in Paris was very successful and was an opportunity for us to stop and think about this shared colonial experience. And we thought we need to come up with a narrative that would be better shared uh, with respect uh, for everyone's memories and past uh, without uh, trying to erase or eliminate them. Then there was the Culture Week in Paris, following on from the exhibition. And we organized not just a scientific seminar, but also a whole range of different types of performances showing that heritage is about looking back, of course, but also it's an excellent opportunity for hearing from today's creators. So culturally, it was important, and we also had films involved, so it was very broad and very rich. Uh, another very strong aspect of it was uh, that this restitution was part of a broader ambition that you mentioned, that's to say generating museums, uh, uh, including the wonderful one you have in, in Benin, and playing the role not as instructors or superiors, but as partners uh, with you. And that is what's being done today with the Kings of Obomi and the Amazons Museum by offering our expertise, if ever it's useful, when it comes to conservation, in particular preventive conservation and stewardship. So it was a very rewarding human experience, and I hope uh, we'll continue forward with other shared projects and we thought it was very important that we should report together on this wonderful what historical fresco or page of history that we wrote together thank you very much
Thank you very much, gentlemen, uh, for that uh, report that shows the strength of the cultural links between your countries following that uh, major restitution. And it's very interesting to hear what's being done uh, to renovate the Royal Palace uh, and uh, uh, to uh, take forward the work on the Dome Museum of Kings and Amazons. Uh, so we can see there are often sensitive issues around restitution, but they can be managed and they can be placed in a broader uh, strengthened cultural and heritage uh, partnership, uh, which shows uh, that we need together uh, to work together more closely, which is something that UNESCO very much encourages, of course. Uh, I would like to welcome again to the podium Madame Ellison Davies, Culture Property Team Lead and Executive Director at the U.S. Department of State, and uh, Mr. Adonis, Monsieur Adonis Fakri, uh, who is at the request of Yemen, is in the room. And, uh, and uh, if I may also invite uh, uh, Monsieur Paul Fabel and Madame Katharina Ribe uh, from the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs. If I may ask uh, Madame Alison Davies uh, and, uh, to introduce uh, uh, this uh, 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 excellent example of, uh, of cultural cooperation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. I believe Mr. Fakhri is going to speak for first online. Thank you very much. Can you hear me clearly? Are you able to hear me clearly? Yes. yes. Okay. <clears throat> Excellencies, distinguished representatives and special guests, fellow colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon or good evening to you. Uh, please excuse me for not being able to attend in person to be there with you for this important discussion. Thank you for affording the opportunity for the Embassy of the Republic of Yemen to the United States. And here I would like to recognize His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Jumeh, Yemen's permanent representative to UNESCO, and affirm our appreciation to him for extending the invitation to the Embassy of Yemen in Washington, D.C. to engage in this discussion, particularly since aspects of this discussion touch upon the experience of the Embassy of Yemen in the United States. I am the executive advisor at the embassy in Washington, DC, and since 2018, I've also worked at is, as its antiquities and cultural property focal point. It is an honor to participate with you in this discussion concerning cultural heritage, and especially on this specific important topic. I think that we can all agree that cultural racketeering on any country's cultural heritage and properties must be repudiated and any objects of cultural patrimony illegally or illegitimately obtained should be repatriated. However, if it is not possible to physically return any objects that have been restituted to a country because of conditions of armed conflict, such as Yemen has unfortunately faced in recent years or due to other major challenges or constraints, it is a positive development that there can be another recourse available to have a country's precious and priceless artifacts held for their preservation and presentation with an internationally recognized museum or cultural institution like the Smithsonian Museum. Indeed, it is a prudent and practical alternative to averting risks 
that may affect objects of cultural heritage being returned to their home country if circumstances are not conducive for their secure safekeeping. And the recent repatriation of 79 Yemeni objects of cultural heritage that were repatriated back to Yemen and arranged for temporary custody via a mutually favorable agreement with the Smithsonian Museum can serve as a constructive example of partnership and cooperation in this regard. On February 21st, 2023, at an official ceremony held with the Embassy of Yemen in Washington, D.C., 76 artifacts comprised of 65 anthropomorphic carved heads made of sandstone and limestone, characteristic of the funerary stella dating back to the first millennium BCE, 10 folios of a Quranic manuscript from the 8th century A.C.E., and an inscribed uh, bronze bowl from the 3rd century A.C.E. were returned to the government of Yemen from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security with the in indispensable support from the U.S. Department of Justice and State Department. These artifacts had appeared and were apprehended by the superlative efforts of the U.S. government law enforcement agencies and authorities, and they augment the imperative of retrieving and returning more of Yemen's stolen artifacts. And on April 28th, 2023, three more priceless Yemeni artifacts were returned by the Office of the District Attorney of New York County, embodied in the forms of a silver vessel with an inscription from the second to third century ACE, and about an alabaster female figure, figurine from the second to the first century BCE, and an alabaster ram figure with an inscribed base from the fifth century BCE. The repatriation of these items is the culmination of extensive work of the U.S. authorities at the federal and state levels in seeking, searching, and seizing these cultural heritage properties, and it is remarkable that the two occurred just this year. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, without question, Yemen has a deeply rooted history, going back thousands of years, and as revealed by its ancient monuments, manuscripts, and materials, Yemen is one of the oldest centers of human civilization in the Near East, and was described by the ancient Greek philosopher Ptolemy as Eudaimon Arabia, better known, better known and in its Latin translation, uh, Arabia Felix, meaning Happy Arabia. For centuries between the 12th century BCE to the 6th century CE, six successive civilizations which controlled the lucrative spice trade, Ma'in, Qataban, Hadramaut, Ausan, Saba, Himyar, existed and thrived. As a result, Yemen is a place where the time of its, since the time of ancient kingdoms to the early periods of Islam, it produced a unique archeological and ethnological history. And protecting this history and cultural heritage is of great importance to all of humanity. Indeed, the artifacts returned this year are not only symbols and relics of Yemen's vast heritage and rich history, they're also part of the deeper social fabric that composes Yemenis. Civilizations that have risen and fallen uh, but the identity of Yemenis has endured. And this, it is this legacy that we want to maintain in Yemen and for the world at large. And with the support that Yemen has received from its friends, partners, and collaborators, we hope that it will ensure the means and enhance the measures for its preservation. Yemen's cultural heritage is cherished, while at the same time is challenged. From conflict to, cli to climate change, we must work together to mitigate any harmful impacts and to ensure that Yemen's valuable and vulnerable cultural property will be safeguarded for future generations to learn about. Unfortunately, Yemen has also been engulfed in a terrible crisis due to the Houthis' coup perpetrated in 2014, which not only detrimentally affected our economy and infrastructure, but also our social cohesion as a nation. Moreover, in recent years, Yemen's culture has been under attack from violent extremists and terrorist organizations. We use looting and illegal trafficking of our precious Yemeni antiquities for their own financial benefit. Some museums and cultural facilities in Yemen have been taken over by these groups and were a victim to pillage. For years now, most of what you hear from Yemen is heartbreaking news because of the armed conflict and its, and its protracted humanitarian crisis. Nonetheless, the authorities of Yemen's legitimate government have been doing their best to prevent further deleterious activities against our antiquities. And this has been an exigent endeavor. And today, even though it is not a happy Arabia, I'm glad that we can tell an ongoing happy story concerning a part of Yemen's cultural heritage. It is a, it is a success story, and one that has evolved over the past four years in a stream of events with a propitious outcome towards the protection of its cultural patrimony. And it adds to the gratifying development that also transpired earlier this year 
with the inclusion of the landmarks of the ancient ruins of Sabah in Madab as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Yemen now has been bestowed with five sites from UNESCO, and they are all treasures for humanity. Allow me to quickly share the timeline of recent events that ultimately harvested the fruitful cooperation and agreement with the Smithsonian Museum. In February 2019, the Smithsonian Museum hosted a special event on Yemen uh, titled Culture at Risk, Yemen's Heritage Under Threat. This event had sparked and spurred renewed attention to the precarious situation of Yemen's antiquities amidst the ongoing conflict. From February 2019 to March 2019, following the event at the Smithsonian, an expansive official visit to the USA was made by Yemen's Minister of Culture. The minister's visit entailed a robust engagement with US federal government and, US and New York state authorities, with officials from the UN, representatives of museums, auction houses, relevant NGOs, cultural heritage experts, as well as the media, including an exclusive article in the New York Times. From March 2019 to June 2019, the embassy in Yemen in Washington, D.C., with the Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, alongside our U.S. government and non-government partners, worked assiduously to address Yemen's particular needs and other crucial concerns to better protect Yemeni antiquities worldwide, including supporting certain cultural heritage projects. In June 2019, Yemen officially deposited its request to join the 1970 UNESCO Convention on Cultural Property. The Republic of Yemen pursued the 1970 UNESCO Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illegal Import and Export of Cultural Property to help protect its heritage and to prevent the smuggling of illegal trafficking of Yemeni antiquities. In, se in September 2019, Yemen's request was approved by UNESCO and, returned, and, and it entered into force in, a, in accordance with the terms of the convention. In October 2019, the United States Cultural Property Advisory Committee held a special meeting to hear about the concern of Yemen's cultural heritage protection with the participation of the Minister of Culture, senior officials of the General Organization of Antiquities and Museums, and the Embassy in Yemen in Washington, D.C. In February 2020, the United States government imposed emergency import restrictions on Yemeni antiquities on eligible archaeological and ethnological material from Yemen. As a result, Yemen's stolen cultural habit objects became harder to obtain and safer from being smuggled into the United States. Uh, in March 2020, the government of Yemen re uh, released a comprehensive statement on the announcement of the U.S. government import restrictions and affirmed its appreciation for the U.S. government's initiative for these legal protections and efforts between our governments to protect Yemeni cultural heritage. Following the COVID-19 pandemic and its associated impacts delaying the progression of our work, in June 2022, the government of Yemen requested the, the start of process of negotiations for a bilateral cultural property memorandum of understanding with the U.S. government. And in December 2022, the embassy was approached by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security about executing the repatriation of Yemeni antiquities that it had, it, that had, it had retrieved and retained uh, for their protection. In January 2023, joined by the U.S. State Department, the embassy held its first meeting with the Smithsonian Museum for discussions concerning the repatriation of Yemeni antiquities from the U.S. government. Here, was, here it, it was proposed by the government of Yemen to have the antiquities to be repatriated, arranged for a temporary custody agreement with the Smithsonian Museum. It was not deemed uh, the best time at this juncture to have the artifacts repatriated back to Yemen. In February, 2023, after a few weeks of coordination, the embassy and the Smithsonian Museum forged the custody agreement for the temporary loan of Yemen's objects to be repatriated by the US federal government. And the 76 objects were delivered for safekeeping study and showcasing at the Smithsonian Museum, um, uh, at the Smithsonian Museum of National, of, uh, uh, excuse me, the Smithsonian Museum of, uh, of Asian Art in Washington, D.C. And this was performed on the same day as the repatriation ceremony held on February 21st. And just two months later, in April 2023, the New York State government, through the office of the Manhattan District Attorney and its Antiquities Trafficking Unit, three more objects were repatriated, and these were also provided to the Smithsonian as part of another loan agreement for temporary custody. And you are seeing some of the images of these artifacts that were repatriated. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can clearly see from these dynamics and details, over a four-year period, there was a sequence of events and the intensification of efforts to protect Yemen's cultural heritage and whose confluence and convergence led to the realization of more legal protections, deeper engagement on and between government and non-government dimensions, and of course, the successful re repatriation of 79 objects 
which are now undertaken in partnership and a joint stewardship with the Smithsonian Museum. And our success with the processes for Yemen's cultural heritage concerns would not have been possible without the, assist the assistance and alliance with an, array, with an array of entities and in individuals from both the US government and non-governmental side whose support both past and present have been essential. I would like to quickly acknowledge and express our deep gratitude to the US government, the US Department of State, the leadership personnel advisors at the Bureau for Educational and Cultural Affairs, the Cultural, the Cultural Heritage Center, the Bureau for Near Eastern Affairs, Additional thanks to the U.S. Special Envoy for Yemen, Mr. Tim Lindeking, and his team for all their steadfast uh, efforts for Yemen, the U.S. Embassy to Yemen. Indeed, the State Department has been a solid and significant source of support and guidance, and Yemen has achieved its successful actions working together with the same goals firmly shared for protecting Yemen's cultural heritage. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security, the senior officials, special agents, managers, and officers at Homeland Security Investigations, Customs and Border Patrol. We are deeply appreciative for all the behind the scenes efforts for the seizure investigation, safe storage, transport, and facilitating the overall repatriation process. The U.S. Department of Justice, senior official and, and key personnel, particularly of the East, Eastern District of New York for carrying out all the necessary legal processes involved with the return of Yemen's antiquities and other related actions. The New York State authorities, uh, the leadership and the distinguished personnel of the office of the Manhattan District Attorney, emanating from the, the Antiquities Trafficking Unit of the District Attorney of New York, their efforts were another positive development. And it is a further example of the diligent work of our partners and friends in the US government in helping Yemen, but particularly now at the state level and through its dedicated agencies at the local level. On the non-governmental side, I, we, I would like to uh, here acknowledge the Antiquities Coalition, Chair Deborah Lear, co-founder Peter Data Hedrich, Executive Director Tess Davis, the experts and projects teams, for their unwavering support and wide ranging guidance with all aspects for Yemen's cultural heritage concerns and for their special projects being implemented in Yemen, to the administration advisors at the Center for American Overseas Research Centers, the American Institute for Yemeni Studies, from backing Yemeni arts, including cinema, such as the acclaimed Yemeni film, 10 Days Before the Wedding, to Yemeni and to Yemen's antiquities. Your unique support for the academic pursuit and various scholarly work on Yemen has been impactful to the senior management consultants and professionals at the American Foundation for the Study of Man, the Alif Foundation, Smart Water Foundation. We applaud your respective work in supporting training, capacity building, institutional development, providing resources, including modern methods for knowledge transfer and protection for Yemen's cultural property. And lastly, of course, the Smithsonian Institution, the National Museum of Asian Art Director, Chase Robinson, the excellent management and team of the Office of International Relations, the distinguished senior advisors, the superb collections management and institutional planning team, the expert curators and conservators for their meticulous efforts, and the outstanding media support staff and security personnel. Yemen deeply appreciates all your efforts to protect, preserve, and present its cultural heritage through this special partnership undertaken together. In conclusion, it must be stressed that Yemen that in Yemen, many unique objects of cultural heritage have been nefariously targeted and subjected to looting, smuggling, and illicit transfer outside of its natural borders by clandestine means. That is why we must work collectively and collaboratively to combat the trafficking of objects of cultural property and to protect and preserve Yemen's antiquities. It is wonderful to see the processes of restitution of Yemen's antiquities that have unfolded and, cont and continue to expand. These recent repatriations, particularly in the context of Yemen's current difficult situation and the partnership that has been formed with the Smithsonian Museum has the potential to increase even further with the prospects of more antiquities to be retrieved. And this could procure more partnerships with other cultural global institutions. It is my pleasure to inform you here that also in March of this year, Following the first successful repatriation of the 76 objects of the US federal government, now on loan with the Smithsonian Museum, the Embassy of Yemen in Washington DC was approached by a family in New Zealand who expressed their desire to return 15 objects of cultural property back to the government of Yemen that they had acquired a number of years ago, and they had expressed a preference to have them stored at a museum in the USA, but they will leave the, the definitive decision to be made by the government of Yemen for their final relocation. We are in the process of working with this family and will be coordinating accordingly with all governments concerned for the safe, secure, and smooth transfer of these objects to the museum to be determined either in the USA or perhaps elsewhere. 
And just last month in May, the embassy has further expressed its concerns to the U.S. government about the sale of Yemeni antiquities at auction houses in the USA. They are advertised as being objects of South Arabian origin, but this nomenclature is ostensibly used to obscure their true provenance to uninformed buyers, even though it is an established and recognized marker delineating a, an object belonging to Yemen. It is hoped that the sale of these objects at auction houses in the USA and in other places worldwide attempting to sell objects of Yemeni heritage will halt, and these items should be returned to the government of Yemen, and which can be arranged by a temporary loan with a designated museum for their temporary display and protection. Before the end of this year, the Yemen United States Cultural Property Bilateral Memorandum of Understanding will be reached, and it is being granted the highest level of consideration with signing to be undertaken with the Secretary of State and the Foreign Minister of Yemen. We await the scheduling for this process, and this development will bolster even more legal mechanisms and means to protect Yemen's cultural heritage, and which could foster additional repatriations. And once this bilateral MOU was signed, as the government of Yemen has stated officially before, the world will be on notice, including the black market, that Yemen's cultural objects involve major legal restrictions and ramifications for anything stolen, smuggled to be sold, or for any, type of any other type of illegitimate transaction. Museums, art galleries, private dealers and collectors, and all interested parties are advised to work with the Yemeni government and U.S. authorities to abide by all laws and regulations to curtail any further cultural racketeering of Yemeni antiquities. Also happening this year, Yemeni artifacts currently, uh, currently loaned to the Smithsonian Museum will be loaned to the National Museum of American Diplomacy in Washington, D.C. for a temporary exhibit and another example of intergovernmental and interinstitutional cooperation for antiquities concerns. And perhaps in the future, once the, once the situation in Yemen improves, there can be the possibility of loaning objects that are already located in Yemen to have for temporary display at museums in other countries, as those currently on loan abroad are subsequently returned back to Yemen. Finally, although our partnership with the Smithsonian Museum has begun and is flourishing, the prospects for cooperation with other museums or cultural heritage centers for the preservation of Yemen's antiquities is also possible and may be pursued in coordination with the government of Yemen through its respective embassies and in coordination or collaboration with the Ministry of Culture and its attendant authorities, such as the General Organization for Antiquities and Museums. Indeed, the potential for new forms of agreements and cooperation with Yemen in terms of cultural property preservation is promising and hopefully can be re replicated in other scenarios. I hope that I can join you next time in person. Thank you. Je vous remercie. Shukran Jazeera. Madam Edison Davis, please. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me a second opportunity to speak today about the repatriation um, that Mr. Fakhri uh, described from Yem to Yemen. Uh, during Mr. Fakhri's presentation, he mentioned a large and diverse set of institutions and individuals that played important roles in the return and care for 79 cultural objects from Yemen, including foreign affairs agencies, law enforcement, prosecutors, and private sector experts and institutions. U.S. efforts to disrupt cultural property trafficking and promote preservation have long emphasized the importance of collaboration between governments among agencies in our own country and with experts and institutions outside the government. So in my presentation today, I'm going to give you a little bit of context and relate that back to um, the events with the case um, with Yemen. U.S. implementation of the 1970 convention through our 1983 Convention on Cultural Property Implementation Act prioritizes collaboration with other countries to protect cultural property. States parties can request assistance from the United States under Article 9 of the 1970 Convention, and if certain factors exist, the United States may respond by imposing emergency uh, import restrictions or by entering into a bilateral agreement that creates import restrictions within a broader framework for collaboration. Import restrictions prevent looted objects from entering the United States, which makes it more difficult for criminals to profit from selling trafficked cultural property in the U.S. art market. And in countries with agreements, we work together on programs that build capacity, strengthen site protection, enhance inventories, build professional networks, and engage communities. Programs also promote a temporary and long-term exchange of cultural property for scientific, cultural, and educational purposes. 
Today we have 25 agreements and four emergency actions, including the emergency action um, that created import restrictions for archeological and ethnological materials from Yemen. Regardless of whether we take emergency action or enter into an agreement, the request process um, under our implementing law creates strong working level relationships that provide a basis for ongoing collaboration and programming. In the case of Yemen, these relationships started even earlier as we supported their efforts to join the 1970 convention in 2019, which is a prerequisite for Yemen to request assistance from the United States that resulted in emergency import restrictions in 2020. And in fact, these relationships built on even longer term collaboration to preserve, Yemen, to preserve Yemen's cultural heritage through the US Ambassador's Fund for Cultural Preservation projects between 20, 2001 and 2014 that range from restoration of historic buildings to preservation of ancient manuscripts. Within our country, the United States uses a whole of government approach to protecting and preserving global cultural heritage. The Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the State Department plays a central coordinating role with my office, the Cultural Heritage Center, providing both expertise and program management. In 2004, in response to threats to cultural heritage in Iraq, the United States created the Cultural Antiquities Task Force to ensure effective law enforcement collaboration to protect and recover cultural property. Member agencies include the Department of State, the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice, Department of the Interior, and the Department of the Treasury. Since the task force was created, we have supported approximately 100 training programs in the United States and overseas, and we've successfully repatriated more than 20,000 objects to more than 45 countries. In 2016, in the context of the destruction in Syria, we established an even larger interagency group called the Cultural Heritage Coordinating Committee to protect and preserve cultural property at risk from political instability, armed conflict, or natural or other disasters. This committee includes 16 agencies, not only our law enforcement agencies, but all US agencies working on global cultural heritage, as well as the Smithsonian Institution. Through these collaborations, we're able to um, do very effective work. One example uh, in the case of Yemen is that my experts in my office we're able to provide information to assist, to assist US Customs and Border Protection and other law enforcement agencies in targeting shipments of trafficked cultural property from Yemen before they arrive to the borders in the United States. Mr. Fakhri's presentation has illustrated how multiple federal and state level law enforcement officials and offices can coordinate to recover trafficked cultural property. In addition to government coordination, the United States recognizes that we must work with private sector experts and institutions to ensure the best care and protection for cultural heritage. For example, the United States supported the creation of the 2018 ICOM Yemen Emergency Red List of Cultural Objects at Risk, which was produced in collaboration between ICOM and experts from around the world. In addition, the US government supports the Cultural Property Experts on Call program, through which the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology's Penn Cultural Heritage Center connects US law enforcement officials from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Homeland Security Investigations, and US Customs and Border Protection with experts in archaeology and art history to support their investigations. And of course, the innovative partnership between Yemen and the Smithsonian National Museum of Asian Art shows the great potential for, cu for cultural institutions to work with governments to safeguard cultural heritage facing threats from political instability, armed conflict, but also natural and other disasters. For decades, the United States has invested in these networks of collaboration between partner governments, among our law enforcement, and with private sector institutions. And as a result, there was a strong network in place to work with Yemen to respond quickly to urgent needs. Over time, this network of collaboration will continue to support innovation in protection and care for cultural heritage from Yemen, as well as from other countries, while also playing an important role in education about the importance and diversity of cultural heritage. Thank you. Uh, I wish to thank our speakers, Madame 
Alison Davis and uh, Mr. Adonis Fakri online uh, for this very interesting presentation, which put forward a good example of how states can collaborate around the question of the return and restitution of cultural property, as well as the specificities for the protection of cultural heritage in situation of armed conflict. This partnership with Yemen is in many aspects inspiring and an example of fruitful international cooperation in the view of the safeguarding of cultural heritage. May I ask now uh, uh, Mr. Paul Fabel and Madame Katharina Riebe from the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, Mr. Jorge Prieto Hemmingsen, Director of Cultural Heritage at the Peruvian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who is connected online to take the floor, please. Hello. 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 Could you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, uh, so my name is Jorge Prieto, and I am a director of uh, the cultural heritage of uh, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in, in Peru. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the secret Secretariat and uh, UNESCO for this opportunity and our mission in UNESCO for uh, their support. Uh, we're going to do a joint presentation with uh, our German uh, colleagues about uh, the document of Simon Bolivar. It's a document uh, that belongs to our Peruvian national heritage, cultural heritage, that was on sales um, on uh, eBay Germany and finally was repatriated to Peru at the end of uh, 2022. Uh, I will ask, I will want to ask if they can, you can uh, show you or screen uh, our uh, PowerPoint, please. Okay, uh, so uh, we can uh, please go. To, yes, this is the document of Simon, Simon Bolivar. Next, please. So uh, we, this is to show how we work uh, in, in the Peruvian side. Uh, the general archive of the nation of Peru and the Ministry uh, of Culture, they have teams that search uh, uh, on the platforms in the internet to detect the possible of um, the selling uh, of uh, cultural uh, artifacts or documentary uh, of Peru that uh, belongs to our patrimony. So in that way, uh, in March 9, uh, 2019, the General Archive of the Nation of Peru detected the sale of a Peruvian document to eBay website in Germany and issue a technical report. Next, please. So what about the document? The document is a two-page document signed by Simon Bolivar and uh, Jose Faustino Sanchez Carrion. Uh, it was issued in 1824 in Peru and has two pages. The first page that we see here uh, has a title uh, of rep, rep, that uh, we can read República del Peru, Republic of Peru. It means that it's a public document, not a private one. It's a public and official document that was issued in the ninth century. In Next, please. So uh, this is interesting because we are going to, to see how traffickers work. Uh, the second folio is a folio in blank and show marks due to the faults in the paper. Next, please. Here, 
here we are, we we are going to see how the traffickers work because in the upper upper half uh, left section uh, we have a signature in ink and above a faint stain that contrasts with the empty space with all the appearance appearance of a circular design that has been erased. It means that the traffickers want to erase all the distinctive marks of the document. Next, please. Here we have a comparative, I mean, imagine it's interesting also because in the left side, we have the original document and, and, and in the right side, another document, ancient document, and we see a seal uh, clearly. And uh, next, please. We, is, we can sub, uh, do a superposition. No, no, uh, if you can go back, please. So here we see with this superposition that uh, this seal match uh, almost perfectly uh, with, the, with the seal that the trafficker tried to erase. Uh, next, please. So, which are the key elements of illegal trade? First, as uh, I told, the traces of having belonged to. We see little holes in the in the in the left. That it means that uh, this document had belonged to a larger set of document or file from which it has been removed for sale as an individual item. Second, the stain that we see of the ratio of the upper left, uh, that they try, you know, they raise the seal uh, that belongs to the military historical archive uh, of the Center of Military Historical Studies. And the third point is very important that in Peru, the law prohibits the sale of national documentary heritage requiring that any type of transfer be communicated to the General Archive, Archive of the Nation. It, it means that uh, to export or to transfer this document, they need a special permit. If they don't have this permit, we presume that was exported illegally. Next, please. So this is to explain how we work uh, with, with action we, we took in the Peruvian side. Um, the di director of patrimony informs our embassy in Berlin to notify the Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Germany about the act action of the property. The embassy sends a verbal note asking uh, the foreign of office to inform the German cultural authorities, the police and custom to stop the sales of the document on eBay in order to return it. Also, uh, uh, with a, a very good work, our, our embassy sent a letter to directly to eBay asking to stop this, this uh, sales on the platform. Also, Interpol Lima was asked to contact the police in Germany. Next, please. Now I, I, I give the floor to, to our, our our colleagues uh, from Germany that they are going to explain about uh, their actions. Thank you very much, Jorge, and also thank you for um, making this presentation happen by getting up so early, uh, so that we're able to com complete this presentation together. Uh, we'd also like to thank the UNESCO Secretariat um, and the Peruvian delegation in, in supporting this. So for Germany, the case started in April 2019 when we received this verbal note that I was mentioning from the Peruvian embassy asking the Foreign Office to inform the general German cultural authorities, the police and customs to stop the sale of the document on eBay. And in reaction to the letter from the Peruvian embassy in Berlin, eBay then just, uh, eBay Germany suspended the auction and the investigations by the German police um, revealed the name of the address of the seller, and they were then able to confiscate the document in August 19, not even five months after the initial request. 
Germany returned the document to Peru only three years later, in July 2022. And the question is, why did it take so long? And of course, part of the truth is the COVID pandemic, um, but that's only part of the truth, because um, there are several elements that German authorities need in order to proceed, and that is something that we also would like to talk today about. The legislation that transfers the 1970 Convention um, into German law asks for some prerequisite, uh, prerequisites um, of a return of a cultural good, and therefore some facts that have to be established. And any object, in this case, these documents, um, needs to be first part of a national heritage, meaning in this case, part of the national heritage of Peru, which was established in 2021 through a verbal note. It needs to be an original, which was established in April 2022 through an expert opinion uh, from German experts in that case, and also exported from Peru after the entry into force of this law in Germany, which is the 22nd of April in 2007. Some of these elements were only proven during the course of bilateral exchange, and hence not right away in 2019, which is when the original request was made. And it's not only about those many steps that we have to talk, but also about the many actors involved. So next, please. This is just to give you an overview, because um, we are a federal country, um, of how many different entities are involved in, um, in making such a request and returning objects. There is a lot of communication, not only between governments, but also via Interpol before and after the document has been seized. On the German side, there's not only the federal government, but the federal police, also the Ministry of Culture on the federal level, but also on the lender level, on the so-called regions, and the police of these regions, of these lender. This may look complicated, but it's due to our constitution, um, and we have set up quite good working conditions to, to liaise between those partners. And what is more, there are different legal dimensions to this case, which is what we want to present today as well. And for that, I hand over to my colleague, Katarina. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to my colleagues be, who spoke before me. I would like to use this opportunity to explain a bit uh, about our legislation. So the next slide, please. The one thing which is important to understand is that there are parallel procedures going on. So normally the police is informed in these cases. We have quite a lot of cases from Latin America. And they mostly start with a um, rogatory letter or international request for legal assistance via Interpol. And while that seems to be very, um, yeah, the, the, the right way to go but at the first, um, at first view, at first glance, this only leads to um, to that the object, which normally is the object which should be returned, can be used as evidence in a court case. So in a parallel procedure we have to go on, which starts with the verbal note we need to receive on a, um, on a in diplomatic communication. That is the procedure which leads to the return of the cultural object. And then uh, there's a third procedure which is not always happening, but sometimes happening, and that is if there's also kind of a criminal proceedings in Germany, then we would also have involvement of the German police also on federal and lender level, but that would only lead to the conviction of the perpetrator in Germany. So the thing we are mostly looking at is the return of the cultural object, and then there's this um, procedure which is uh, completely ruled by our Cultural Property Protection Act, that is the legislation which puts into force the 1970s convention. Next slide, please. We want to show you a bit of the preconditions and the aim why we want, why we want to do this is to show you that we need certain information if we, are, if we get this um, diplomatic note uh, telling us what it is about. So we need a note first and that note should firmly claim that there is an illegally traded cultural object in Germany and that needs to be returned. Click, please. Um, then certainly the object needs to be protected by the 1970 Convention. It needs to be part of the national heritage of the state who claims it back. And then we have the little problem that the, our um, legislation only came into force in 2007. So we need some proof that it was 
exported after the 26th of April 2007. Click, please. And then, voila, there is a claim for uh, restitution. Um, however, there is also, I'm going to explain about that in a second, uh, we might come to the point that the owner in Germany has acquired um, his ownership illegally and there might be a claim for compensation. Next, please. Quite often, it is difficult to prove when an object has been exported um, and then we have a quite clever move, I think, in, the, in our new law. Click, please. Um, so there might be a chance that you can prove that it was imported into Germany before uh, 2007. Click, please. And then there would be no claim, claim of uh, restitution. And the reason is quite simple. We can't rule or we can't have a law which rules over things which has happened in the past. We can't have that. So if it's clear that it was imported before we made this law, putting the 1970s convention into law, there cannot be a claim for restitution. Next, please. However, as it is quite often not, not clear really when things were important, can you click again, please? Sorry, I thought I could click it myself. That would, would be nicer. Um, can you click, please, again? And there is no proof of import before that, if we can't have this, another click. We kind of assume that it was illegally ex exported after 2007, and then click again, please. And then there is again a claim for restitution. So this is quite good if uh, at least it means in, in, um, on the German side if any kind of auction house hasn't done their work properly, haven't, hasn't done their homework properly, and have kind of established the, um, the, the provenance of the whole thing, uh, and they just can't say when things have been imported, then it goes like in favor of the state who reclaims things. Um, yeah, I should say at this point that um, in this case, we're coming back to our Peruvian case, it was quite interesting. And then the, when the police went to, um, to interview the, uh, the owner of the document, um, they were told that, they had, that he had acquired the whole thing in Belgium, in Brussels. So we would have legally to just find out whether he could have acquired ownership of this document under Belgian law. And then in the second step, whether it would have made a difference when the document was brought from Belgium into Germany. We were very lucky in this case. The owner agreed that he would simply return it to Peru. Um, next slide, please. We would just like to put it in short again and do a bit of kind of advertisement for this law. Um, it is quite young and it shows that we are really strongly committed to combating illicit trafficking of cultural objects. We have established new procedures to facilitate the return of cultural objects, and, but it can only be achieved through a request for return through diplomatic channels. So anybody who works in this field, if you come across that, please write us the appropriate letter so that we can start. I want to point, point out again that if you just go through Interpol and claim legal assistance there, it will only, it might need to the seizure of, of the object, but it doesn't give you a, a claim for return. So you have to do it both in the end. And also, please bear with us, as I heard from my esteemed colleague on my left, uh, we are both federal countries and we have federal systems. We have to involve many more players and this, this is why things sometimes take some time. So we need to be some um, information to act. At this point, I should also say that this is only for non-EU countries, for EU countries we don't have this kind of clever move that if you can't prove when it was, when the good was imported, that we assume it was imported on a certain date, but there is a longer period because of European, European legislation. So this is only due to uh, European legislation, not, uh, uh, to, not to the goodwill on our side, uh, but we have to just keep in the boundaries of European law here. 
thank you very much. We're handing back now to Peru because this is where this story ends and I think they should tell the end. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Katerina. Uh, well, this is the, the final part, uh, restitution and repatriation. Finally, in June 22, the seller, as, as she told us, uh, the seller of, on eBay agreed to return the document to Peru, and it was handed over to them, the Peruvian embassy, in June 22, and finally was repatriated at the end of 2022. Next, please. So Peru is, uh, was a center of very ancient civilization and uh, thanks to our work, uh, Peru has ob ob obtained the, the return of valuable pieces of its cultural heritage, thanks to the diplomatic efforts of our embassies and consulate, uh, as well as the willing of foreign authorities, like in this case, Germany, um, also authorities and representative of public or and, and private institution. Uh, from 2019 to 2023, we managed to repatriate 2,131 pieces, most of them of high value. Next, please. So thank you to you very much. Uh, thank uh, you, to all of you, to our latest panelists for this very interesting presentation that recalls the necessity of vigilance and due diligence while purchasing cultural property. It take, I take the benefit to recall that UNESCO adopted in 1999 the International Code of Ethics for Dealers in Cultural Property. The main idea was to elaborate the standards for the most responsible dealers who scrupulously verify the provenance of the traded cultural property. As some of you may be aware, UNESCO is currently working in close consultation with the art market on the revision of this international code. The aim is to strengthen and clarify the ethical principles that should govern the art market and, most importantly, clarify the obligations of professionals in terms of provenance research. This question. The require, this requirement of provenance research, as you know, is at the heart of the fight against the illicit trafficking and of the return and restitution of cultural property and constitutes a major issue. We can no longer ignore the search for provenance, which must be a proactive search. When examining the provenance of cultural property, a available database registering art losses should be consulted. In particular, the Interpol database of stolen art and the documents from the seller should be examined carefully, including export certificates. When assessing whether objects have been illegally exported, I invite you strongly to consult the UNESCO's database of national cultural heritage laws that UNESCO continues to further improve. More than 3,000 laws from 179 countries are currently listed there. And before I open the floor to the discussion, I would like to thank the distinguished panelists that were present today at UNESCO headquarters and online to share best practices and recommendations for the return and restitution of cultural property. I would now like to open the floor for questions or sharing of other interesting and innovative examples of return and restitution cases. Like we did this morning, please raise your hand to request the floor. 
Once you have been given the floor, please press the red button so the technical staff can switch on your microphone. Speakers are then asked to introduce themselves shortly, name and country and institution before taking the floor. In order to give everyone the opportunity to share cases or to ask questions, we would ask you kindly to limit your speaking time to three minutes. As the online participants, I invite you to address your questions in writing in the Zoom chat. The door, the floor is open to all of you. Please, madam. Bonjour à tous. Je suis Good afternoon. I'm uh, Leslie Manin from Togo. I work at the Gabon Museum of Island Traditions uh, and also I work on provenance here in a Paris University. I want to express my thanks uh, to the Secretary General of UNESCO. I'd also like to thank the permanent delegation of UNESCO for Gabon. And last but not least, all today's panelists and presenters for this very interesting and rewarding feedback on a number of different subjects. If I may, I would like to give you a brief update on Gabon in terms of restitutions. If I can find it. Uh, Gabon first focused on training inventories and cooperation through uh, the Embassy of France in Gabon. We have organized the training courses for curators concerning displays, conservation, and provenance research. And in particular, there is a fund, a solidarity fund for innovative projects. And thanks to all that, oh, we have been able to start two master's courses uh, in cultural heritage uh, at the Mabongo University in its Department of Anthropology. As for inventories, uh, thanks to our cooperation with a certain number of museums in France, we have been able to produce a various inventories of Gabonese items in French museums. This has told us what there is in terms of items of Gabonese origin in museums in France, so that we could better understand restitution needs. In terms of cooperation too, UNESCO has been supporting us in the field of restitution. There's the Cape Only Museum, for example, uh, that has provided its support as well uh, because they have provided professionals for capacity building. Let me briefly take stock on what's been done in terms of returns. 2004, four items were bought back by the Gabonese government and restituted in 2018. In 2022, the Gabonese government bought 83 items uh, from the Dr. Andrew collection. He was a doctor who worked in Gabon between 1950 and 1963 when the French president came to our country. There was restitution of a copy of a of a collection of intangible heritage items. And in conclusion, I want to say that Gabon is fully committed to the return to circulation and restitution of cultural goods with open and honest co cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your intervention. And then may I ask 
uh, to take the floor to my esteemed uh, Greek colleague, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cordero, and uh, uh, I am Martin Sovadanasiu from the Greek Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, in my turn, I would like to thank all the speakers for their very inclusive presentations, and uh, which really enriched our lo knowledge, uh, and as well as you for your able moderation. I have two questions. My first question goes to um, Mrs. Alison Davis uh, from the U.S. Uh, Department of State, and uh, it is rather a clarification. Um, it is not clear to me uh, these um, uh, cultural objects from Yemen were already in the territory of the United States or were just confiscated at the borders and then Yemen uh, asked uh, uh, the United States of America to provide safe havens um, um, during the armed conflict in Yemen. So were they um, already in the States or... Um, this is my first question. Uh, shall I go ahead and respond? Yeah. Um, I think Mr. Fakhri is most acquainted with the details of the case, but the objects had already been part of a law enforcement investigation and a judicial procedure, and they had become, in our system, they have to become property of the United States before we can transfer that property to the country of origin, in this case, Yemen. So they were in the United States. The, the property had to be transferred to our government so we could give it to Yemen, which is required under our law. And then once Yemen um, had ownership, they entered into the agreement with the Smithsonian in this case. Thank you very much. Uh, my second question uh, is addressed uh, to uh, Mr. Paul Fabel and Katarina Ribe from uh, the um, uh, Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs from, of Germany. Um, it was uh, very clear that um, from your presentation that uh, uh, any request uh, for a return or restitution um, has to be done uh, through diplomatic channels uh, after, if I'm not mistaken, 2006 or 2007, or in any case after the ratification by Germany of the 1970 Convention. Um, I have to say that um, uh, since the ICPSCP is also an organizer of today's meeting, um, we can also deal uh, with uh, items which enter the territory of the state, um, uh, in, in our case of uh, Germany, uh, before uh, 1970. And uh, in this case, my question, because you said, and it was very clear to us, that. Uh, uh, since um, um, uh, the, uh, when it is a request for after 1970 or after your ratification of the 1970 convention, uh, the first step would be a diplomatic note addressed to the Ministry of, of uh, Foreign Affairs. If uh, we are talking about uh, an item which um, had entered the territory of Germany uh, before 1970 or at colonial times or whatever, and uh, there is a request by a specific uh, state for its return or restitution, how the state could uh, address uh, uh, Germany? I mean, this has to be done through a request uh, within the ICPRCP or um, in a different way. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for this question, if I may reply briefly. Uh, and please, uh, Katarina, feel free to, to, um, to compliment my remarks. Um, it is true that we were presenting a case that falls strictly within uh, the, the scope, of scope of application of the 70 Convention. And so we just present the case of how it then could be uh, claimed under German law. So that is after that, that date that you mentioned. And anything before that, we don't have a legal framework for that in Germany. So there's no legal basis um, that uh, guarantees a one-size-fits-all approach uh, for these kind of, 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 of objects. Um, and of course, there are different, different ways. Uh, and we have returned objects that do not fall on, uh, in the scope of application of the 70 Convention before. And that was always made on a case-by-case -case basis. So it always depends on, on the country, on the context. It depends on how the object has entered Germany uh, and when uh, as well. And um, the other thing that I have to mention, maybe clarify, is also that it's um, that culture and cultural policy and also the rules that govern how we deal with objects 
um, that are mostly in museums when we return them, is within the realm of the lender, so of the regional uh, governments. So we as the foreign office, we accommodate, we, we accompany uh, these kind of processes on a diplomatic level. And in the end, it's up to the museums and their trustees to decide if they ultimately deaccession an item and return it, and under which conditions, um, or whether they don't. And um, it is normally not up to the, the federal government, state government, to, um, to tell them what to do, since it's legally speaking um, their property. And, and with regards to the ICP-RCP, of course, we, uh, we also actively participate in that, uh, that forum or in that, that, um, um, that premium. But in the, uh, in the end, this is an issue for when uh, consultations on a bilateral uh, level have been exhausted and have come to a halt. So obviously for us, the ICP-RCP is, uh, is a form for last resort, basically, and uh, we wish to conclude bilateral agreements um, before, obviously, on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you very much. It is very clear. So I understand, of course, uh, the ICPSCP would be the last resort in accordance with its statutes. So um, uh, this means uh, that, um, um, as you said, uh, any such request would be examined on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and this means that uh, the state uh, could uh, go, um, uh, could address uh, to the uh, respective museum or museums or, and then uh, it will come, of course, I suppose, to, to the state uh, to, it depends on the, the, the national legislation. Of course, uh, negotiations will uh, start. Thank you very much. Okay, please. Go ahead. Can I, can maybe just just add one last point, because uh, also uh, Professor Dijani was here before and, uh, and talked about the return of the, um, the Benin bronzes that we returned to Nigeria. And I think um, when we talk about our national legislation, there's just one more document I'd like to point uh, your attention to, which is the uh, 2019, like a corner, cornerstone framework uh, on how to deal with collections from colonial contexts in Germany. And that is a non-binding legal document in Germany, but it's one that we uh, we abide by and that we, um, that we use as a guidance on, on how to deal with objects from colonial times, which is also publicly accessible. Um, and that is something where the federal government and the 16 regional governments agree to uh, on how to deal with these kind of requests as well. Uh, Nicolas Mallet, uh, I represent uh, the committee of uh, the International League of. <laughs> Sorry, um, again, uh, Nicolas Mallet, I represent the committee of the International League of Antiquarian Book Dealers, the ILAB, Ligue Internationale de la Librairie Ancienne, uh, which is an association with over 2,000 members in 22 countries. Uh, the two case studies of manuscript theft were of particular interest to, to us today. And I just want to share some useful information with you on that topic. Uh, iLab, so the iLab has organized a symposium in New York in 2019 on book theft, and in 2022 on the trafficking of illegal cultural property at the Oxford uh, Bodleian Library. And for your information, uh, we have set up online a missing book register for stolen and missing books and manuscripts from all sources for institutions, libraries, dealers, and private individuals. This website is online, it is accessible to all, and it is being developed with the collaboration of authorities and the ILAB, International League of Antiquarian Book Dealers, has been asked uh, to help with investigations, notably collaborating with Interpol or uh, Scotland Yard. So we are at the disposal of institutions, professionals, or the UNESCO about that website, Missing Book Register. And today I just wanted to bring to your attention the existence of that uh, register, uh, which can be useful to all. Thank you very much. Uh, may I ask if uh, there is another question in the, in the audience? Well, I do have, a, well, I just want to, to, to answer to our distinguished uh, uh, um, Gamon colleague about uh, her question. Uh, 
uh, in English or in French, would you like to be answered? Just only to 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 uh, to, to put it in, in perspective, what is the prime problem of the 1970 convention, the UNESCO convention? The main problem of the 1970 UNESCO convention is that you have to go to the uh, different countries uh, where the uh, cultural object is located, and then to try to sue in the in, in the in the, in the domestic courts, and then to the, the law that is going to be enforced is the domestic law of the, 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 the country of destination. That's the main problem. Then you have to prove that, one, that your domestic law has been breached. Secondly, that it has migrated illegally from your country. Third, that the domestic law of the, pay, of, the, of the country of destination allows the restitution. Uh, first, that it can't, that, that due to the breach of your domestic law, it could be granted in the courts of the country of destination that the restitution should be allowed to your country. That is a legal problem, a very complex one, that uh, is, it is in the, in the UNESCO Convention, and this is what hinders a lot uh, uh, the restitution of cultural objects to the, uh, to the countries of origin. That's what it's about. It is a very complex one, a very complex situation. And uh, needless to say that uh, uh, you have to go to this uh, uh, pathway. This is not easy to go so, and to try to obtain the restitution to the cultural object, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, to, to your country. Then it is a long procedure and uncertain. Thank you for giving me the floor again. So, as I said, we are uh, currently doing an inventory, and if we base ourselves on the on President uh, Macron's statement, who said that we should uh, give back uh, spoiled goods, then we could say that there are several uh, forms of theft. And so, if they've been stolen, we should demonstrate it through different uh, periods. For example, the colonial periods, where there were lots of looting. Then uh, the post-colonial periods. And in 1930s, where there was an explosion of the art market, which was even more damageable. There were also uh, forced uh, sales. And so even if there's documents who proving that those uh, objects were uh, sold. We actually know that it was a forced sale. And also we have to prove that those sales were forced, were done against their will, so they were spoliated. So for us, it's not really about uh, it's, it's spoliation. It's, it's, it's about having a candid collaborations, and it's not about the government, the French government, to decide what objects should be restituted to us, but rather to decide, to decide together uh, how we can have a, a perfect collaboration among the two countries. Very good, but that's the international cooperation side, that's one thing, but the legal response is totally different. And there's a problem of a conflict between different laws, or what laws are applicable. And also it's a very costly case. 
which is also another problem, and it's uh, and the result is quite uncertain. The speaker has turned his microphone off. Excuse me. Uh, mm, I'd like to close the session of uh, of uh, of the presentations and uh, to thank all of you again for your uh, best uh, practices and participation and interests in, in, in taking part in these roundtables. And then I ask our distinguished uh, assistant director of culture, uh, Mr. Ottone, uh, to take the floor and to close uh, these uh, uh, roundtable sessions, please. Thank you so very much for having me. Gracias, querido. Gracias, querido, como siempre. Um, D'abord, par rapport au... First of all, coming back to what we've heard today and what was on the different exchanges, it's important to stress something that is essential. That's before my formal speech. And I believe that all attendees today will agree that times have changed. Does this mean that this uh, discussion six years ago would have been on a different sets of topics? So the context has changed. I'm not saying it's thanks to UNESCO, but I think UNESCO was instrumental there and also is their partners. But I also think that there's the will from most countries to really open a different kind of dialogue, where it's not just the property uh, of the uh, cultural goods that is in question, but also its symbolic value for communities uh, from which uh, the, the, the cultural goods were illegally stolen. And so there's also uh, another aspect that we see uh, in the request for restitutions that is also very uh, sensitive. However, I insist on the fact that we're in a different moment today, where the question of a symbolic uh, ownership of identity are really at the heart of uh, the the question. And I don't I believe the UNESCO is the best place to speak about this because it's mandate. We understand that relationships are bilateral and that agreements between countries must move forward and be bilateral. And we also believe that we have multilateral instruments that were set up over 50 years ago that today give us the possibility to sit at the same table together with member states, with uh, representatives and heads of uh, in, uh, cultural institutions like museums, for example, trustees and stakeholders. And so today we're really at a turning point or a different point. And so the idea of this round table today was to share experiences where all those problems were solved uh, through agreements. And although the cases are very different, there were still a results. There was a restitution of uh, cultural goods. And so the communities that really needed to recover part of their history have recovered it today. So what do they do of those uh, recovered artifacts? Well, it's actually their own business. It's for them to decide. And I believe here there's a predisposition to accept, like we do with national laws, to accept decisions taken by member states about the return uh, of their uh, objects and how they are being then presented to their communities. So after this very intense day of exchange, first I would like to thank uh, so the, the so many uh, people who joined us today, the expert member states, uh, 
um, museum curators, all of you as well, all the attendees in the room here and online, to thank you to have exchanged on all the new forms of partnerships about return and restitution of cultural uh, property. And with all the diversity of cases that was presented today, I will not be doing an exhaustive summary. However, I would like to come back on a few uh, reflections that came out of today's meeting. So for the cases that were presented today, member states really stressed uh, bilateral cooperation and mutual respect. And I believe this uh, concept is uh, fundamental today in cultural diplomacy to uh, implement return and restitutions. For, however, to support the restitution uh, requests beyond bilateral cooperation, it's indispensable to have also the support of international and national uh, organization and also to strengthen international cooperation with experts and cultural professionals with specialized units, with civil society, and actually many of you mentioned civil society, I mean here communities and a representative of civil society, and also the private sector, which also presented uh, cases that were resolved, even if it was through uh, our dealers or a uh, digital platform. So uh, between uh, the country of origin, the country of transit, the country of destination, it is possible to together reach even more ambitious objectives that we have uh, chosen together 50 years ago on the restitution of cultural property. You all highlighted that museums must not be a place of nostalgia, but a place of life, of construction. And that we need to uh, take greater ownership of the uh, digital space. And UNESCO's work on a pilot project for a, a virtual museum of stolen cultural artifacts that will show stolen artifacts that are listed. And uh, Francis Kere from Burkina Faso is the architect for this um, project. We hope that it will be an educational tool that will also show exhibitions of objects that have been returned recently and links with the, the place of origin, the value for the communities that was much discussed. The dialogue between museum representatives has reminded us how important the uh, know-how and expertise is and how it is important to have trained professionals on illicit traffic of cultural property and uh, on issues of return and restitution of such cultural property. UNESCO is aware of this and this is why uh, the support for museums or other spaces that may uh, also uh, be involved in return and restitution and their professionals is one of the major uh, lines for a, a major uh, multi-annual program approved at the last general conference to, for capacity building, which it is a, a, a flagship program three for Africa, promoting cultural um, heritage and capacity building. So I would also like to thank you all for highlighting the central role of uh, the uh, UNESCO uh, uh, Committee for the Return and Restitution of Cultural Property uh, of the 1970 Convention in uh, playing a role in returning these artifacts. When two countries work in the spirit of the Convention, yes, it is possible to find solutions that are appropriate. Solutions that are appropriate and that reflect the victory of cooperation in the service of a common good, which is intercultural dialogue which is exchange. During the discussions today, we heard of cases where no law imposed restitution. But there was a, a will, ethical and moral, to restore the rights of peoples and communities to uh, be the holders of their cultural heritage. And let me point out something that was said this afternoon time and again. The power of cultural diplomacy. 
I don't need to convince any of you. It is society at large that needs to be convinced that this diplomacy exists and that it bears fruit. Today, following the uh, adoption of the Montecult Declaration last year in Mexico, we decided to open a new stage to continue to respond to the calls of member states for open dialogue, inclusive dialogue, on the issue of return and restitution of cultural property. And I'd really like to thank all of our speakers for the many examples of cooperation, which I think are a, a source of inspiration, uh, are so rich and have been shared with so much passion for culture, which is our common good. The meeting of today was a first step, and with your support, we can uh, continue and prolong it in other regions of the world. And we will also publish a summary report of what was said today, which I hope will uh, faithfully reflect the uh, very rich presentations and discussions we have had and the uh, highly valuable points of view. And uh, the ICPRCP uh, committee will also continue follow-up of this day, as announced this morning, by the uh, president uh, of the committee, Madam Ambassador of Gabon. Finally, allow me to restate what so many of you have said. Return and restitution are not the end of a process. It is the beginning of a relationship based on cooperation that is broader, that is open to the future, an open dialogue, open in mind and in action. This is how we conclude our discussions. And on behalf of the Secretary Krista Suna and everybody else, Thank you so very much. It's been a great pleasure, and we do hope that you also shared uh, the pleasure of these exchanges with us. Thank you.